This symposium now begins with the chair of the FCC's Connect to Health Task Force, Michelle Ellison. Michelle? Good morning, everyone. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to each of you. We are so delighted that you could join us to discuss the critical topic of advancing broadband connectivity as a social determinant of health. Today's symposium is about the fundamental vision of connecting everyone, everywhere, to the people, services, and information they need to get well and stay healthy. We developed this vision at the inception of the task force in 2014, and it has stood the test of time. Indeed, it was remarkably prescient given the global pandemic to come. Today's symposium is also about the essential realization that increasingly broadband equity is health equity. As Chairwoman Rosenworcel often says, broadband is no longer a nice to have, but a must have if Americans are to thrive in the digital age. The pandemic put a spotlight on the serious broadband gaps that exist across the country, including in rural infrastructure, affordability for low income Americans and at home access for students. This continuing digital divide means that millions of Americans lack meaningful access to essential infrastructure for 21st century success. That is why the chairwoman has made pursuing policies to help bring affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband to 100% of the country a key strategic goal. And as you will hear, it's a goal her colleagues share. In 2015, the task force first posited that broadband connectivity is a social determinant of health, if not a super determinant of health. The evidence for this important framework has only grown since then, and our shared experience during the pandemic is exhibit A. Given the incredibly high stakes, we at the FCC recognize the need to think differently about the role of broadband and to ask some probing questions. What exactly is the future of broadband and health? What are the implications for our shared goals of health equity and digital equity? How can our policies better grapple with the reality that many existing social determinants of health, like education, employment, healthcare access, and even housing, are increasingly accessed online and are increasingly dependent on broadband? How do we ensure that broadband in health bridges longstanding gaps rather than exacerbates them? We look forward to the robust dialogue and powerful insights to come on these and other issues. Meanwhile, my thanks again to the terrific slate of speakers and discussants on today's program. They are a remarkable mix of talent and experience with lawyers, public policy experts, physicians, academics, researchers, business leaders, innovators, strategists, and public health professionals from a wide range of stakeholder groups. And special kudos to the terrific team at the FCC and our MITRE colleagues who have worked so hard, tirelessly, to make today's virtual dialogue possible. And I'd also like to take a few moments to recognize our sister federal agencies who have joined us today, almost 20 in number. The Administration for Community Living, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Department of Veterans Affairs, Health Resources and Services Administration, Indian Health Service, National Cancer Institute, National Institutes of Health, National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, National Science Foundation, National Telecommunications and Information Administration, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and of course, the FCC. 
What an impressive, powerful group. We know that the FCC is only one piece of this complex puzzle, and it will take all of us, from government and nonprofits to industry and philanthropy, to meet this defining moment. Indeed, I'm reminded of a quote from a famous Olympian marathoner. Sometimes the moments that challenge us the most define us. We are at such a crossroads. Of course, advances in telehealth and telemedicine have provided meaningful access for so many Americans. And we will hear about some of the compelling use cases today. But I'd like to suggest that the best is yet to come. It is the transformative power and promise of broadband and health that will allow us to reimagine how to reach our national health goals and to ensure digital and health equality for all. So with that, let me once again extend a hearty welcome to you all. And we look forward to the discussion and the collaboration to follow. So thank you. And now I have the very happy duty of introducing Commissioner Jeffrey Starks. Commissioner Starks joined the FCC in 2019 after senior level stints at the Department of Justice, the FCC, and in private practice at the law firm of Williams and Connolly. He is a native of Kansas, the Sunflower State, and a graduate of both Harvard College and Yale Law School. His father and brother are both physicians, so he comes by his passion for telemedicine honestly and perhaps organically and genetically. It is no secret that Commissioner Starks believes in the transformative power of broadband. He often says that communications technology has the potential to be one of the most powerful forces on earth for promoting equality and opportunity. Commissioner Starks is a tireless champion for the millions of Americans who lack access to or cannot afford a home internet connection. Commissioner, we are so privileged and pleased that you could join us today to help set the tone and offer opening remarks. So my friend, the platform is yours. Well, thank you so much for that warm introduction, uh, Michelle. And uh, for, for those of you who I'm sure know, uh, this has been uh, a tremendous amount of work that Michelle has done. And so thank you for your tireless effort and service uh, in helping to connect Americans both to broadband and to the health uh, outcomes that they need. I am pleased to welcome all of you today to the Connect to Health Symposium. For many years, the Connect to Health Task Force has brought together public and private stakeholders to accelerate the adoption of cutting edge healthcare technologies. Today's conversations are happening at a truly critical moment. We now have the opportunity to leverage once in a generation investments in broadband to, uh, among many important prim pri uh, priorities, expand access to high quality healthcare. When we announced the COVID-19 telehealth program last April, it was clear that telehealth would play a mission critical role in addressing COVID-19. Even early in the pandemic, experts agreed that receiving care remotely could both meet many patients' needs and help prevent community spread of the coronavirus. Today, Two years into the public health crisis, we have ample evidence that telehealth has made an enormous difference, has made an enormous mark in our nation's response. Researchers at the Urban Institute found that during the first six months of the pandemic, one third of Americans had a telehealth visit to discuss their own health care. There have been particularly striking increases in telehealth use by low-income Americans. Between March and June of 2020, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services found that telehealth visits for Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP, beneficiaries increased by more than 2,600% compared to the same period in 2019. Those beneficiaries received more than 34 million telehealth services in just four months. And while many Americans are returning to in-person visits as the pandemic's outlook changes, McKinsey and a company has found that telehealth utilization has stabilized at levels 38 times higher than before the pandemic. 
Through tens of millions of virtual visits, patients and healthcare providers have reduced in-person contact, maintained social distancing, important measures. But patients clearly saw other benefits that have piqued interest in telehealth and inspired the work of the Connect to Health Task Force even before. Increasing access to specialists, mitigating challenges like travel and health conditions that keep people from seeing doctors, and reducing costs. Those benefits are likely to make the expansion of telehealth usage a lasting legacy. Three quarters of people who use telehealth during the pandemic say that they are very or somewhat likely to continue doing so. With all these benefits in mind, I want to truly thank all of our panelists and speakers for sharing their expertise on a wide range of connected healthcare issues today. Uh, we deeply look forward to learning from your experience. Thank you, of course, everyone, uh, and be safe and be well. Thank you, Michelle and Commissioner Stocks for your opening remarks, which provide a critical vision uh, and framework for guiding our symposium today. My name is David Ahern. I'm a senior advisor to the Connect to Health Task Force and a behavioral scientist and informatics researcher at Brigham and Women's Hospital and on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. I'm very excited today to share with you the agenda we have with an outstanding roster of speakers from a variety of disciplines and geographic reach from both government and private sectors. We've engaged over 30 expert panelists and speakers who will address the topic of broadband connectivity as a social determinant of health from a variety of perspectives. We've structured this symposium to include a series of panel discussions. The first begins with a foundational session on the topic in terms of what we know today in current policy views. The second session is a panel discussion on how can a broadband connectivity is enhancing health and transforming health and human services, including during the pandemic. The third panel will discuss how it can be fully recognized as a social determinant of health. The fourth will elucidate the implications for government policies, clinical care, and health equity. And the fifth and final session will be focused on research and data. For this symposium, we've also incorporated a fireside chat with Dr. Don Berwick, former administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, to take a top level view of the value of broadband connectivity in health and healthcare, and its potential to address health inequities. I now want to introduce our first segment, our first panel segment, which is foundational, as I mentioned. It'll consist of a series of mini presentations and key research addressing the relationship between broadband and health, the emerging evidence that connectivity correlates with health, and policy views on whether broadband connectivity is and should be recognized as a social determinant of health. So with that, I will turn over the uh, microphone to my colleague, Ariel, Dr. Ariel Mancuso from the Connect to Health Task Force. Ariel? Thank you, Dr. Ahern, and good morning, everyone. My name is Ariel Mancuso, and I am the Director of Research and Data Analytics at the Connect to Health Task Force, where I lead our research and analytical work that examines the intersection of broadband connectivity, advanced technologies, and health. I completed both my master's and PhD degrees in public health from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I wanted to start this morning by sharing some of our thinking at the Connect to Health Task Force about the relationships between broadband connectivity and health and how we applied the principle of broadband connectivity as a social determinant of health to an analytical framework that identifies need at the intersection of broadband connectivity and health. First, I'm going to outline a conceptual framework that we have been working to develop for three types of relationships between broadband connectivity and health. Later in this panel, my colleague will dig into some of our empirical work that lay the foundation for our thinking on these relationships and resulted in our recognition of broadband connectivity as a social determinant of health. This framework can be used to better understand the types of relationships that exist between broadband connectivity and health that have different analytical, policy, and practice implications. The first type of relationship is probably the one that is most familiar, and this is where broadband connectivity is a tool or resource that is leveraged in the implementation of a broadband-enabled health solution. 
An example of this type of relationship is when a specific health intervention is delivered using a technology that relies on a broadband connection, such as a glucose monitor tied to a smartphone application that provides alerts or reminders to users. But broadband connectivity is more than just a tool or resource. The second relationship is one in which broadband connectivity acts as a social determinant of health. Social determinants of health are non-medical, non-clinical factors in the environment in which people live that have been shown to have an independent influence on health. While the mechanisms through which broadband connectivity influences health in this way have not yet been established, prior work by the Connect to Health Task Force identified significant differences in important health outcomes between areas that are connected compared to areas that are digitally isolated, even after taking into consideration differences in other factors like income, education, and age. This novel finding suggests an important independent relationship between broadband connectivity and health beyond instances where broadband connectivity is being leveraged for broadband enabled health solutions. Finally, it is increasingly recognized and brought to light by our experience during the coronavirus pandemic that broadband connectivity is critical to almost all activities of our daily lives, such as work, education, and play. In this way, broadband connectivity may have an even more significant role in health by mediating the relationships that exist between the established social determinants and health. For example, Income is a key factor in economic stability, which itself has been shown to influence health, with households that have higher incomes also reporting better health. In today's context, the ability to apply for a job or telework are often enabled through a broadband connection. Thus, broadband is also acting as the gateway through which these established social determinants can influence health. Today, our focus is on these latter two types of relationships in which broadband connectivity acts as a social determinant of health, if not a super determinant. Next slide, please. Next, I want to turn to how we have applied the principle of broadband as a social determinant of health to an analytical framework that identifies need at the intersection of broadband connectivity and health. We developed this framework to generate actionable insight about who is most at risk or being left behind in meeting broadband health goals. This framework was developed based on prior ana analytical work by the Connect to Health Task Force that showed that counties that needed broadband connectivity for health the most tended to have it the least. Identification of these counties also demonstrated the existence of areas that faced dual challenges of both low broadband connectivity and poor health. This finding is particularly concerning given the important role of broadband connectivity in health with the potential to further exacerbate existing digital and health inequities. We have coined this need at the intersection of broadband connectivity and health as the broadband health gap. Here you can see the analytical framework with broadband connectivity on the vertical axis and health need on the horizontal axis. Counties that have lower broadband connectivity are considered more digitally isolated, while counties that have higher broadband connectivity are considered more connected. On the other hand, counties that have higher health need are considered priorities in addressing the current health challenge. By intersecting broadband connectivity and health need, we create four categories of counties. Those counties that have lower broadband connectivity and higher health need, shown in dark blue, are counties that are double burden. These are areas where low broadband connectivity and poor health coincide and may lack the broadband resources or access to the broadband enabled solutions they need to overcome their health challenges, potentially creating a broadband health spiral. In this spiral, the coexistence of low connectivity and poor health may further limit the ability to access needed connectivity and health resources and exacerbate existing digital and health inequities. On the other hand, areas where broadband resources are already in place, but are still experiencing higher health need may be able to leverage these broadband resources or solutions to address their health challenges in the more immediate term. Thus, this framework supports data-driven decision-making by identifying both gaps and opportunities at the intersection of broadband connectivity and health need. 
This may be used by policymakers or other stakeholders other stakeholders to target and prioritize efforts to leverage broadband connectivity for health and ensure that communities are not being left behind. Next slide, please. This county categorization has been central to much of the analytical work of the task force, and I want to end with a few examples of how we have incorporated this framework into our work. Here's a preview of a map from our soon to be released map book showing the intersection of broadband connectivity and opioid mortality. Counties are categorized into these four groups with double burden counties that are experiencing both lower connectivity and higher health need in dark blue and opportunity counties with higher connectivity and higher health need in orange. Next slide, please. Next, I want to preview our expanded Mapping Broadband Health in America platform that incorporates data on drug abuse and opioid mortality and enables users to visualize and analyze the intersection of broadband connectivity and health. Here I am showing the intersection of internet adoption and opioid mortality with counties that have below average internet adoption and above average opioid mortality visualized in, in dark purple. This platform also enables users to customize the visualization and analytics to better understand the intersection of broadband connectivity and health need that is most relevant to their interests and needs. I'll stop there for now and turn it back over to, to Dr. Ahern, but I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Thank you so much, Ariel. really appreciate that. I'm now going to turn over the microphone to uh, Cotter Blakey. Cotter? Great, thank you. Um, and thank you for having me join you today to discuss um, Healthy People 2030 and our approach through Healthy People um, to address the social determ determinants of health. And so I am the Deputy Director of the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion at the um, Department of Health and Human Services. So we oversee a lot of um, basic prevention policy efforts that um, the social determinants of health have just grown to play a much bigger part in. Um, so today I thought I'd share just a few thoughts about healthy people's um, history and evolution that's led us to where we are today. And that is placing social determinants of health at the core of all we do, um, not only within the Healthy People Initiative, but just about every programmatic activity we have in ODPHP, as we call ourselves, you know, whether it's the dietary guidelines for Americans or health promotion, um, communication efforts around health literacy. Um, so next slide, please. So Healthy People for the past 40 years has provided um, science-based data-driven national objectives that have 10-year targets um, aimed at improving the health and well-being of the nation. So Health People is grounded in the principle that establishing objectives um, and providing benchmarks to track and monitor progress over time can motivate, guide, and focus action. And it underpins a, a variety of HHS and administration um, priorities and strategic initiatives. It provides a framework for prevention and wellness programs for a diverse array of both federal and non-federal um, users. And for example, beyond the federal government, healthy people's used by state and local health officials, community health advocates, um, researchers, academia, and even businesses, all of whom seek to improve the health of their own constituent populations, whoever that happens to be, and particularly and more and more by addressing the social determinants of health and trying to achieve health equity. So HHS launched the fifth iteration of the initiative, Healthy People 2030, in August of 2020. In the midst of the pandemic, we were delayed. We had thought we were launching March um, 30th of 2020, big in-person event with White House representation, HHS, you know, high-level representation. And um, of course, we all went home March 15th. So we rescheduled for a few weeks later, thinking this was going to be a quick fix to get out of the pandemic. And we ended up not launching until um, August 2020. So in the um, recognizing that healthy people was 
developed over a series of you know, several years, four years before its actual launch, we've had to um, pivot a bit in our approach to things in healthy people. So it's been an interesting time. So next slide, please. So um, this slide depicts the evolution of healthy people across the many decades that we've existed. And um, it's really evolved in uh, the way we understand our deepening um, dependence on um, the social determinants of health. We've moved further and further upstream toward addressing disparities and equity. And at the same time, we've introduced and expanded our concept of the social determinants of health. So this slide shows the evolution of the overarching goals of healthy people across the decades. So you can see here that the second generation of the initiative, and that was Healthy People 2000, that was launched in 1990, introduced the concept of reducing disparities. And then moving to the next decade, which is Healthy People 2010, we raised that bar to eliminate disparities. Then moving on to Healthy People 2020, we not only called for the elimination of health disparities, but we also sought to achieve health equity. And we added the overarching goal for the social determinants of health. So the, the goals in green there. And then now today with Healthy People 2030, we've gone further by adding a goal of attaining health literacy to that um, eliminating disparities um, overarching goal. And we've broadened the scope of the social determinants of health um, overarching goal to encompass economic environments as well as the social and physical. So next slide, please. So I think we all know that efforts required to eliminate health disparities and achieve um, health equity extend well beyond promoting healthy choices. And in order to improve the conditions and the environment where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age, um, public health organizations and their partners, not only in the health sector, but in sectors not traditionally associated with health, must take action. Um, so the social determinants of health framework that's conceptualized um, in this graphic identifies five key domains that influence health. We have economic stability, education access and quality, healthcare access and quality, neighborhood and built environment, and the social and community context. So each of these five domains reflects a number of critical underlying factors that impact the social determinants of health. So, that, and I'll add that, you know, we I really think that Healthy People 2030 can provide the initial um, frame of reference, we need to move toward recovery from COVID-19 and provide a foundation that we can look to in order to emerge a more equitable and a re resilient nation um, than we knew before the pandemic. So next slide, please. So among the 29 objectives um, that we've identified as supporting the healthy people, social determinant health domain of neighborhood and built environment is an objective to increase the uh, proportion of adults with broadband internet. Um, this is something that, um, that I think the pandemic has shown is um, vitally important. And I, in preparing for this um, presentation, we had some discussions, prep discussions, and I, you know, it's interesting that it was a struggle to get this objective into healthy people um, before the pandemic. When you have skeptics who thought, eh, we, we have internet access, why do we need broadband? So it's the pandemic has um, shown that uh, while most Americans in the United States um, use the internet, they don't have broadband service at home. And there are disparities in home broadband service by race, ethnicity, um, age, geographic location, education, income, um, um, you name it. So, and more and more hospitals and health systems are using internet-based communication and healthcare tools. So strategies to increase 
uh, broadband internet access are important to improving health um, and elevating um, the critical importance of this uh, objective right now is all of the um, factors that were borne out by the pandemic. Um, we have additional objectives in healthy people that um, aim to increase um, access and use of electronic health records, telemedicine, um, access to quality health information. And um, without high-speed internet, um, that can be frustrating for folks. So uh, again, this underscores the importance of this objective. And um, so that is where we are with healthy people. I just wanted to give you an, a sense of the evolution. Um, we started with SDOH in the mid 2000s and felt that we had um, achieved a huge milestone by actually incorporating the social determinants of health into the Healthy People Initiative. And now we're absolutely delighted that um, that has spread throughout sectors, not only within the health sector. So we're um, truly excited by that. So, and so that is all I have. Um, and with that, I think I'm done, but thank you so much. Thank you, Carter. That was wonderful. We really appreciate hearing uh, about uh, the Healthy People 2030 Healthy, Healthy People program. I now would like to turn over the microphone to Dr. Natalie Benda. Natalie. Thank you. So as the panelist here, or one of the panelists here that is in an academic center, um, I don't treat patients myself. I'm a health services researcher, but I work with a lot of people who do treat patients very closely. And I also spend a lot of time in clinical environments trying to understand how we can better support our patients. My work focuses on trying to utilize technology to advance health equity. So I wanted to bring you all some observations of myself and my colleague about colleagues about how broadband internet access really does affect health. First, I wanted to cover two foundational concepts. Many of you may be familiar with these, but I wanna make sure that we have some common language with which to talk about. The first concept I wanted to talk about is intervention generated inequity, which is something that's created when we have interventions such as telemedicine that are extremely well-intentioned, but for reasons such as lack of broadband internet access, they benefit already advantaged groups over less advantaged groups. And I think that's important because by not supporting broadband internet access for all in this country, we are really creating intervention generated inequities. And I've cited a paper here by one of my mentors and some of my other co-authors, if you would like to learn more about this concept. Next slide, please. The other concept that I wanted to mention was digital redlining. Many of you may be familiar with the concept of redlining, not providing credit, or services to people that live in particular neighborhoods. Digital redlining is something that we've seen in cities such as Cleveland. This is a photo from 2016 that demonstrated that AT&T was deliberately not expanding fiber optic services to neighborhoods in central Cleveland that happen to be lower income neighborhoods. I bring up this concept because it demonstrates that a lot of these inequities are really systemic. So we can't necessarily just leave it to private industry to resolve these issues. Next slide, please. I believe I was invited to speak on this panel because of a perspective that my colleagues and I published in the American Journal of Public Health in 2020, where similar to many other people on this panel, we highlighted how particularly in the COVID-19 pandemic, broadband internet access serves as a gateway to information and a gateway to services and these social determinants of health that Carter mentioned that we know affect health outcomes. So coming to this panel as one of the people, as I mentioned, in an academic medical center, I really wanted to bring you some voices and experiences from patients about how broadband internet access has affected their health and their lives. One of my colleagues who is a pediatrician and an informaticist was kind enough to lend me some of her data and she'll be attributed in the slides. I wanna make sure I give her full credit. She works in a pediatric obesity clinic in New York City and did interviews with adolescent patients as well as their parents to understand how their care had been from the clinic during the COVID-19 pandemic. I will say that some of these quotes are a little bit challenging to read and to see, but I thought it was really important to bring you the voices of some of our patients. Next slide, please. 
before talking specifically about quotes that patients had given about how broadband internet access affects specific social determinants of health, I first wanted to make two points. The first one is, this is a clinic in New York City, and I wanted to highlight that broadband internet access is not just a rural problem, it is an issue in urban environments. Secondly, I also wanted to point out that broadband internet access is not simply a binary construct. It's not the haves and have nots. It's really a spectrum of do people have sufficient broadband internet access to support the needs of their entire household and remaining healthy. Next slide, please. Some of the adolescents that they spoke with talked about how broadband internet access directly affected their health care. And as you'll see with this quote in the corner, there was um, an adolescent that was not able to have sessions with their therapist because they couldn't go in person and they didn't have sufficient broadband internet access. As a result, that therapist unfortunately dropped them as a patient. And you know, this adolescent even said that they understand that issue, but because of that, they were not able to obtain the medications that they needed, which is a really sad thing to see for this young patient. Next slide, please. There were also issues related to neighborhood and built environment. So some people were talking about how in a pediatric obesity clinic, they're encouraging people to exercise, but they don't live in a safe neighborhood where it's they're able to go outside and exercise. Many of us may have access to and used, you know, at-home workout videos and things like that during the COVID-19 pandemic, but without access to the internet, this is not something that uh, these children were able to take advantage of. Other children talked about issues related to connection, and we know that this has been a huge problem among particularly adolescents who weren't able to see their friends, and if they couldn't see them in person, they possibly weren't even able to connect with them online, which was another problem that we saw. Next slide, please. And then lastly, there were issues related to economic stability. So if you think about someone who is in a single low-income family, and they're already paying $95 a month for Wi-Fi, and the Wi-Fi itself isn't good, it's not supporting their entire family that may be at home, paying $10 more per month just would not necessarily always be an option. And that's why it's important for us to think about how broadband internet access can holistically support the needs of particular households, not just single individuals. And then in you know, the other end, if we're thinking about things like food access, if people are at home quarantining as this pandemic continues, but they don't necessarily have the ability to order groceries, thankfully this person that's quoted here had a neighbor that could help them. There may be some really foundational services that people do not have access to. So I wanted to thank you all for allowing me to be a part of this panel today. And I hope that these patient stories can help us drive the discussion forward. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and now we're going to, um, I think we hope to have a special guest. I don't know if uh, Commissioner Carr is, is available though yet. Uh, so I think what we're going to do is proceed with the next uh, set of speakers and then we'll um, introduce Commissioner Carr when he uh, is uh, available. So let me turn it now over to uh, Dr. Summers from the office. Um, uh, uh, for the ASPE group and have him introduce the team uh, and their presentation. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, we're, we're really happy to be here with you today. Um, so I'm joined by MJ, Karimi, and, and Annie Lee. They'll be uh, walking you through our, our data in a, in a moment. And I just want to, to briefly introduce what, what our office is and, and uh, how we're approaching the broad issues related to telehealth. Uh, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, or ASPE, is essentially the in-house think tank for the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So we do a lot of work around policy evaluation, data analysis, um, strategic planning, and, and any work really that can provide an evidence-based approach to the policy decisions that, um, that HHS is facing. And telehealth is one of those areas that is uh, of significant interest and priority right now for all of the reasons that the, the previous speakers ha have laid out. Um, one of the challenges in analyzing data around telehealth is that it is often payer-specific. 
Um, we have a lot of good data, for instance, on Medicare um, utilization of telehealth, and our office has put out several reports on that. Um, you've heard some of the highlights uh, on some of the Medicaid-specific results, and, and in all cases, we know that telehealth use surged. But one of the challenges with that is it, it you you often can miss the um, the cross-payer uh, uh, understanding of, of health equity. How are we doing um, in private insurance versus Medicare versus Medicaid versus those who don't have coverage? So one of the uh, key points of the project you're about to hear about really tried to take on that issue of understanding across payers at a full population level. What do we know about telehealth use in 2021? I'll also just reference, a, a, I thought, a really important point that uh, that Natalie made in her comments. Um, we can make things worse from an equity perspective if we don't do this thoughtfully. Um, you know, having expanded uh, access to telehealth in the pandemic has been critical, but it doesn't mean that we need to, um, that, that if we do exactly what we've been doing for the past two years, that it necessarily will lead us to equitable outcomes. And so this study is really to unpack how are things working now and what does that tell us about um, our, our approach moving forward to guarantee access, high quality and equity in our telehealth use. So with that, I'm gonna hand the microphone over to, uh, to, to Drs. Karimi and Lee, who are gonna take you through our results analyzing national survey data on telehealth use in 2021. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present. I'm joining my colleague, Dr. Annie Lee, to share some information about ASPE's recent publication titled National Survey Trends in Telehealth Use in 2021, Disparities in Utilization of Audio and Video Telehealth Services, as discussed by the panelists before, the use of telehealth increased dramatically during the COVID-19 pandemic, but research still suggests that access to telehealth was not equitable across different population subgroups. In this presentation, we would like to discuss with you the use of telehealth services during COVID-19 pandemic, share information about the analysis of the Household Pulse Survey, or HPS, on national trends in telehealth utilization across all payers, as well as the use of video enabled versus audio-only telehealth services across different patient populations. We will also share some of the approaches that we propose on the issue brief with respect to the overall telehealth utilization. Next slide, please. During the COVID-19 public health emergency, all health centers that were funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, expanded telehealth services. HRSA is an agency of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services tasked to provide equitable health care to people who are geographically isolated or economically or medically vulnerable. In addition, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, also enhanced reimbursement in fee-for-service Medicare and waived geographical restrictions so that providers in various settings could expand the services and continue providing care remotely during the COVID-19 pandemic. Moreover, state Medicare, Medicaid programs also made changes to encourage greater use of telehealth delivery for healthcare services. While telehealth has many benefits, there is still some concern around equitable access to telehealth services especially for those with low technology literacy and people with disabilities in general. Prior to analyzing the HPS, we conducted a literature review and noticed that some of the salient points related to telehealth services revolve around access, quality of care, and barriers associated with these services. Next slide, please. To date, many published analyses of telehealth during COVID-19 pandemic have been geared toward specific payers, and they also use claims data to understand the utilization of specific telehealth services, either by audio or video. Research has shown that live video services appear to offer advantages over audio-only services in many clinical contexts. Therefore, we use self-reported data from the 2021 Pulse Survey to assess national trends in telehealth utilization across all payers, identify what demographic factors were associated with higher or lower rates of telehealth use, 
and determine how use of video versus audio telehealth was different across the patient population. Next slide, please. The household pulse survey is a 20 minute online survey, which was filled at approximately every week and later changed to every two weeks, beginning on April 23rd, 2020. The general goal of the survey is to provide timely evidence on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on US households. In 2021, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, National Center for Health Statistics, and HRSA's Maternal and Child Health Bureau partnered with the Census Bureau to include several questions for monitoring changes in telehealth use. We specifically use data from April 14 through October 11, 2021, which is the time period in which the Pulse survey included questions on telehealth use among adults and also in households with children. Beginning in July 21st of last year, the survey added new questions on the telehealth services, basically distinguishing between those rendered via video telehealth versus those a bit audio only services. Next slide. The survey uh, new question included the following. At any time in the last four weeks, did you have an appointment with a doctor, nurse, or other health professionals by video or by phone? Please only include appointments for yourself and not others in your household. At any time in the last four weeks, did any children in the household have an appointment with a doctor, nurse, or other health professional by video or by phone? For those who selected yes, did the appointment take place over the phone, without video, or did the appointment use video? Next slide. We look at the data from weekly cohorts from April to October 2021 for the overall rates of telehealth use and from July to October 2021 for the type of telehealth services used. We also use survey weights to mitigate non-response bias and first conduct the descriptive analysis, testing for bivariate association and use a stratification methods to test for differences across population sub uh, subgroups. We then developed two logistic regression model to identify first predictors of overall telehealth use and secondly, predictors of video service among all telehealth users. Between April 14 and October 11, 2021, more than 808,000 adults across all 50 states and Washington DC responded to the survey. 267,000 were from households with at least one child under the age of 18. Among the 670,000 adults who answered the telehealth question, almost 23% reported having utilized telehealth services either by phone or video within the previous four weeks. Among adults with child in the household, almost 20% reported that, that a child in the household had used telehealth services in the prior, prior four weeks. Next slide. Our analysis has several limitations that are important for us to note here. The survey response rate ranges from 1.3% to 10.3% depending on the week. Despite using weighted data to mitigate non-response bias, the inherent nature of internet-based surveys can produce a bias based on the respondent's internet accessibility and level of comfort and familiarity with technology. There was also a small sample size of people with disabilities and Native Americans in the data set who responded to the survey, which prevented us of closely looking at this population who would be most often disproportionately affected by the digital divide. However, despite this limitation, our study, have, um, our study has several strengths. The Pulse survey is timely. It's based on self-reported information from telehealth users, provide direct feedback from patients that, are, that is not captured in other data sources, such as medical claims. 
I will now turn the presentation over to Amy, who will provide you with information on the actual results extracted from the analysis. Amy? Thank you, MJ. Um, I'd like to start by sharing this graph on the trends in telehealth utilization during the survey period analyzed in the study. As you can see in the blue, from, er from April through early July, telehealth use remained consistent at approximately 25%. There was a slight decline thereafter, but telehealth utilization remained consistent thereafter at approximately 21% through the end of the study period. And this pattern of use was similar um, for teleservices, telehealth services for children reported by the adults in the household. Next slide. When looking at the demographic characteristics of overall telehealth use, there were moderate disparities observed among the subgroups. On the left, you'll see telehealth use um, within subgroups by broken down by race and ethnicity. And telehealth use was lower um, within the white individuals and highest among black individuals at 26.8%. On the right, um, the bar chart shows the telehealth use um, by age. And although telehealth, it, you can see that telehealth use gradually increased with age. Next slide. So the yellow column in, in the second column um, shows the percentages of overall um, telehealth use, whereas the third and fourth columns show the proportion of video to audio telehealth use. When we look specifically at age, um, you'll notice that although telehealth use was lower um, in the younger age groups, 18 to 39, proportionally their telehealth visits by, by video use was much higher um, compared to audio. And if you take a look at insurance below, you'll also notice that um, the highest rates of telehealth visits were among those with Medicare and Medicaid, but their video to, um, telehealth use proportionally was low. Compared to um, private, benef private insurance beneficiaries whose um, tele overall telehealth use was lower, but proportionally um, higher in terms of video telehealth use. However, one thing to note, as you can see, is that uninsured individuals not only had the lowest overall telehealth use, but also lower video use as well. Next slide. And other disparities observed are shown here um, when we specifically looked at um, the modalities, um, video to audio telehealth use. Video telehealth rates were lowest among Latinos, Asians, and Black individuals compared to their white counterparts at six, who were at 61.9%. And this is noted in the blue. Um, uh, blue um, represents the video telehealth use. Now, when looking at the telehealth use by education subgroups, there's a pattern of video telehealth use um, that's lowest among those with less than high school degree and increases with higher educational attainment. So in summary, moderate differences in telehealth use, overall telehealth use was observed in race, education, income, and insurance. Furthermore, there were greater disparities among subgroups of video telehealth use compared to audio telehealth use. I'll turn it over to MJ um, to um, tell us um, to speak about the policy implications. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Our briefing and uh, findings on the issue brief are consistent with research study that shows disparities in audio only versus video enabled telehealth modalities by race ethnicity, age, education, income, and health insurance coverage. While a phone visit may provide needed access to care in some circumstances, a video appointment may allow a partial physical exam, nonverbal communication, and a stronger patient-provider relationship. Moreover, a video visit may allow the provider to check on a patient's home environment where conditions and family well-being are often intertwined with health. I would also like to add that there are still a lot of research and evidence that we need to generate 
to better understand in what circumstances does the telehealth visit serve as well as an in-person visit, or when does a video versus audio-only visit suffice for quality of care? We don't have clear answers on a lot of these questions, but what we kind of agree on is that we want to have a set of full options available to all patients in order to improve their health and well-being. We also want to create an equity that if a patient needs an in-person visit or a video-enabled visit, they are able to get it and they are not um, switched by default into something like audio only because that's what they have access to. Also, based on recent research studies, uh, patients with lower incomes may be more likely to use audio-only services because they are at work during the appointments or lack privacy at home. There are a lot of things that a physician can access on a screen. For example, whether a, a patient is calling with a concern about a rash or an injury and how it's healing with the wound, or if a physician wants to understand a patient's medication, it would be helpful if the patient put the medication on camera or show their insulin syringes to make sure that they are getting it right. So far, we have some good evidence that for behavioral health and substance use concern, the audio-only services can be quite effective. We don't have good evidence for other type of healthcare yet. I believe that although research shows that video visits offer some additional benefits compared with telephone visits, they require more complex setup, video-enabled devices, and broadband internet access, which may present barriers for older adults, lower income households, and those with limited English proficiency. To combat these issues, almost $1 billion from the American Rescue Plan of 2021 was distributed to nearly 1,300 HRSA funded health centers in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and the U.S. territories to support a wide range of projects, including equitable access to telehealth services. The disparities evident in our results suggest that new approaches beyond those strategies implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic will be needed to ensure equitable access to telehealth, particularly video-enabled telehealth services. More specifically, we see a need for new strategies based on culturally competent care to be implemented to ensure increased access to video-enabled devices and overall internet access as the way to ensure equitable access to all telehealth services. The policy discussion around disparities have been a huge factor in assessing and determining telehealth policy needs post-pandemic. And we hope our findings are helpful to policymakers. These results are specifically important for policymakers in understanding the need to increase access to broadband to address video and audio disparities rather than limiting access to audio only or any other modality which will only result in overall decrease in access to healthcare the need to add new strategies in addition to those implemented during the pandemic suggests that not only do existing telehealth expansion need to be continued, but also expanded upon to truly address broader and longstanding inequities in healthcare access. Some consideration for the equitable future use of telehealth are need to consider patient-centered outcomes, including patient preferences, content of services and frequency of visit, technology access, and quality of care. In the next slide, I would love to acknowledge the contribution of several of my colleagues at the Office of Health Policy uh, on this issue brief. Thanks again. This concludes ASPI's telehealth presentation today. Thank you so much, Thank you. Dr. Summers.
uh, Dr. Karini, Dr. Lee, we are so grateful for Aspie's work in this area, helping us better understand how telehealth is being utilized in this country and the policy implications uh, thereof. Uh, so my name is Karen Onije. I am the Acting Deputy General Counsel at the FCC and the Chief of Staff of the Connect to Health FCC Task Force. I'm delighted to be here. And at this point in the program, we have a special guest who will offer some brief remarks. And I am so pleased to introduce uh, Commissioner Brendan Carr. Commissioner Carr is an FCC veteran. He brings nearly 20 years of private and public sector experience in communications and tech policy to his important role at the commission. He is passionate about 5G and has championed the FCC's work to modernize uh, its infrastructure rules and accelerate the build out of high speed networks. Commissioner Carr has played a key role in a groundbreaking telehealth initiative at the FCC, the Connected Care Pilot Program, which supports the delivery of high quality care to low income Americans and veterans. We are delighted that Commissioner Carr can join us for today's critical dialogue. Commissioner Carr, welcome. Uh, well, thank you so much to, to Karen and the whole Connect to Health team. I mean, I'm just I'm reminded of all the work uh, that then Commissioner Clyburn did in, in helping to sort of stand up and, and give oxygen and space for this task force to succeed. And when I came in as general counsel of the agency back in 2017, uh, the task force was sort of uh, under the, uh, the sort of the docket of the general counsel's office and, and really enjoyed the chance to work with the team there. And, and for my part, you know, I really did sort of hit the ground running on a lot of these telehealth issues. And as I've spent time outside of DC, um, it really brought home the need for us to expand, you know, internet connectivity for these life-changing telehealth applications and the need to make sure that we are extending these benefits to every single community, every single American. And that's part of why, you know, I work to stand up this connected care pilot program um, that has as one of its key focus, low income Americans. And I think one of the great benefits of telehealth as we've been talking about today um, is, you know, adherence. <laughs> you don't have as many missed appointments because missed appointments come from, you know, transportation difficulties, uh, time off of work, child care. There's a lot of reasons why people don't end up uh, being able to get in to see their healthcare professional. We can eliminate a lot of that, um, you know, with telehealth visits. Um, and there's more to it as well. You know, I was up in um, Utkiadvik, Alaska, which is the northernmost community in America. It, it sits all the way at the top of Alaska, uh, right on the Arctic Ocean. And I was in the airport there. Uh, we either just landed or we were getting ready to leave. I can't remember. And I was just talking to some of the people that were there. And I was telling one woman who, who lived up there, um, you know, why we were there and we were visiting some of the healthcare facilities. And she said to me, you know, you have no idea what it means for us to get to stay in our local community uh, and use telehealth to have access to care somewhere else. Because when we have to leave our family, when we have to leave our community, it's a real stressful situation. It's a, uh, it's sort of a shock to the system. You know, they have an entire care community up there. And so when we can keep people with their families in their community and still get high quality care to them, um, it's a real game changer. And I think one of the things that I was struck by years ago at some of the work that the Connect to Health Task Force was doing was the mapping efforts. And when you look at, you know, where do we have low income uh, communities, where do we have poor health outcomes, and where do we have a lack of access to affordable broadband, those three things tend to cluster together. Um, and inserting an affordable high-speed connection there isn't going to be the panacea that solves all the problems that um, a community like that may be having, but it can really go a significant way uh, towards doing that. And so with the FCC, we got to make sure that we get affordable internet connections to every community. And we're doing that. We got a lot of programs on that, including setting up new low income programs that can help. Um, we've got a lot of these healthcare programs we're doing as well. And frankly, a lot of this now comes down to Congress. We need to um, make permanent a lot of the regulatory relief that uh, HHS and others stepped up to the play at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic that enabled um, a real spike in telehealth usage. And a lot of those regulatory waivers are set to expire 
once the pandemic declaration ends. And so we need to make sure that we uh, make permanent those changes that have worked because we really cannot afford to go back to the status quo before COVID in terms of some of the restrictions that were in place uh, on access to telehealth. So thanks again for the, 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 the team for letting me offer a couple of words of support, really uh, getting a lot out of these events and, and thanks to the, the task force for everything that you all have been doing. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Carr, for joining us today and for those comments. Uh, very, very timely and uh, important points that you've made. I now want to turn it back to Karen Amijay to be our final presenter on this panel. Karen? Oh, thank you, David, so much. Uh, and good morning again, everyone. Uh, it is wonderful to be here talking about a topic that is so important to the commission and frankly to every American. Uh, and as part of its overall mission to explore the intersection of broadband, advanced technology and health, and to advise the commission, the task force periodically conducts research and data analytic projects. And uh, my colleague, Dr. Mancuso mentioned this at the top of the hour, we'd like to bookend a little bit. Um, with just one example of some of the kinds of findings uh, that we have here around broadband as a social determinant of health. Um, so, it, you know, the, the paper that we want to highlight today is titled um, Broadband Connectivity as Super Determinant of Health. And we, we first did this work back in 2017, but the findings really, as Michelle said, stand the test of time. The task force asked a deceptively simple question. What is the relationship, if any, between the level of connectivity in a community and that community's health? And we wondered whether increasing broadband connectivity in a community correlates to improved health comes at the community and population level. Could, could broadband connectivity be one of the building blocks of health like the other recognized conditions in which people live, work, learn, and play, the, the so-called social determinants of health? And I'd like to take a minute just to share some of what we found, what we learned, uh, but let me emphasize two things. First, we believe that analysis at the community level was and is critical. A community level examination can help us better evaluate connectivity as part of the environmental context that influences and sustains health. And that unit of analysis, for example, the county level, is one place where a broadband intervention can be more easily deployed. So that's the first caveat. The second is that our analysis and modeling, what I'm gonna share with you in a minute here, what um, I think the slide that has been brought up is beginning to show, examines correlation not causation. And that's a really important point for us to make. Um, the work we did was both descriptive and predictive. And what we did was we used diabetes prevalence as a health proxy to look at a couple of things. First, we wanted to look at the correlation between health outcomes and broadband access. We also wanted to look at the correlation between health outcomes and internet adoption. And last, to test those findings, to make sure that what we were seeing really was real, we took a targeted look at both access and adoption in two critical subpopulations that many of the speakers thus far this morning have talked about, rural counties and, and counties with high levels of health need, in this case, diabetes. And just for clarity, because nomenclature is so important, broadband access in this study was the percent of the population with access to high-speed internet at home at a speed of 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload. Internet adoption was the percent of the population who not only had 
access, but actually subscribed at home. And we divided these metrics into quintiles. So zero to 20% of the population, 20 to 40% of the population and so on. So with that background, we used 2015 broadband data from the FCC. We used the CDC date diabetes prevalence data. And here are the really surprising, but you know, important results that we found. I'm going to show you three bar charts, and, and I think one of them is up on the screen right now, and we're going to talk through this very quickly. Uh, the entire study obviously is on the commission's website. So this slide is about access, and we found that counties in any quintile of broadband access had on average 9.6% lower diabetes prevalence than those counties in the next lower quintile of access. So let me point you here on the slide. We're talking right now about um, on the x-axis, we have the percent reduction in diabetes prevalence as broadband access and internet adoption increase. So that's what you're looking at on the x-axis. On the y-axis, there are the variables that we're, we're controlling for. So we're focused here on that first yellow bar showing 9.6% decrease in diabetes prevalence as broadband access increased. And as you can see on the slide, the difference in diabetes prevalence in these communities remained statistically significant, even when we controlled for potentially confounding factors like education or income and age. Uh, same with adoption. I won't spend a lot of time on that. We found that broadband adoption appears to have an even greater correlation to improved health outcomes. We're now looking at that green bar right? Uh, and communities in a given quintile of broadband adoption on average had a 16.5% lower diabetes prevalence compared to communities in the previous quintile. And again, this increase in prevalence remained when we controlled for education, income, and age. Could you go to the next slide, please? Now, these are going to, this slide is going to look very similar, but what we're looking at here is a snapshot for rural communities. Similar pattern, two and a half percent decrease in diabetes prevalence when quintiles of access, um, of broadband access increased, and an 11.4 percent decrease between quintiles of adoption. Again, holding constant even when you correct for education and income. Can you do the next slide, please? Great. And then we thought maybe what we need to do is to look at counties with very high health need. And so we looked at counties with the highest levels of diabetes prevalence, the so-called diabetes belt, if you will, where you might expect it to be harder to observe this kind of correlation. Um, and again, increasing quintiles of broadband correlated with decreasing rates of diabetes prevalence. So the next thing that we did is we thought that is very descriptive. Maybe we could create a statistical model to model the impact on health of improving connectivity in poorly connected communities. In other words, could we create a model of connectivity mediated health improvement among a hypothetical population of people with diabetes? And I don't obviously have the time today to review that model in detail, but what we saw in modeling the data is that for each quintile increase in broadband access and internet adoption, there was a corresponding decrease in diabetes prevalence. And given the high rates of diabetes in this country, even relatively small reductions, we know this to be true, even relatively small reductions in prevalence can change the lives of tens of thousands of people. Last slide, please. So in closing, I think what this research study suggests is that there appears to be a connectivity continuum from access 
to adoption, to utilization that may be influencing health in some way. And this has significant implications, we think, for our policies and interventions. Um, and more importantly for our dialogue today is the finding that the relevance of connectivity to health is not just a question of how often and how starkly broadband correlates to health outcomes, although that's clearly important. But we have both connectivity's potential impact on health, plus its status increasingly as a pathway to other determinants of health, uh, education, access, economic stability, healthcare access and quality. All of those things are increasingly premised on broadband access and the ability to connect to online activities and resources. And for us, that puts the digital divide in stark context. I feel all of the speakers on this panel have been really making a central point here, but what's the good news? So the good news is while we believe that health is a compelling use case for driving broadband access and internet adoption. So the synergies for our health and communication sectors are clear. And with that, I wanna echo my colleagues in saying how much we look forward to the rest of today's dialogue, to the mutual learning ahead. Uh, David, I think at this point, we are going to take a very brief break. Is that correct? I'm sorry, Karen, I was on mute. Uh, I think we may have a question. We may have time. We're actually doing very well. It's 1119 according to my time. So we actually have a few minutes. Um, and I believe there may be a question that we could pose to the panelists. Thanks, David. This is uh, Samruddhi Thakkar with Myra Corporation. Yes, we have several questions coming in. And uh, one question uh, from Arial Santos is to Dr. Somers and MJ and Annie. And I believe Dr. Somers uh, will be delighted to address this question. The question is, uh, the presentation just showed that audio options cannot just be eliminated. It has its own merit not perfect, not optimal, but better than no access. Dr. Somers? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Uh, I, I think that's a really important framing uh, issue for the findings that, that the team presented. So when you see significant disparities in the use of a service, um, and you see that there's kind of almost two tracks going on where we have uh, some groups that are disproportionately using video telehealth and, and some that are disproportionately using audio. I think there are two policy reactions that we need to have. The first is to make sure that to the extent that audio only is the only feasible pathway for some of those uh, that care to get delivered, that we protect that access. But the second is that we don't resign ourselves to a two-tiered system where we say we're going to allow uh, certain populations to not have access to the benefits of, of what we think to be a higher value service uh, where your clinician can see you. Um, and so, I, you know, as a before I took this role, I was working as a primary care doctor in a community health center and seeing patients during the pandemic via telehealth. And it's a big difference when you're on the phone versus when you can actually see see your you know, you see your patient uh, read their face. They can see yours. You can look at medications on screen. You can see their uh, their home environment. So these factors really matter. And so I, I think we have to protect that access, but we can't settle for it. Um, meaning that we, we need to continue to make the investments that. Um, th that allow us to, to eliminate the gaps and, and make sure that anyone who wants to uh, can get the highest value of care. And, and that sometimes will be fine to be audio, sometimes that will require video, and sometimes it will need to be in person. So, um, but we don't want to settle for a two-tier system. I think that's a, that's a critical point. Thanks, Dr. Somers. And I want to take opportunity to pose another question to you uh, or MJ and uh, Annie to address. Is SP looking at uh, tele-intensivist services and how that can help rural hospitals post-pandemic who may have ICUs but not staff to staff ICU beds. And this question comes to us from Jeffrey Johnston. 
So um, we, in our survey data, we are fairly limited in our ability to look at the type of service delivered. In our Medicare claims, uh, we we are able to get much more granular. And so um, we have also uh, published some reports looking uh, at the Medicare fee-for-service claims in the telehealth use patterns, uh, including some by specialty type. I don't believe we've drilled down yet to the point of, of intensivists versus other specialists, but we, for instance, look at uh, primary care, uh, specialty services, and behavioral health. Uh, but it's, it's an important question and, and a good one that I'll take back to the team. So thank you for that suggestion. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Somers. And uh, I think we might be able to get in one additional question. And uh, Karen, I'm going to pose this to you. Uh, this is a question uh, in the form of a comment, uh, again from Jeffrey Johnston. Subscriptions is driven by affordability. And so price for excess is important. If there are just one company in rural area and price is not affordable for low income household, perhaps looking at competition to drive prices down would be an opportunity for further inquiry and policy. And I know this is not a question, it's a comment. And Karen, uh, do you want to go ahead and address it? I think it is a very salient point. Uh, clearly, affordability is a key part of the puzzle here. And one of the things that we are cognizant of is that there really is a bit of a cycle. So if health is a compelling use case for broadband, um, extending broadband access and driving adoption, then the more there's utilization of broadband in health, um, both by providers, consumers, and other stakeholders in the healthcare context, the greater the demand, right? And the greater the demand, the more potential competition and entry. And the more com competition and entry, the lower the prices and the greater the demand. And so at the commission, we absolutely recognize um, that cycle. There are as Commissioner Carr and Commissioner Starks and um, Michelle Ellison all noted, there are various programs at the commission focused directly on that affordability question, especially for low-income Americans. I think it needs additional focus, both from a framework standpoint, um, as well as an intervention standpoint. And clearly those are both underway. And thank you. Thank you, Karen. And I know we are on time, so back to you, David. Uh, thank you, Sam Rudy. And I want to thank the panelists. This was a, a tremendous uh, panel. Uh, and um, it's, it's remarkable that we start uh, started on time and we've ended on time. And so we now have programmed in a 10-minute break uh, for you from 11.25 to 11.35. We're asked that you uh, come back promptly and be ready at 11 uh, 35 where we'll uh, begin our fireside chat with Dr. Don Berwick. So thank you all for participating so far and we look forward to uh, chatting with you in a few minutes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will now begin with our fireside chat segment with our distinguished uh, guest, Dr. Donald Berwick, titled The Value Proposition of Broadband Connectivity and Health. This fireside chat will be conducted by Dr. David Ahern, Dr. Hearn, please proceed. Thank you, Ben. Uh, it is a distinct honor to invite uh, Dr. Don Berwick to join us in, in a chat today. Dr. Berwick is President Emeritus and Senior Fellow, Institute for Healthcare Improvement on the faculty, in the Department of Healthcare Policy at Harvard Medical School, and former administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, he really doesn't require any introduction. He is a true giant in the field of healthcare quality improvement, safety, uh, and, and really joins us today to talk about the potential of broadband connectivity to enable health and healthcare in ways that really bring value. And this is a, a major focus of, of Don's uh, work. I've had the pleasure of working with Don uh, back to uh, his uh, participation in the President's can Cancer Panel Workshop in 2015 that led to uh, the report on improving cancer care through connected health that was presented to Dr. Uh, to, uh, President Obama in 2016. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, Don became a friend of the Connect to Health Task Force and participated in a fireside chat in 2018 at the Connect to Health Conference 
with Don Norman and Susanna Fox, uh, and subsequently played a really key role in 2019, in the summer of 2019, as our moderator for our senior leadership think tank event in uh, Washington, D.C. at the FCC, uh, that really highlighted the, the important role of connected health, uh, particularly focusing on cancer and rural care and access to care. Um, so with that, I'm going to kind of go back to the term value and uh, ask uh, Don to talk about how he perceives broadband connectivity in the context of value, particularly as we also consider the construct of social determinants of health that's now emerging in our conversations in health and healthcare. Uh, and so, Don, let me let you take it away, and then you and I can uh, have, have a conversation. Thanks so much, uh, David. Let me make sure you can hear me okay. Yes. Great. Uh, well, I really appreciate the chance to join you and to connect again to Connect to Health and thank the FCC and and uh, your colleagues at MITRE and others for the chance to, to think together with you. A uh, couple of quick remarks. I guess the most of, the first thing I want to say is how excited I am. I, I think that if ever there is in a matter whose time has come, this is it. Uh, for my entire career, I've been trying to help healthcare globally just get better. There's so much we can do better for people. And, um, you know, we've learned a lot about how to do that, but, but we haven't cracked the, what I think is kind of, I think it's the Nobel Prize issue in improvement, which is scale, how to, how to be able to reach everyone everywhere all the time. And I think this is the answer. And I, um, I don't think I'm being naive about that. I've seen uh, connectivity come and go and through the years, but this feels really, this feels real to me. So value, I think uh, when we're pursuing improvement, um, doing better for people uh, and conserving resources, I guess there are two domains we might wanna be thinking of. One is um, care for people who are in care, uh, people in hospitals, people sick, people who need, need to be reached. And there, I think the quest needs to be to get everyone access to the best care in the world. I, I don't think that's an unrealistic goal. I, I, think, uh, I think you and I talked, David, uh, in preparation here about uh, what I think I phrase the democratization of excellence. Everyone can get the best. Uh, the launch project, the cancer project with NCI and FCC that I got to participate in a bit was a great example of that, which is how to really break through barriers of connected connection of people to the best knowledge uh, and action. And uh, this is the way to do it. I'm absolutely convinced. On the social determinant side, which is the other side of the coin, which, that's really about creating health and, and protecting people from illness, injury, and disability upstream uh, with working on social determinants. Um, it, uh, the, the one thing I'd like to say before we go back into dialogue is, is that's really crucial. <laughs> healthcare doesn't create health. Um, healthcare is a repair shop. And so most of the illness, injury, and disability we deal with is generated outside the care system. And, and we know scientifically how much uh, illness, injury, and disability can be mitigated or prevented <clears throat> when we work upstream rather than waiting for the problems. Uh, I think for this um, seminar and for uh, planning about social determinants, it might be helpful to be clear about what we mean by social determinants. It's already been discussed by some of the preceding speakers and will later today. The um, the sort of uh, reference document for me is the work of Sir Michael Marmot in his amazing book, The Health Gap, which I would recommend to anyone to read. It's written in 2015. The Health Gap is a book that pulls together scientific data on, on what creates health and wellness and, and, injury, and illness, injury, and disability. Marmot has five categories, and that's what social determinants need to, needs to mean. Let's follow the science. The five categories are quickly uh, Early childhood experiences, what happens to kids when they're really young has a lot to do with what happens to them as adults with respect to health. Second is the education system, how robust it is, how, how much access there is to, to great education. Third is workplace conditions, um, supports to work to the workforce. The fourth is elder, uh, supports to elders, supports to aging people, especially to avoid loneliness. And the fifth is community infrastructures, transportation, food security, housing security, uh, criminal justice, violence prevention, recreational opportunities. 
those are the five. That's what when we say social determinants, we should mean early childhood, education, workplace, elder supports, and community infrastructures. Marmot has a sixth category, which is extremely relevant to this conference, which is he, he asked, what's the driver of those five? And his driver is fairness, equity, a commitment to, to solidarity in a sense, every, everyone's in. And if you ever want to pick a tool for getting everyone in, this is it, connectivity and broadband. So I, I, I can't think of, a, of, of more power here. There's the, the challenge to those of us in this meeting and for the future is how can broadband help us in health, the healthcare enterprise connect much more effectively to those five areas of social determinants? And I think that's, I, I can't think of a more exciting question in terms of pursuit of well-being for, 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 for communities and individuals. So, so that, that's big, much more a lecture than I intended, Dave. But we got two topics, how to make care better and how to make health better. And both, both uh, broadband offers leverage. You know, Don, that is fantastic. It really, uh, we haven't, I would say, uh, collectively within the task force, uh, thought about uh, the way you framed it uh, in the work of, uh, in the book that you mentioned, Dr. Mahmoud. That book, we, we will definitely look at that. I think it does provide uh, a way forward because we're trying to position the idea of broadband connectivity uh, in the uh, sort of evolution of care, not only care, but also health. And so we really are looking at it broadly. Uh, uh, and, and you mentioned equity. So the, the, the other sort of common concern now with the pandemic, especially, is the systemic structural inequities that we have, certainly in our healthcare delivery system and we have in society at, at large, uh, but within healthcare in particular. And as you know, some of the concerns about technology and broadband access and internet access and so on, is that, and we've heard some of the prior speakers, that there's the risk that we can actually increase disparities. Uh, for, for those individuals who have access, they may benefit more, and there's a greater disadvantage to those that don't. So we need to obviously be aware of that. We need to address that and make sure that's not the case. So I'm, we're, we're thinking in, in the task force about how do we kind of flip the script and make it much more that this is a way forward and that we need to have 100% access to broadband for all citizens. The 100% goal is just right. I mean, why should be anything less? Who would you decide to exclude? But then the, the narrative, the flip narrative is to, to perceive of that as a, a route to health and well-being. It, it, it's, it's, it's not... It's not a, a you know a sidebar idea. It's not it's not like another good thing to do. It isn't. It is a highway to to health if we choose to make it that. Again, those two ways by the by the democratization of access to the best possible knowledge and guidance, and the uh, second is to more it will require more creative thinking. But like, how can broadband access at one hundred percent help improve? Uh, uh, say early childhood experiences, so as to generate greater health in in um, in, in, in the population. I, I mean, I, I your mind begins to spin thinking of what that would look like. And you see, if we just stay in our healthcare uh, buildings, you can't do that. There's, I mean, you can't imagine a way that uh, that the hospital becomes an agent of improvement in, in for early childhood. But but you can think about that in the broadband world. With respect to scaling, by the way. Uh, the um, it, it, there are cases in which we know what to do, but we can't make that knowledge uh, available everywhere. We 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 we've been we've been trying to do it with you know with um, covered wagons and bicycles, and instead there's better ways to do it. The the project I, I, that has caught my attention recently is the one that the um, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, launched with uh, ARC, HRQ, and um, and IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and the Ec and Project Echo in in, uh, in New Mexico. So here you had IHI and Echo, and the challenge from the uh, from the HHS was around nursing home care and protection in the COVID pandemic. There are fifteen thousand nursing homes in the United States, uh, and as you all know, um, the pandemic. Uh, 
had really walloped them. They they they, they were the they were the cutting edge sites, second only to prisons and jails, in terms of intensity of burden. Uh, the challenge from HHS was: could we reach uh, fifteen thousand nursing homes uh, with uh, support, educational support, so they could mitigate the effects of the pandemic by decreasing incidence of COVID in staff and patients and decreasing deaths in staff and patients? Uh, that project using broadband connections uh, in partnership between IHI and ECHO uh, in cohorts of 30 nursing homes at a time, uh, it's unbelievable. They reached 9,017, uh, over two thirds of the nursing homes in the nation, nursing homes in three months with uh, each of them receiving 16 weeks, 16 week series of, of training sessions, attended, embraced, supported by hundred academic teaching centers, uh, and ma major changes in in uh, care processes and outcomes in those nursing homes. So, the, I mean, you couldn't imagine doing that with with bicycles and covered wagons, but you can do it with broadband and, and did it. That that's a remarkable uh, story and uh, project that that will I'm sure we'll hear more about. And and you're absolutely right. There's an example of where the neediest population, those at the greatest risk during the pandemic. We're able to benefit from a broadband enabled set of services and following uh, the evidence base of uh, how to do quality improvement in the, in the training that, you, that, that the IHI provides. I wanted to come back to the science reference that you made. You know, I'm a scientist as you are, and the importance of following the science uh, and, and the goal of doing no harm. We obviously are still in a very early stage of evaluating the impact of broadband enabled solutions, the telemedicine, telehealth, remote patient monitoring, virtual care, home-based hospital care. I mean, there's the, the list goes on and we'll be hearing from our uh, uh, colleagues in the next panel about emerging technologies uh, that, that can be deployed uh, to where people are, not where they have to be uh, outside of their home, perhaps. Uh, you know, what, what do you say about the science? What do we need to do? What's the, the uh, path forward here to make sure that we do no harm and we do evaluate what we do to make sure that it's effective and it's bringing value. Well, I hear uh, that's a great question, David. I hear the word science has two meanings here. One is uh, a simpler meaning, which is what uh, this democratization of knowledge. Um, let's take patient safety since you raised the safety issue itself. On a positive view, we know a lot about how to make care in hospitals safer. There are 6,000 hospitals. We know a lot about how to make care safer in nursing homes, 15,000 nursing homes. We know how to make care safer in ambulatory settings, tens of thousands of those. Uh, but, but we don't have a way to move the knowledge efficiently. We could put it in a journal, but that doesn't actually work. We're publishing something isn't, uh, it, it just doesn't, it, it's not empirically the way to get knowledge out into the world. The, the kind of connectivity we're talking about now can work. Uh, and there's an avidity for this. I think what we saw in a nursing home project, and we, I think we're seeing it in other projects that I've been involved in, pe people want to know. It's, there's no like, you're not, you're not knocking on a, on, a, on a locked door here. Once people know that they can get access to the best knowledge, they, they want to use it. We're talking about both patients and families and clinical staff. So par part of the, 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 the safety side of this is to get safety knowledge out there. I know that's not the direct question you were asking me, but I, I could imagine that we could reduce injuries in healthcare to patients simply by spreading the knowledge of safe practices by tens of thousands a year, maybe hundreds of thousands uh, using broadband, which we could, we don't have another way to do that right now. With respect to the safety of the, of the uh, connectivity, that's a that needs some discipline. Now we we're we're in a kind of festive phase right now in the in the in in, in the COVID era in terms of the number of people that got connected and began to use um, virtual care, for example. Uh, we are a little bit behind in understanding how to how to watch that care occur and make sure that we understand what the nature of excellence and safety in that care system. You mentioned projection of care into the home. That's another frontier. Hospital at home doing things, having people help do things for themselves at home under under internet, uh, under web-based guidance, that's all possible. But we, we need a plan for um, learning as we do that. I, I would be cautious about uh, applying the brakes on this. I think, I, I think we should go with the energy 
but we can learn if we're disciplined about studying what happens and uh, really dynamically gathering the information as we go, which is, by the way, another, another uh, potential property of broadband. I'd leave it to the experts to parse this, but from the viewpoint of quality, uh, care is always an experiment. You, you say to a patient, I think you have Lyme disease, Here's how. Here's what we'll do about that. I think you're having migraine headaches. Let's hear what we'll do about that. In a, in scientific practice, you want to hear back. You want to say, well, what happened? Was I right or was I wrong? You know, and actually, healthcare is not awfully good at that. Closing the loop back, hearing back from the communities and families and people we help, saying, were we right? Were we wrong? How did we do? I, I think there's some possibility in broadband connection for this this learning process, this hearing back process that would be a massive step forward in the quality of care. So again, lots of possibilities here, David, let's learn as we go. John, that's fantastic. Yeah, as you, as you talk about the feedback loop and the involvement of patients and families and caregivers, it makes me think of our work with launch in the cancer space and how important that really is uh, uh, in understanding the experience of patients and families with cancer. Uh, and now having access, uh, whether it's uh, virtual um, to a clinic or to a support group uh, or other services is essential to high quality care uh, for that condition. And, there, and that's true across many chronic conditions, as, as you well know. Um, so as we go forward with our work in the task force, again, we're, we're interested in making sure that the conversation about broadband connectivity goes beyond it being infrastructure only, that we think about it more broadly, we think about it in terms of access, adoption, and use, as sort of the three facets of broadband connectivity, each of which is in their own way have a value proposition. Uh, does that trigger any other thoughts for you here in our remaining uh, minutes that we have? Yes, it does, David. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I've, I've learned a lot from listening to Karen and the, the, the kind of viewpoint that the, that the task force and the commission are having on this. I'm pretty excited by, by what Karen has taught me already in the short time I've, I've learned from you. But I think um, the mentality change that I think the task force has and would encourage them to have is not to think of broadband as a way to automate the existing care models only. Uh, I think there's a new way to think about what health care and pursuit of health is. Actually, I, th I think that broadband, it's, it, it is a technology, but it's also a, a platform for conversation about rather thorough redesign of the nature of care itself and of the pursuit of health itself. I know that's kind of a, a vague talk, I guess, but I mean, let's get a new care system out of this, not just uh, uh, railroad tracks for the current care system, and I and I think that's really that's really uh, promising. We just explored one end of that. I'll say it again, and that's the feedback loops. So that you know, it, you know, I, I can't stay in a hotel now without getting a questionnaire. Uh, the, the, by the time I'm back in my house, saying how did we do? What could have been better? All that. Healthcare needs to do that all the time, every time, every encounter, every time we try to help someone, we hear back. Uh, how did we do? What did we learn? Well, where were we wrong? Where are we right? We can do that now. That's not the current system. That's a future system. And the other area of, of innovation we just talked about is connection to social determinants. Let's think pretty big here. How could healthcare help uh, more effectively help the early childhood experience? How could healthcare eliminate, um, through broadband, eliminate loneliness for elders? How, how can we make uh, every workplace a safer workplace? How could we really make uh, nutrition and communities become a, um, a, a source of constant growth and development. These are questions that cannot be asked within the current system. They can in a highly connected system, I think. So we need to think not just about connection, but our redesign on the platform of connection. You know, Don, that you, you articulated so well the uh, philosophy of our task force and the leadership of our task force, Michelle Ellison and, and Karen Amija. Uh, that I have come to respect this much broader notion of, uh, of a new system of, of health, uh, not just a healthcare system, which we know is wrought with a lot of issues and you've studied it your whole career and, and improved it in so many ways. 
but but health can be so much more. And we think it is, and we believe that broadband connectivity will will enable that uh, going forward. And we want to think differently. I maybe co-opting Steve Jobs and Apple, but it, it's come up several times in our conversation with our panelists that we have to think differently. Yeah, what, what assumptions are we carrying that now could be relaxed? I, I have to give a shout out to Chris Gibbons. I heard him speak about this at Robert Johnson Foundation meeting about four or five years ago, and it was like it was almost a it was quite an experience hearing Chris because that's what he was saying. This is a this is a new game, a new a new enterprise at our at our doorstep if we'll take advantage of it, and um, it's very exciting. Thank you, John. We have a minute or two left. Are there any parting? comments or thoughts uh, for the rest of the of our audience and the rest of our day. We've got a number of other panels that will deep dive deeply into research and into the technologies that are emerging and the like. Any implications or any final uh, commentary for me? Uh, I guess two thoughts. One is let's act with courage here. This is new territory and if we if we ride the brakes, we won't get the benefit to populations especially uh, disadvantaged and poor populations that we need here. It's time, this is time to go ahead and then study as we go. And, and by the way, that's a, that's a comment about global health. I know we're focused domestically here with the FCC, but everything we're saying is 10 times more important uh, if, we're, if we think about our citizenship in the, in, in the, global, in the global world. Um, I think the other thing is let's get out of our silos. Um, we built a healthcare system with guilds and restrictions and uh, scopes of practice and licensure and regulation stuff that's now gonna be in our way. And so uh, I, we, we have to have the courage and the generosity to think across boundaries that we've nurtured for a long, long time. We built many fences, now let's take them down. Because I think the advantages of using broadband to reach into social determinants, for example, or to actually democratize access it will threaten legacy regulations, legacy thinking, legacy guild structures. And let, I just say, let's go for it. Our job is to help people live longer and better and we can't do it within our silos anymore. And broadband should, should be a vehicle for tearing down those walls. You know, John, that was just um, poetic. Uh, and I will um, always remember now democratize uh, excellence in care is, is another uh, you know, lesson for me that I've learned and um, how important that will be. So I want to thank you for your time and the opportunity to chat with you and look forward to seeing you again, hopefully in person at some point soon. I hope. Um, and thank you again for participating. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you and work with you. Congratulations to you and the task force on what you're doing. Thank you so much. I'm now going to uh, turn over the microphone to Renee Quashe, and we'll move to our second panel. Renee? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hearn. Really appreciate it. As Dr. Hearn just said, I am Renee Quashe. I am the Vice President of Digital Health and the Consumer Technology Association. Everybody, welcome to our panel. How connectivity is enhancing health and transforming healthcare, emerging technologies, and innovations. We have a great panel today representing a number of sectors and perspectives, and I hope you find the next hour very interesting. It's a preliminary matter. As we all know, not all people in the United States have the same opportunities to pursue a healthy lifestyle. As Dr. Burr just talked about, this is largely due to access barriers and social determinants of health. But I think it's fair to say we're in the midst of a transition. What do I mean? How healthcare is delivered and consumed is changing dramatically technology advances. Many stakeholders, some of whom are going to be represented on this panel, are developing and deploying innovative digital health tools for use everywhere from hospitals to the home. And this innovation has the potential, the tremendous potential, I would argue, to better democratize healthcare in the United States. So we have tools ranging from artificial intelligence-driven clinical decision support to diagnose patients, the wearable technology, remote patient monitoring, telehealth, even to the use of digital therapeutics to tackle mental health and substance abuse issues. Healthcare is undergoing a significant digital transformation. The issue, and what brings us all here, is that much of this innovation works most effectively with high-speed connectivity. So in other words, if a person is not connected, that person is at risk of not being able to access the latest and high-quality care. Which brings us to this great panel. 
Um, in terms of uh, housekeeping items, how we're going to do this is I am going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves, their role in the organization, the organization, and the kind of work the organization is doing at the intersection of some of the issues we're talking about here. And then we'll get into some Q&A. If you have any questions uh, as we're going, please include them in the Q&A uh, portion of, of the platform, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And so with that, we're going to start the introductions, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Karen Raban to get us started. Thank you, Renee. And can you hear me? Have you just confirm? Yes? Oh, good. Perfect. Thank you. It's, and thank you to the task force for organizing this day and for all the work that you have done for so very long. Uh, we are proud supporters and collaborators with the Federal Communications Commission and the work that you've been doing uh, for many years now. Uh, so I'm the medical director of the telemedicine program at the University of Virginia. Uh, I'm a pediatric cardiologist and have had a long-standing career of traveling to see patients all over the Commonwealth of Virginia. And as such, about 25 years ago, we established our telemedicine program, which was designed to improve access to care uh, for patients across the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, we, prior to COVID-19, we uh, partnered with more than 150 sites across Virginia and did some international work as well. Um, and um, then did a strategic plan for telemedicine in 2019, right prior to COVID-19. And following that, we scaled massively. So I really look forward to the discussion uh, in this session so we can talk about all the innovations that we have, we and others have developed to bring care to patients where they are, and that has to be facilitated facilitated by broadband communication services. So thank you, Renee, for the introduction. Great. Dr. Rue? Yes, thank you, Renee. Thank you, everyone, for uh, hosting this panel. My name is David Rue. I am the Global Chief Medical Officer for Microsoft. I'm a physician, technologist, health services researcher, spent the past 25 years looking at how technology can be used to improve access to care, quality of care, patient safety, improve the experience for both patients and providers, and also find ways that we can improve the efficiency of care. A big part of what we've explored over the past decade has been digital technologies that allow us to be able to provide care in the home, outside of the clinics. Uh, these are opportunities for us to be able to, as Dr. Berwick had said, rethink how care can be delivered. Uh, but at the same time, we've also seen that there are some challenges. Uh, the first and foremost, many of these individuals that we are trying to service don't have the capabilities to be able to take advantage of the de digital technologies and the AI that we're developing. And so a big focus for us has been to start with the digital building blocks that allow for individuals across the country and the globe to be able to have those working in collaboration with local organizations through public-private partnerships. We launched the Airband Initiative in 2017, uh, have identified areas and opportunities for where affordable broadband may be applied, but there's a lot of work to be done. We expect uh, that a lot of this work will continue uh, in collaboration with the FCC and other organizations and look forward to today's discussion. Thank you, Dr. Rue. Uh, Michael Crawford. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to the task force and FCC for hosting this timely and meaningful con uh, conversation. I am happy to be here uh, this afternoon. My name is Michael Crawford. I'm the Associate Dean for Strategy, Outreach, and Innovation at Howard University College of Medicine, also the Founding Executive Director for Howard University's 1867 Health Innovations Project. And I really want to focus my, my introductory comments on our innovation program. Um, 1867 was founded in April 2020, uh, but the consent Perception and design was thought through prior to COVID-19. The program is designed to partner with entrepreneurs, researchers, corporate partners to tackle complex challenges confronting vulnerable and medically underserved communities from a digital health perspective. So we're really looking at four key areas. How do we increase access to technology? How do we improve healthcare outcomes with technology, the patient experience, as well as affordability? And at the heart of the work that we're doing, uh, broadband is critically important. Uh, we have been hosting small pilots uh, using technology either to augment existing models of care 
are looking at designing new models of care supported by technology to really think about how we improve health and well-being for the most vulnerable among us. And some of those lessons learned from our, our pilots have been broadband is an essential component in, in order for folks to be able to achieve optimal health. Digital literacy needs to be focused and concentrated on to make sure that everyone has the competence and confidence to optimize the use of technology. Also need to think about um, how we look at this bi-directional training component of patient slash consumer uh, with provider to make sure that everyone is operating from in uh, robust understanding of, of digital literacy. So we've been doing a lot of great work um, in this space and really looking forward to diving a little bit deeper about our efforts as well as the way broadband can help improve the health and well-being for vulnerable communities. Thanks, Michael. And as I initially said, we've got a very diverse set of perspectives here. We've heard from Academic Medical Center referred to a Microsoft. And now we're going to hear from a telecommunications company. Joe, I wanted you to introduce yourself and some of the work you guys are doing. Very good. Hey, thanks, Renee. Thanks for having me on. And I'm not a medical uh, doctor, but I am a consumer and certainly an evangelist for the way connectivity and technology can transform uh, the patient experience. And I know we've all experienced gaps and challenges. And so thank you to the FCC for having us and having this conversation today. At at and we believe that connectivity will underpin transformation in healthcare. And we're on a mission to be the premier connectivity enabler for this kind of transformation. Um, the last couple of years have been clearly very, very difficult um, and a lot of hardship, but there has been a few silver linings. And I think it's in this area Many people have never had a virtual visitor, had any kind of virtual care prior to the pandemic and experienced it during that period of time. And there have been some real benefits to it. First off, reimbursement's gotten a lot better. And so I think it started to open doors for what's possible um, for providers and consumers. Uh, but we still believe there are a couple of issues. One of them is connectivity and the lack of connectivity. Not everybody has access to the internet. And the other one is a lot of these technologies have been very difficult to use. So specifically in our healthcare practice, we're working on addressing those two things. And I have the pleasure of leading the healthcare vertical for uh, AT&T, which is a vertical comprised of healthcare providers and the entire continuum of care, including a lot of startup technology as well. Um, so really quickly um, for connectivity, there's a couple things that we're doing at at and and I can share a little bit more about it. Uh, the first being, we are the nation's provider for FirstNet, uh, which was born out of the unfortunate situation at 9-11 when the first responders could not communicate because there was so much congestion on the network. Five years ago, we won that award and we've been deploying FirstNet. And through the pandemic, the FirstNet Authority approved virtual care as a use case by which we can use that network. So FirstNet provides differentiated connectivity, better reach into rural areas, and priority for those that are on the network. And many of the virtual care and remote patient monitoring solutions that we've worked to enable have been able to take advantage of this platform. The other thing, as Dr. Roos said, is that still a lot of people do not have internet access or broadband in the United States. 14.5 um, million Americans still lack access to internet. And so at at and we've made a big investment through between 21 and 24, we've um, announced that we will invest $2 billion in trying to help close the digital divide, including providing affordable internet access for those that participate in the government's program. So that's on the connectivity piece. On the ease of use piece, we're working to help provide devices, security and logistics services. Our vision is that if you are a consumer in your home and need to connect to your clinician, we wanna make that as easy to use. And so a good example is if we were managing congestive heart failure, we don't wanna send that consumer a box that has to be configured and paired and secured. We want that consumer to be able to open the box and immediately get access uh, to his or her clinician. And so we're working on that as well. So Renee, thanks for having me. Really looking forward to the discussion today. Great. I can't wait to get into some of these media issues given 
the different perspectives we have. Um, last but certainly not least, we have a federal agency perspective. Beth, uh, would you introduce yourself and some of the work that's taking place at ONC? Sure. Um, my name is Elizabeth Myers. I am the Deputy Director of Policy at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. Long name, uh, basic focus is um, we're not the innovators here, you all are, but we are the ones who are responsible for trying to establish a foundational platform on which innovation can occur. Um, we've been engaged with SDC and um, the uh, effort to expand broadband access uh, basically since the High Tech Act, since the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act back in 2009. Um, I personally have actually been involved in the efforts of coordinating across um, from my prior work at CMS. Some of you who are in the healthcare industry know the term meaningful use and know what that was all about and trying to really expand access to health information technology for healthcare providers and ensure that we can get to some basic fundamental um, technology evolution within the healthcare industry, starting from the most basic platform of let's get systems in the hands of healthcare providers Let's get data standardized so that it can actually be captured and shared. And let's think about how we're connecting these systems across platforms to allow for care coordination and patient access to their own health information. We've come a long way since then. Um, we've gotten several foundational principles across. And most recently in the past two years, we've been able to um, put into place regulations that will get a core set of data. So a core set of baseline data elements for care um, to be uh, universally adopted across systems. The goal for that is actually within the next nine months to get what is called USCDI, the United States Core Data for Interoperability, um, to be that baseline care clinical data across systems. And we've also done several pieces that we call interoperability criterion within our program. We've adopted standards for electronic health records and health information technology systems that need to allow for both document-based exchange, so, so a structured document like a summary of care record or a discharge summary to move from point to point in an interoperable manner using standards so it can be consumed on the receiving end, but also to um, leverage application programming interfaces. So we can actually start to let the innovators innovate by ensuring that systems are actually doing a standardized platform on which innovators can build. And some really important pieces about what we've done there that hopefully can help to change this dynamic um, and really think about reducing disparities and getting um, better access across the entire healthcare industry for all patients, whether they're in rural areas or urban areas or somewhere in between, is to ensure that um, those technologies aren't just focused on one type of solution. So our criterion, we often think about application programming interfaces and smartphones and apps that you might use to access it that way, but that isn't the only alternative. Um, there are other ways that those particular exchange functionalities and modalities can work and that those standards can work to support the flow of information. And what we think that means for really changing the dynamic is that information that's necessary for care, whether it's through telehealth or an in-person visit or a combination of those types of things, which often is the solution for underserved areas. Um, you can get the data that you need when and where you need it, that patients can get their data in a way that's easy for them to access, in a way that's usable for them so they can have a better way of understanding their care and making more informed decisions and really thinking about how their care decisions can be informed by what their care providers are actually doing with their information. And then also ensuring that um, when a patient has a visit somewhere that another care provider, especially for patients that are maybe seeing multiple care providers or maybe particularly mobile, are um, getting the information that they need that's relevant. And these are essentially important for all sorts of things we've seen the importance of these over the past two years, not only with COVID, but with some of the other healthcare issues that COVID has highlighted, like behavioral health and the opioid epidemic. So that's what I'm here for, is to talk about what we've been doing. It's really a foundation for, for the much more interesting and fascinating and exciting things that the rest of the panel is here to talk about. Really looking forward to the conversation today, and thank you for inviting us. Great. Uh, phenomenal uh, intros from everybody. You can see the different perspectives all these organizations bring to the table. So I'm going to start off with some questions, um, and this is for the entire panel, but I'm going to throw it to Dr. Ruth first. As a preliminary question, during the pandemic, we have heard a lot about digital health and emerging health technologies. Can you discuss how these tools are improving health and well-being in this country? 
Thanks, Renee. A great question. And we've seen such an amazing array of different technologies, everything from remote patient monitoring and different sensors and wearables to artificial intelligence being applied. But again, back to thinking a bit about the infrastructure and some of the things that underlie that, we haven't been able to deploy this in areas where there have been multiple things lacking. And I'll start again with the whole issue about affordable broadband. Uh, Joe had mentioned a statistic that is, I think, oftentimes cited, which is the 2020 FCC report that indicated that 14.5 million Americans have uh, do not have access to uh, broadband. Well, this is something that Microsoft has been looking into as well through partners that have done extensive surveys, such as the Pew Institute. And our results and analyses have indicated that that is an underestimate by about eightfold it actually is probably closer to 120.4 million individuals across the United States. So I think the first step would be to uh, take a look at really the size of the problem and also the geographies and the localities. Originally, a lot of this was assumed that it was occurring in rural areas. We've seen a significant pr proportion in urban areas. And what we've realized is that there needs to be more that needs to be done to address this in both rural and urban. Now, some of the other learnings, as Michael had indicated, uh, simply providing access to affordable broadband uh, is a starting point, but digital literacy is the next building block. And as we think about that, we need to find ways to make things more uh, understandable, uh, the ways that people can be able to easily use accessibility for those that have disabilities and difficulty comprehending, comprehending the different tools, uh, different language support. I mean, we're talking a whole different way of approaching this to make this much more accessible and inclusive. And then on top of that, healthcare literacy, even understanding what does all this information mean? There's oftentimes you look at the, the results and it's just very unclear in terms of what exactly uh, is this uh, useful? Is this something that I need to act upon? And when we have those in place, then we can start taking advantage of those amazing technologies that uh, myself and a variety of other organizations have been working on to apply the AI to expand our capabilities. To Dr. Berwick's point, redesign healthcare using infrastructure that now is in place that allows us to be able to think of the care delivery system not so much as an individual visit to a clinician that is now virtualized, but now in which you have an entire care team that has tools to be able to access individuals anytime, multiple times throughout the day and upon demand. That's where the opportunity lies. And we're going to need to start with the building blocks, but then build towards something really magnificent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Raban is a longtime telehealth practitioner. Maybe you can talk a little bit about your experience about how digital health and emerging health technologies or improving health and well-being, particularly in the populations you serve? Well, thank you for that great question. Um, you know, we've been at it for a very, very long time, and we have been hobbled, honestly, by major policy challenges that all of us, and certainly in, in the healthcare industry, have faced. Um, COVID has shown us that we can begin to move that giant ship, and academic medical centers, uh, we're giant ships, right? We need to make sure that we're providing high quality care to our patients, that we engage our providers to be able to do it, that we listen to our patients and we understand what their needs are. You know, some of the things that we have done following COVID-19 um, include such things as uh, integrating video within our electronic medical record platform. And we chose a technology that would enable us to connect to our patients at the lowest possible bandwidth. And we recognize that we have a patient portal, but not all patients have enrolled in the patient portal. So we chose a technology that would allow us to connect by sending a link to a patient. Now that pre supposes that a patient has connectivity, right? In order to be able to support those encounters. So we have to think of all of these things, reimbursement models. Um, I'm really grateful to all the COVID relief funds that have been provided by the federal government, which has enabled us to really transform. Um, Commissioner Carr, I think he coined the phrase, um, blockbuster to Netflix models. That's what we have hoped to deploy. Um, and as such, where we where our patients don't have connectivity, we've used FCC funds, 
um, such as you know, the COVID-19 telemedicine grants to provide devices to patients, uh, and also the Connected Care Pilot Program for us to be able to incorporate remote patient monitoring tools uh, into those devices, give them to the patients so they have a form of connectivity, and then uh, enroll them in our patient portal, provide um, you know, virtual care models. Um, and then it's really important that we use our experiences and our data to transform public policies, right? Because we know the Congressional Budget Office has to score uh, you know, any bills that are before Congress. So we need to have those outcomes data that demonstrate the efficacy of the work that we have done. So it's been a labor of love for all of us, um, but moving this big ship is challenging, but we need to bring care to the patient, incorporate their medical home in as, as often as possible, as, as much as we can uh, to improve outcomes. and. Um, improve access to care. So I, I, I say for sure, as Dr. Berwick alluded to, telehealth should be a major role in the uh, in care redesign, and we need to get providers and systems uh, aligned with that model and that approach. Thank you. Great. Uh, Michael, could you talk a little bit about, you and I have talked offline before about how the uh, Howard University community responded to COVID-19, particularly relying on emerging health technologies. Can you just Talk a little bit about um, what kinds of things you did. Sure, um, and, and as my as my colleagues um, probably experience here on the call and throughout the country, um, I the COVID nineteen presented an interesting challenge for a healthcare provider. Uh, like many healthcare providers throughout the country, we scaled up a telehealth program in four weeks. We went from single digit adoption to 80% adoption uh, over the course of a four week period. It was an extraordinary effort uh, to not only procure a telehealth platform uh, with our EHR provider, which some of our EHR providers were not prepared uh, for this large migration to uh, in, enhance uh, telehealth in terms of the population and the utilization. So there had to be some tweaks and modifications to make sure that the telehealth platform uh, was robust enough to be able to deliver the level of care that we needed for our patient population. We also had to train our workforce and particularly our providers. Some of our providers were not as facile uh, with telehealth because they were solely reliant on in-person care and they were very comfortable with that particular modality. So we had to develop training programs and tutorials to bring our staff uh, and support staff up, up to the level to be able to engage in a telehealth um, strategy robustly. And then on the other side, from a patient perspective, I think that there's been a lot of talk about how telehealth has been a critical lifeline, which it, which it has to be able to provide access to care, uh, to address some of these delayed care issues that were associated with COVID. Uh, but what we found is that the same issues that we were talking about surface during that experience. Some of our patients didn't have access to broadband, or if they did have access to broadband, their broadband was insufficient to be able to engage in a robust telehealth encounter. Some of the data, which is consistent with our experience, shows that our patient population, it happens to be um, low, some a portion of low income, um, disproportionately use audio calls versus video calls to be able to engage in a telehealth encounter. And we, we know a video encounter is more efficacious than an audio encounter. Then we were also relying on self-reported data. So we were relying on patients that have limited healthcare knowledge to report back to the, the provider uh, on their blood pressure, uh, on their uh, different types of biometrics to be able to engage in a engaging conversation with a provider, which the data in some instances was very unreliable. And you were relying on an untrained healthcare professional to have a conversation with a healthcare professional about maybe a chronic disease or even a prevented illness. So we, we noticed a number of things that remote patient monitoring is, is key uh, to be able to have connected devices that are reporting data in real time, that physicians are relying on that type of data as, as opposed to self-reported data. Um, that data is a little bit more reliable in terms of being able to prescribe an intervention uh, or a different type of model. And then also the other thing that was, was really stark is that there was a number of patients that wanted to engage uh, from a telehealth perspective, but they were digitally naive, right? They never really used the internet 
prior to this experience. So as Joe mentioned, the patient experience was incredibly important. There was a low threshold to be able to participate. If there was some level of friction, they would churn off and means that they wouldn't use the telehealth modality and they would essentially delay care. And we know that the data around delayed care led to progressive disease uh, progression, uh, also in some instances death, right? Because folks could not connect uh, with the provider. So we, we were like many providers, we, we ramped up, but we also recognize uh, that telehealth is, is a critical modality, uh, but there are other wraparound services and other things to be done to ensure that all communities have fair access and equitable access to telehealth. Excellent, excellent. Um, Juror Elizabeth, uh, anything to add on this question about digital health and health technologies and how these tools are improving health and well-being? Sure, I can um, jump in with a, a, an historic story and then and hopefully it, it sort of sheds some light on where we think we can continue to go if we continue to think about things um, in the way that Michael is saying, where you're thinking about all of the different barriers because it's not one, it's multiple barriers that we have to figure out how to address. One of the things that 10 years ago, um, I, I, I did a, a panel actually with an FCC group about meaningful use and the HR incentive programs and all of these things that were giving incentives to certain types of clinicians and hospitals to buy electronic health record systems and they had to do certain things for it. One of the things they had to do was exchange records and share information with patients. And they could exclude from that if they didn't have broadband access in their area up to a certain amount. And we went through these exercises with FCC of trying to figure out how to implement this because it was one of the things that the law wanted us to take into account and it was everything from you can't do this at a county level because the road where you know, broadband goes up to the end of the road and my facility is five feet past it and we don't have that access because it's a you know fiber optic network and it's not, not providing it to us. So a healthcare provider literally at the end of the road in that county couldn't actually get onto that system without paying exorbitant amounts of money to build it themselves. So these were the types of nuances that we were trying to figure out. You had to figure out how to, you know, you have an EHR now, but you can't connect it to the internet. So what are we supposed to be able to do there? Um, and it's come a long way since then, and there's been a lot of progress since then. But what we're still seeing is that there are multiple barriers that are in the way. And some of those barriers aren't just about getting the device in the hands of the patient or getting the device in the hands of the provider or whether they can connect to the internet. Then what happens once you've done that? So on the point about monitoring and about um, getting accurate data and that the care provider might be at a completely different location, not at their medical care home, that's actually doing the telehealth visit if we're talking about something like that, is that we need to figure out how to connect all of these data sources and we need to figure out how to make them be more nimble so that you don't have to have heavy infrastructure, huge massive systems to be able to be nimble. You need to be able to think about cloud-based solutions and think about data standards that can connect these pieces. So those are some of the things that we are in particular focused on. And the reason that we're focused on them is for exactly that reason. If we can get sort of a nationwide mesh that makes the data move across the country, even if it starts out in one system versus another. Um, we know during COVID there were cross-state agreements to do telehealth visits. So someone in Pennsylvania might be seeing a doctor in Wisconsin. You know, how can we get these things to connect? So the doctor in Wisconsin has the data, the patient has the data, and the doctor in Pennsylvania has the data, no matter what their systems are. So that's sort of what we're focused on. So some of these other solutions or some of these innovations around how we think about the people part of it. How do we get a care provider at home and community-based services into the person's house to help them figure out how to use their device and how to, how to connect their remote monitoring technologies? You can't solve those if they can't talk to each other in the first place. So that's what we're focused on. But the rest of this is all like, let's, you know, we want to help make sure that it can be built. So that's what we try and try and think about is, is what is the floor that you need to be able to build these things on top of? And I, I think that what we're hearing is there's still a lot of different pieces that need to be figured out there. So I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing more about what we can do to try and make that floor more stable. Joe, anything to add on this question? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier, we're working with a lot of different startup companies and I just thought I'd share a couple examples of some really neat startup technologies because I do believe it's an interesting 
a challenge that we're all trying to solve from all different perspectives too, right? We're trying to figure out how do you go from a traditional uh, space of in-hospital care and how do you take that beyond the four walls of the hospital? And so the providers obviously are front and center. You have technology companies uh, like us and Microsoft here. A lot of a lot of what's going to continue to be presented to us as opportunity are these really innovative companies that start with just a few people and an idea. And so we're we're trying to seek them out at AT and T and figure out how we can work with them to um, bring their solutions to market and provide that connectivity piece, which is essential in order to make it all work. So. Just a couple of examples. We recently launched uh, with a, a really innovative company, the world's first uh, connected pulse oximeter. And so, you know, as you all know, if you um, went to a um, to a retail pharmacy, you could get a, a pulse ox, but it's likely going to be Bluetooth, and you're going to have to download an app, and you're going to have to set it up and configure it. Now you're going to have the data and figure out how to get it to your clinician. This is you open it up, put it on your finger, and it just works because it's IoT and so they're connected. So that's just kind of the concept that we continue to look at these technologies. Another one that we recently uh, worked with is a um, under the mattress pad that um, gets some vital information and can sense movements with the consumer not even having to think about it. And again, that's right out of the box. You open it up, you turn it on, power it on, it's connected. You don't have to figure that out. You don't have to pair it to Wi-Fi and uh, you put it under uh, the mattress. And I think you're going to see more and more technologies like that where the consumer doesn't have to configure it, doesn't even remember that it's there. And now, uh, whether it's aging in place or somebody with a chronic condition, being able to get that information uh, back to the clinician. Uh, we're also working with a number of different uh, platform providers that are making really neat remote patient monitoring platforms, um, and they're tackling it in different ways. And so I think it's neat to see where that's going. It's also going to be neat to see how AI starts to get involved in that continuum of care, because I feel for the providers, and we hear this all the time, providers say, hey, it's great that you can shove all this data to me, but it's just too much. Um, so how do we work with AI to figure out how machines can do a lot of that initial interaction and triaging and only until it gets to an escalated case, uh, does it actually go to, you know, a nurse or a care coordinator or somebody like that. So um, encouraged by the innovation that's taking place, um, all that being said, as everybody else has said, how do we get it not only to those that have the resources to afford the care, but how do we then drive the technology to those that are under-resourced? Yeah, and that's a great segue. I'm, I'm coming back to you, Dr. Rabana. And before I ask my question, some of you have already figured this out. You're uh, posing questions in the q and I promise I'll try to get to as many as I can uh, during this discussion. But given what Joe said about all this innovation, from your perspective as a provider, and running a phenomenal telemedicine program, what do you see as the current opportunities and concerns about the increasing reliance on technology-enabled solutions powered by connectivity, particularly as uh, regarding vulnerable or underserved communities? Um, great question, really, Renee. Um, from our perspective, you know, where does the data go? Who manages that data? How do we integrate it into the patient record? How do we close the loop back to the patient? All of these are important considerations. And I wanna also add, currently we still have so many challenges in terms of the 1834M restrictions, many of which were waived in the waivers um, that enabled us to reach urban populations who are just as vulnerable as some of our rural and underserved. You know, we need to change that paradigm uh, as quickly as possible because for health systems to invest, for providers to provide these services, there needs to be a payment mechanism and a reimbursement mechanism that will enable that to continue. Um, you know, we've created some new models, including with community paramedics that will be connected virtually to go to the home of the patient, especially those patients who utilize the ED as their primary care provider. You know, how can we better their outcomes? So a lot of this is that we have to 
use our research um, to provide the data to the policymakers that will transform uh, ultimate public policy that will enable us then to continue these models of care. Again, it's care redesign, but you know, today, here and now, we still need relief because to invest in these systems, our providers need to have a mechanism by which coverage works. Um, so you know, I don't mean to be a, a naysayer in any way, shape or form, but it is a challenge. And of course we do, as Michael said, we need to train our providers uh, in these new paradigms of healthcare. Uh, and it is team-based care. Uh, and we need to be able to have everybody connected. So uh, kind of a, a glom back at you, but you know, it's, a, it's sort of a vicious cycle. We need to break that vicious cycle. I will also add that our Medicaid agency provided some pretty amazing information to some of the congressional committees that showed following COVID-19, where they massively scaled telemedicine coverage in Virginia anyway, that it was the, the telemedicine services were not additive they were in lieu of some of the in-person services. So total cost of care did not increase. And Medicaid has taken that to say, yes, we support expansions in remote patient monitoring. So again, data is critical to change and inform public policy. Yeah, I think great example of how innovation is tied to policy and healthcare. Sometimes um, we forget how different this sector actually is. Uh, something that both you and Michael brought up, and Michael, I'm going to turn to you, uh, when, when, when I hear the words broadband and connectivity, uh, it usually leads me to think about rural America and rural areas of the country. And I think you've touched on this a little bit in some of your remarks, but can you talk about why these challenges are just as critical in urban areas? Certainly. Uh, and it, it, it's very interesting, um, your question, because it, it, it also it also highlights this, this notion around um, sometimes when you think about rural America and ample access to healthy foods and vegetables, you would think that individuals that live in rural America would be healthier from a disease burden perspective. Um, in terms of broadband access in urban and rural America, uh, folks, to your point, often gravitate towards rural America is underserved from a broadband perspective. Uh, and in fact, if, if you look at the data, I think the most recent Pew study talks specifically to the urban and rural context. And it talks about how many individuals in, in the urban area actually might have access, but have poor adoption, right? So they don't actually have a broadband subscription. So where they might have access, folks are not connected. Uh, and that number is higher than rural Americans that are connected or that are disconnected. So it's really interesting when you think about it from, from that construct uh, and a couple things that, that we've seen uh, in practice anecdotally, one is cost, obviously is an issue, the affordability of broadband is a reason why folks are not connected, a reliance on the mobile phone uh, to be able to query the internet, but as we all know, all mobile phones are not created equal. Uh, and if you don't have a robust data plan, uh, it limits your ability to be able to participate in a meaningful healthcare experience. And then the other piece is around using having hardware available in the home to be able to access broadband. So laptop, tablet, et cetera. And those things sometimes are cost prohibitive for individuals uh, that reside in low income or medically underserved communities in urban environments throughout the country. So what we have started to do is to talk about evidence and correlating clinical outcomes with evidence of using technology and broadband. And we've been doing it through our 1867 Health Innovations Project uh, and working with innovative startups throughout the, the country as well as uh, internationally and looking at how we can design models supported by technology to be able to pilot them in a real dynamic clinical setting based on clinical metrics, metrics that align with some of our payers, as well as some quality of life factors. And we pilot the technologies in the model to determine whether they are efficacious or not. We use that data to support a business case with the payer to determine whether or not they would reimburse the technology and the model to create additional access. Because I think the only way that we're going to be able to compel folks to think about this, not only in an urban, in a rural construct, but holistically, is to think about 
the, the proof benefits of using technology to be able to improve healthcare access, outcomes, affordability, and most importantly, the patient experience. I'm gonna to turn to some of the questions in the Q&A a little bit. And Joe, when you were talking about the pulse ox, you used the term IoT. For those who don't know, can you just quickly explain what you meant by IoT? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry about that. Uh, Internet of things. So just think about really, really low uh, data connectivity over cellular. And um, the, the benefits of it is a lot of times this connectivity is very, very inexpensive. And so if I just want to be able to send something like uh, my blood oxygen levels, as an example, that would be something you could use. It's low power, low cost, you know, really low bandwidth kind of connectivity that tends to penetrate really well also into rural areas, into urban areas, into buildings, as an example. So we do believe there's going to be some opportunity there. Excellent. Excellent. Now, let's talk a little bit about the future. And Dr. Ru, I'm going to turn to you. You know, often when we discuss connectivity and health, and we've done it today too, people tend to think mostly about healthcare delivery, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, issues like telehealth services. Could you share with us from, from your perspective where you sit at Microsoft, where healthcare is going in the short, mid, maybe five years down the road in terms of digital innovation and why and how connectivity is going to be critical beyond just telehealth? Let's start with uh, where we're at today. A large part of where we're at is we have an ability to do a video conference call. We have an ability to capture data, uh, whether it's on episodic data or continuous data. And all that information is fed into an area that can be secured and then potentially assessed. But there are challenges that we have to look at. If you want to increase adoption, we, and there's also opportunities. In terms of challenges, Joe touched on one of them. There's just too much data. And it does not make sense for clinicians to be able to be the arbiter of all that information and trying to figure out what's relevant, what's not. It sort of reminds me of, you know, we've we've turned the fire hydrant, so we now have access to water, but what we need is now a faucet. And we need the tools and the ability to understand how to determine what is the appropriate amount at different times. So advanced analytics can help us. Artificial intelligence can help us synthesize all this information, make it actionable, allow us to be much more predictive. Those are essential tools that are under development and will be critical as we think ahead. Second thing is there's still clinical workflow issues. A clinician at the end of the day is still going to have to document, put that into the electronic health record. You've just added another way for them to be able to do this. But what we now have, because this is in a digital environment, an opportunity to be able to apply AI, specifically ambient clinical intelligence, to be able to capture that conversation, convert that from voice to text, understand the actual context of what we're talking about, map it on the back end to medical terminologies, and then organize that into a clinical note that can be integrated into the medical record. It's already being done today, saves clinicians about 50% or more of their time entering orders, or entering documentation into the electronic health record. These type of technologies will be essential as we start thinking ahead about how to increase adoption. Now, because this terminology, these medical these uh, con this conversation has been now underst underst understandable by the computer, we then have an opportunity to apply clinical decision support and be able to then push this into other arenas and improve care coordination around that. So just a tremendous amount of opportunities as we think about that. And the third is an area that we are ex excited to explore because there are new opportunities that can arise when we think about what's possible digitally. If I were to have a conversation with a patient, I'm just looking at the individual's face. I have no idea what's going on with the environment around them. Perhaps there's an IV that is out or in, you know, red and inflamed. Perhaps there's something on the ground where the rug is uh, perhaps a, a fall risk. These are all things that oftentimes would be relevant if I were right there. Well, with some of the digital technologies, in particular mixed reality, we have an opportunity where an individual in the room could put the headset on and it gives us a point of view that we don't have today with virtual care. This is also being done today. The NHS, the National Health Services has adopted and is starting to use in certain areas, in particular in the Kendall care homes, an ability for 
nurses in the nursing home to be able to wear these headsets and provide a virtual care visit where a GP on the other end is now being able to assess the entire room and be able to go into areas that perhaps may not have been possible with a typical virtual visit. So we have so many opportunities, areas that we can optimize and explore beyond and central to all of that will be data and artificial intelligence. Yeah, and when you use the term artificial intelligence, Dr. Rue, could you just quickly explain what you mean? It really is just an opportunity to be able to bring disparate and vast amounts of data together so that we can process it in ways that a normal that that a, an individual would be able to do, but at much faster speeds and with higher reliability. So oftentimes the things that we're talking about automating, a human is currently doing or a human should be doing. And what we want to do is we want to find ways that the computer can help those clinicians and patients be able to do things much better, faster. And that's relevant because oftentimes we find out much later after the fact, when somebody's looked through the medical records or looked through all the data and identified, boy, that would have been sure helpful if I knew that when I was talking to the patient at that time. That's what can be very helpful because it allows us to be able to accelerate the learning process and present that information when clinicians and patients need it. Now, sticking with that theme about looking sort of into the future, Joe, um, obviously at and is a non-traditional player in healthcare. So what do companies like yours um, foresee in the future and what role are you going to play in our health and educational systems as we continue this digital transformation of our healthcare system? It breaks my heart to hear you say that, Renee. I, want, uh, I definitely want people to walk away from this uh, with a sense uh, but seriously, I, we do have a responsibility uh, at, at at and I think large companies in general do because there still are gaps in care and challenges. Um, so we see healthcare and the digital divide in general as areas where, where we absolutely need to be very purposeful about making a difference. Um, so I a couple a couple things come to mind uh, when you ask the question. I think one is. Um, you should expect companies like at and and carriers to continue to invest in the network. So really great comments. Um, a lot of times, uh, Michael, I heard you say that when people think about um, gaps in connectivity, you, you think about that rural area, I'm up in the mountains, and, and carriers have to continue to work to figure out how to get coverage everywhere. Um, but there's also that challenge in rural areas just in terms of coverage. Um, and so companies like at and need to continue to invest and make that coverage available for sure. Uh, I think the other thing is uh, you just can't watch what's going on in the world right now um, and uh, and not think about the the threat to um, cybersecurity and and to uh, patient uh, information. And so it's it's going to be important for the technology companies and the carriers to come together and figure out how do we secure data and how do we tried to minimize uh, the cyber threats. Um, I, I read a stat recently that um, in the first half of last year, the uh, the number of uh, compromised health institutions was up like almost 30%. Um, and about 22 million Americans during that period of time had some personal health compromised. And so how, do, how does an AT&T, a carrier, how do these big technology companies help secure that information? And then I think, um, Lastly, just uh, the ability then to say um, we want to help the under-resourced, uh, one, by providing a low-cost broadband internet. I, I mentioned that earlier, but um, th the government uh, has come out with a program for reduced internet access for those that qualify. And AT&T came out with a plan that's um, discounted as well. So those individuals actually could get free internet, which is awesome. I can't think of any time we've had that before. Um, so that, I think that's a a big deal. The other thing is um, uh, there's also um, a bunch of new opportunities for municipalities now uh, to get reimbursed for investment into furthering broadband deployments. And so I know there were some questions about, you know, gaps in areas and what about neighborhoods. I think you're going to see some partnering from the carriers and the municipalities now to go figure out how do I get coverage? Because I think all of us, I'm sure, have experienced or live somewhere where the coverage just wasn't adequate. And so when that happens, a lot of things break down, especially in today's world with the connected home. And so we're going to continue to partner with municipalities there. Oh, a bright future indeed. That's awesome. Um, so okay. Elizabeth, 
I just want to add one thing that it really behooves us as providers to make sure we're thoughtful about our processes so that we don't consume our patients' uh, data plans with patients on hold waiting to be seen. You know, it's all, it's the whole ecosystem. We have to be thoughtful because these patients may not be able to afford unlimited data plans. And uh, so accordingly, those processes are important considerations for us as we provide these services. No, not for man. I think that's a great point. I think what we're starting to see, which we didn't see a lot of, um, we haven't seen a lot of historically, is different sectors talking to each other. And this panel is a great example of that. Um, so, Elizabeth, back to you a little bit. Um, you talked a little bit about what ONC is doing. What can the innovation community do, as well as other agencies um, within the federal government that are developing broadband? policies, what can we do to support ONC and its work now and where you think healthcare is headed in the future? Sure. And I think this actually relates to something that Karen mentioned and something that Michael was mentioning as well. And, you know, the, the title of this session includes S SDOH, right? So we're talking about social determinants of health and the idea that broadband needs to be considered as a social determinant of health, that connectivity and technology access is a social determinant of health, just like food insecurity, transportation access, these housing security, these types of things are all interconnected and they're often co-occurring. So one of the things that we've been looking at a lot is thinking about health equity by design. So thinking about how we are ensuring that, um, there's, there's a saying that, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the saying wrong, but if you aren't being deliberate in the beginning about underserved population, what you're doing is actually exacerbating disparity. It doesn't matter how good intent, well intended it is, if it isn't deliberately trying to address disparities, it, it is exacerbating it. And so one of the things that we think about when we think about social determinants of health and how that data can move, so you talk about closed loop referrals and you talk about how, um, a clinician could be using up someone's time or a clinician could be referring someone for telehealth when they don't have access to telehealth, right? And you know, we talk about rural areas where people have to drive two hours to get to a facility. Well, in an urban area where you don't have a car and it's six miles away, that is just as much of a challenge. So transportation insecurity, housing insecurity and technology insecurity are all interconnected. So we've been particularly looking at a couple of areas that think about um, healthcare in the big picture of this type of consideration and how things we need to think about things like common community-based services, community benefit organizations, and what we call closed loop referrals. Those would be my top priorities when we think about healthcare and social determinants of health and broadband. Thinking about how to innovate so that we're talking about how we care for the whole person, because healthcare is just one aspect of what underserved communities aren't getting because they don't have broadband access. Um, I'm going to plug in an example, but I won't tell you where it is because it was actually a family member of mine that was engaged in this. But you talk about individual communities and we, what we need to take are some of these really innovative things that are happening in individual communities and figure out how they can happen sort of automatically on a national scale. Um, I know of a particular urban area that a hospital and the schools paired up at the beginning of COVID and when they gave out laptops to kids, so that they could go to school digitally. They did family trainings on laptops for healthcare. So that the facilities, the healthcare facilities were actually sending nurses along with the teams and it took forever and it took a lot of money and dedication, but they made that happen by doing that paired work. And they have a lot, a large population that is English as a second language there. So this was particularly useful for that particular aspect. So that's a community driven focus. But if we think about technology, technology can facilitate that being easier to do. Technology can tell a clinician, this person has transportation insecurity and connectivity insecurity, so maybe we need to figure out if there's a community-based service that can help them to get to care, to get to clinical care, or the other way around, that a community-based organization that knows that someone is involved or enrolled in certain programs, um, is doing reduced school lunches for their children, whatever it is, that they know that that person might not actually have access to healthcare. So how are they going to get a telehealth visit if they don't have a care provider to refer them to one? So it's about thinking about how technology connects these dots and puts that, offers up a solution to David's point of not just um, 
getting all the data, but what can the data tell us to do? What can the data tell us to act on? How can we research the impact of that so we can continually improve how these interventions work? If we know what you all can focus on there, we can help to make sure that the tools that you need to do that are included in the basic regulatory functionality that we require. Great, uh, fantastic. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't know ONC was this heavily involved in this area. So this has been very educational for me and I'm sure for uh, members of our audience. Now we're running short on time. So just sort of last question and if everybody could be brief so we can get people to lunch on time. So we've talked a little bit about how the way people live, learn, work um, that affect a wide range of health and functioning quality of life outcomes continue to evolve. What are your primary concerns about this future and ensuring that um, people have access to high quality care. All people have access to high quality care. We'll start with Dr. Raban, and again, we have about three minutes, so uh, brief would be great. If we wanna start with inclusion, it's about making that extra effort to be able to make sure that the underserved, the vulnerable, the disadvantaged are not being left behind. And we saw during the pandemic that uh, there, there are people being left behind uh, because we hadn't addressed these issues in the past. And so that's going to require extra time and resources. It means that we have to prioritize inclusion in our design for technology, in our rollout of programs, and also in our budgeting. And so infrastructure is a critical part. Broadband is now a part of critical infrastructure to support inclusion as well as healthcare. The second is around people. Right now, there are many individuals that are not only critical as part of the care delivery system, but are not necessarily being met in terms of digital support. Caregivers, community health workers, social workers, case managers, these are, these are individuals who work for organizations that need funding, that need the tools to be able to better manage their care. And these are digital tools that will allow us to be able to become much more efficient. And the last is around scale. We need to have infrastructure in place. And a lot of the pandemic learnings have related to the fact that we work in silos and we have lack of infrastructure, lack of infrastructure on the public health side, lack of interoperability between the different systems, and also the fact that we don't have consumers yet fully empowered with their health care. These are all initiatives that I know that the ONC and others are actively working on, but we need to continue to push towards that because with that, it'll allow us to be able to then leverage the entire power of the organizations and the, the people that they serve. And that's something that will allow us to be able to move forward. Oh, phenomenal comments. And I know we're running short on time, but we'll go an extra five minutes if the panels will allow so everybody can um, can comment on this because I think this is an incredibly important question. Dr. Ravan. Sure. So, and, and what David's comment is completely appropriate. I completely agree with him. I would say also, since we are pretty much agreed that telehealth should be a major component of care redesign, that we get all the federal agencies working together to do strategic planning moving forward and to work with the states because states bear major responsibilities in care design and care delivery for Medicaid populations, for insurance redesign, et cetera. So getting people together to do strategic planning would be my major goal and desire going forward. Michael? Similar to my colleagues, um, I, I think we have an amazing opportunity to think about the 21st century from a digitally inclusive perspective. Um, and it's a matter of, in my opinion, of emergency preparedness, right? We've seen communities throughout the pandemic that didn't have access to broadband, so they couldn't sign up for a COVID-19 test. Individuals that didn't have access to broadband or platforms that spoke their language or accommodated disability of individuals throughout the U.S. to sign up for COVID-19 vaccine. What we found is that if you're not connected, then it's hard for us to reach you. Uh, and I like to say, if you're not connected, you're not counted, right? So we have to figure out how we keep, keep the American public connected and think through what that strategy would look like, because it's a matter of emergency preparedness, in my opinion. And the only way that we can realize a transformed 21st century uh, healthcare system 
is that if we're thinking about broadband uh, from the basis, um, also looking at care delivery and different types of models to treat different types of communities. So it's not a one size fits all. We really have to be very prescriptive and intentional how we treat different communities throughout the country. And then we have to make sure that we have the workforce and infrastructure in, in place to support this, this transition. And last but not least, um, the White House Office of Science and Technology recently has talked about this community connected initiative. And, and I believe our innovation program is very much aligned with that. And in order for us to really address some of these social determinants of health and healthcare disparities, the, the principal way we probably could do that is through technology. So if people are connected, they're optimized, they have literacy and, and support, because support is an area we haven't talked about, folks will be able to really be able to use these technologies both on the provider as well as patient side to optimize their health and well-being. Go. I'll, uh, I'll approach it from the consumer angle. These are all great comments and I'll just add on. Uh, you know, my mother has been going through a battle with cancer and she's getting phenomenal care. It's all in the in the hospital or in the medical facility. So it kind of makes me wonder how much of this could be actually done at home. And how do we all work together from the providers and the clinicians themselves uh, to be open to change? It's changed for everybody. It's changed for the consumer, but it's also changed for the clinician and for the entire system. But how do we work together? with technology companies, with startups and innovators, and then certainly with uh, organizations like the ONC and the FCC um, to really change the way we provide care in the United States for the benefit of, um, of all consumers, those that are under-resourced as well, um, and also to you know, provide better outcomes in ones where you know, people can be uh, where they're more comfortable oftentimes in their homes. So, I think it's an opportunity. Uh, I think it's a it's a it's a big task too. But this is a good example of us all coming together, tackle these together. I think that's ultimately what's going to have to happen in order to see the shift really take place in the United States. Uh, great comments, um, Elizabeth. To round this out, sure. So I think um, I can. I'm going to make a, a fairly specific ask, actually, to to get at what everyone's talking about here um, with infrastructure. So what happens over and over again is that um, there is a mandate or a government program and we all wanna do something. We wanna solve opioid epidemic or we want to make lab reporting work so that COVID test labs actually report all back to the same place and we can figure out what the heck's going on. And over and over again, those funding packages, whether it's from Congress or from the administration or wherever it is to the agency, don't have infrastructure built in in the beginning, and they don't have this conversation about equity by design infrastructure built in from the beginning. So if you get a separate infrastructure package through that says, let's expand broadband, that's great. And then you have to go back to that and think about, oh, we're going to put healthcare in there. We're going to put education in there. We're going to put all these other things in there. But then when you get the specific healthcare or education thing, it doesn't include the infrastructure and it doesn't consider connectivity and broadband and the technology that both the provider and the patient need, right? Because we are also talking about providers who don't have technology either. Um, behavioral health providers, home community service providers, providers in underserved areas that weren't part of meaningful use 10 years ago. So it's all connected to this concept of infrastructure and being able to have technology support healthcare. In order to do that, every single one of those packages needs to include the funding and the considerations for it. So when you talk to leaders in government, when you talk to your state leaders in government, when you talk to your congressmen, remember that that is a key piece that needs to always be considered. We need to always put infrastructure design for equity and disparity reduction into the package, no matter whether the goal of it is reducing um, uh, some particular OUD issue or addressing child and maternal health or whatever it is, it needs to include that key piece of infrastructure as a part of it. Excellent. I want to thank the panel uh, for an incredibly informative and interesting hour. Fortunately, we're up to time. I also want to thank the audience for providing a lot of interesting Q&As. Unfortunately, because of the uh, fulsome discussion we were having, we couldn't get to a lot of questions. But again, thank you very much, audience. Thank you very much, panel, and hope you have a good rest of the week. Thank you. Thanks, all. Thanks Renee. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Renee. Thank you.
We're now uh, going to take a break uh, for lunch um, until 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We would ask that you uh, come back for our uh, start of our next panel, panel three. So uh, thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, we now turn to the afternoon portion of our digital health symposium, beginning with our panel three segment titled, Connecting the Dots, Establishing Broadband Connectivity as a Social Determinant of Health Domain. This segment will be moderated by the Senior Advisor for the FCC's Connect Health Task Force, Dr. Chris Gibbons. Dr. Gibbons. Thank you, Ben. And welcome back. Hope you had a good lunch. We have another very distinguished panel uh, to meet with you today. And the purpose and goal of this panel is really to learn more about the work that they are doing in this area and also to hear their perspectives on what else can be done to advance the role of broadband as a social determinant of health. And with that, why don't we get started? We will start first with uh, Dr. Gopal Singh. It will have each of the panelists introduce themselves and give their talk as we go forward. Dr. Singh. Thank you, Dr. Gibbons. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gopal Singh and I'm with the Health Resources and Services Administration at the Office of Health Equity. Today I want, uh, next slide please. Today I wanted to briefly talk about broadband connectivity as an important social determinant of health and how access disparities are strongly related to health inequalities, both at the individual and the community level. Next slide, please. The findings that I describe are primarily based on the Census Bureau's uh, American Community Survey and CDC's National Vital Statistics System. Next slide, please. Let's move uh, to slide five, and then we can come back to slide four. Sorry. Thanks. According to the 2017 American Community Survey, about 17% of American adults aged 18 and older did not have a broadband internet subs subscription. Disparities in broadband access are fairly stark if you start looking at differences by education, income, race and ethnicity, and geographic area. For example, 27% of those with household incomes below the poverty level did not have broadband subscription, compared with 11% of Americans with incomes at or above 5% of the poverty threshold. And you can also see that about 90% of Asian and Pacific Islanders and 84% of non-Hispanic whites had broadband service compared with only 66% of American Indians and Alaska Natives, 77% of African Americans and 79% of Hispanics. Let's go back to the previous slide, slide four, please. As you can see here in this map, this map shows huge disparities in internet access across 33,000 zip codes in the United States. This is based on the 2013 to 2017 data, but the pattern should be very similar even with the more recent ACS data um, from the Census Bureau. And as you can see here, that zip codes in dark red have broadband access of less than 62%. And as you can see that these are mostly concentrated in the Southeast, Southwest and Appalachia. Next slide, please, slide six. Thanks. Uh, the rural urban divide in broadband access is quite marked. More than 30% of the rural population lacks access to broadband internet, whereas you have 20% uh, of the urban population that lacks broadband internet access. Uh, you can also see that uh, the ones I think in, let's see here, uh, the small uh, rural towns, there you have over 35% of the people lacking broad broadband access. Let's go to next slide, please, slide seven. As you can see here and in the next two slides, disparities in broadband access are strongly linked to health and social inequalities. 
For example, if you look at life expectancy, compared with uh, communities with low internet access, that is quintile one, have seven years shorter life expectancy than communities with high access, that is quintile five. So you've got life expectancy of 75 years versus 82 years. Communities with low internet access uh, also, are also at increased risk of mortality from various chronic conditions, such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, diabetes, poor health, disability, mental health, mental distress, preventable hospitalization, smoking, obesity, physical inactivity, reduced access to healthcare, lower educational attainment, and higher unemployment and poverty rates. To summarize all of this then, let's, uh, we can skip all of the, um, the slides. I think I already sort of covered all of those. Um, to summarize then, broadband access is an important predictor of population health and healthcare outcomes often independent of other social determinants such as education, income, employment, and race and ethnicity. So closing the social divide in broadband internet access can positively impact individual empowerment, educational attainment, economic growth and opportunity, community development, access to healthcare, and health-related information, and health equity efforts. Thank you, I will stop here, Dr. Gibbons. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh. Next, we'll go to Dr. Jill Egif from the MITRE Corporation. Dr. Egif? Perfect, thank you. Can people hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so first of all, I wanna say it is wonderful to be here today and my neck is exhausted because I think that all I've done for the past three hours is nod vigorously in agreement and in support of what everyone else has been saying. Um, and I'm also worried that at this point, um, there might not be anything new for me to say because I feel like there's been so much great content so far. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a health psychologist by training, and I'm also the managing director of MITRE's Healthcare Delivery and New Opportunities Division um, in the Health FFREC. And I'm part of a team that over the past year has been working to develop a national strategy for digital health. We published our first version of the strategy uh, back in May of 2021, so um, nearly a year ago, and we published it intentionally as a draft document with a draft watermark. We spent a year um, chatting with people about it, gathering feedback, making revisions, and we now have a we have a new version of that uh, national strategy that's actually just being released today. And while I was sitting here just now, I got a note that the new strategy is live on the MITRE site, and so. Once I'm finished with speaking, I'll link everyone to that new version of the strategy. What I'm gonna be talking about today um, is a portion of the national strategy, which is linked to broadband access. So next slide, please. So our strategy is not just focused on broadband access, it's focused on digital health. And we're really talking about the digital health ecosystem which I think has now come up multiple times throughout the day, the way that all of the different parts need to work together um, and the way they don't always work together. We have pieces that are not necessarily integrated with intentionality and planning. And we really want, to, uh, we put together this strategy because we wanted uh, to focus on the ecosystem, how all of these different parts need to work together um, in order to function and in order to achieve the health outcomes that we're looking for. And I should also say up front that I'm not the author of the strategy. Um, I led the team of people who are subject matter experts in various areas. Um, so probably at least 30 people helped, um, helped to pull this together. Um, so this is really reflective of, of some of the, 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 the best thinking that MITRE has to offer in this space. So when we're talking about digital health, we're talking about the convergence of health-related sciences and digital technologies that really under the best circumstances, empower people and populations to manage their health and their well being. And it includes things like mobile health, telehealth, health IT, wearable devices, uh, and personalized medicine. Next slide. 
we put together a national strategy because as has been mentioned innumerable times today, um, COVID-19 really served as a watershed moment for us. And it really just highlighted issues that were already there, it brought them to our attention. And we decided that uh, we needed to put together a framework that would help the nation to identify priorities um, and lay the groundwork for change so that we could move forward um, in a very intentional and planned way. And this national strategy is written uh, for leaders in the digital health community, uh, people in government, care providers, community champions, academe, tech developers, um, for everyone who plays a key role in this digital health ecosystem. Next slide. One more. All right. Um, I am not going to be talking about everything on this slide, so uh, do not worry. Um, let me just quickly share um, the major goals and objective of the national strategy, and then I'm going to focus on the one that's highlighted in yellow here. So the national strategy, um, the vision of it is improved health and well-being of the nation powered by a digital health ecosystem that's functioning well. Um, the goals are to form a connected health ecosystem defined by timely, secure data exchange, empower individuals to take charge of their health and well-being, establish artificial intelligence as a trusted cornerstone of digital health, institutionalize rapid sharing of integrated data for public health, build a workforce skilled in application of digital health, and grow digital equity to achieve health equity. And that's where we're going to be focusing today. Next slide. So underneath of that broad goal to grow digital equity to achieve health equity, we have three main objectives. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about two of them today. So the first objective is to create a new national broadband plan. We wanna ensure community engagement in digital health development and research and improve our measurement, monitoring, research and practice to account for inequities and for varying levels of access. Um, we really need to be able to measure in order to understand um, today's baseline status so that we can properly adjust for future improvements. Next slide. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about this objective that's focused on creating a new national broadband plan. Um, we need a new plan um, that can help us consider the expanding needs and the widening digital health disparities among US communities. Um, as people have noted, um, you know, there's great promise um, in digital health. And for many people during COVID-19, things worked really well. But we can't just continue with today's uh, status quo because we run the very real and serious risk of widening current health disparities if we don't start paying attention to access to virtual care for all. Uh, we want to provide opportunities for all communities to participate in broadband needs assessments and proposed interventions, create accurate mappings of broadband availability and speed, um, include broadband capability as part of a larger plan to develop smart communities, and create a government-wide approach to broadband adoption and affordability that replaces the current approach, which is quite fragmented. Next slide. We also want to improve measurement, measurement, monitoring, research, and practices. Um, if we want to track our progress towards health equity, we need to have continuous capture of indicators so that we can monitor access to digital technology, use of that technology, and the skills of diverse populations. Uh, we want to enhance measurement of successes and failures in digital access and equity, uh, create and apply a systematic approach for assessing equity impacts of digital health interventions, design the right kinds of metrics so that we can enhance measures of digital health, uh, ensure that analysis includes a focus on different populations that have faced unique historical barriers and create appropriately tailored solutions and take steps to minimize bias in AI and the underlying algorithms. Next. And let me just quickly address the need for governance reform. Um, this we sort of saw as a, an objective that underpins the whole uh, digital health ecosystem and, and forms one of the, the baseline requirements uh, for our framework, our proposed uh, national strategy. Um, there are no, um, there is no overarching body to govern the digital health ecosystem, which means that it's very easy for different elements and components of the ecosystem to kind of go off and do their own thing. 
Um, and we think that a governance a governance reform is needed to help bring some cohesiveness. Um, the first thing that we recommend under governance reform is declare digital health a national priority. And that could be one of the first steps that we take towards getting broadband access um, accepted as a, um, a, a social determinant of health. I'm gonna stop talking here and um, save some of my other comments for the panel. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ega. Next, we'll hear from Susan Denser. Susan? Thank you very much, Dr. Gibbons. I'm uh, Susan Denser. I'm the incoming president and chief executive officer of America's Physician Groups. We represent more than 335 physician groups across the country focused on provision of coordinated patient-centered care, integrated care, and accountable for cost and quality. In previous roles, among other things, I was uh, the editor in chief of Health Affairs Journal. And also I led a project funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation several years ago to create this uh, report, Healthcare Without Walls, which really saw the potential that has been discussed many times today, including by Dr. Burwick, to really push care outside of conventional healthcare institutional settings to individuals in their homes and communities. And I just want to brag on our effort by saying, we said back in 2018 that we should start planning for a pandemic and how we would use and adopt rapidly digital health strategies in a pandemic. So, um, it's, uh, it's nice to see that we now consider COVID-19 a watershed uh, in the take up of all of these strategies. Uh, as was said, at this point in any kind of a forum, most of the important things have already been said. However, not everyone has said them yet. So I'll just take a couple of minutes to recap what I thought I heard this morning that I think uh, and, and uh, earlier this afternoon, that really provides a basis for the second set of my comments, which is where do we go from here in this discussion about social determinants of health and broadband uh, access as, as one of those social determinants of health. So what did we hear today? First of all, we heard unequivocally that access to broadband internet is a social determinant of health in itself and it's also embedded in the other social determinants of health. It is itself a highway to health. That's a wonderful phrase that Don Berwick used. Uh, we heard earlier from Karen Onije about the FCC study showing clearly that counties with greater broadband access had lower diabetes prevalence, even after you controlled for various other factors other aspects of the social determinants of health, education and income, for example. And as she said, not only is it clear how often and starkly broadband correlates to these outcomes, all of these others are also linked to broadband access. So we heard that loud and clear. And Gopal Singh's slides, I might add, uh, drove that point home. Uh, think about the map showing uh, nationwide broadband access and the areas of the country uh, that have very low uh, broadband access, how much those completely correlate almost on a one-to-one -one basis to a map of cardiovascular disease prevalence, stroke, obesity, et cetera. All right, so that is a key takeaway. We also heard that broadband access is a critical platform in reinventing the way we provide care. Now we heard a lot today about telehealth and remote patient monitoring. I just wanna to add to the list, how about hospital at home? As a consequence of the pandemic, hospital at home, which is a more than 30 year old strategy, has now been taken up by more than 200 health systems now operating under CMS's Acute Hospital Care at Home program. Uh, think about what Joe Dragas said a few moments ago about his mother battling cancer and couldn't a lot of that battle be undertaken at home. We already know the answer to that from some of the extant cancer hospital at home programs. The answer is yes. So how do we get more of that home-based access to hospital care in the home nationwide. The only way we will do that is with much broader and more reliable broadband connectivity. That is a key feature of any effective hospital at home program. 
So we also heard from Don uh, as he called out uh, Dr. Marmot's uh, wonderful various uh, social determinants of health. I will say Dr. Marmot went through several iterations of this himself. I go back to the one he used in this book in 2006, where he talked not just about five social determinants, but six priority areas the quality of experiences in the early years of life, number one, education and building personal and community resilience, number two, good quality employment and working conditions, number three, having sufficient income to lead a healthy life, number four, uh, healthy environments, number five, and six, priority public health conditions, taking a social determinants approach to tackling smoking, alcohol, and obesity. And once again, if we think about those six domains, we can think about how broadband access infuses all of them, uh, how we can use a project echo type approach, not just as Don Berwick said, to get education out to nursing homes, think about what we could do to extend, for example, uh, diabetes support and obesity reduction programs increasingly into communities via broadband access. So we see this embedded throughout in all of the social terms of health, no matter what we, how we categorize them and how we measure them. All right, so having heard all of this, now what? What do we do if we agree, for example, that HHS and all of its agencies should emphasize broadband as a social determinant of health, either as a standalone uh, SDOH or integrated and embedded into all the other social determinants of health. What is our theory of change? How would this matter if this were to take place? And this I think is very, very important to ask in the US context. Uh, think about a place like the UK, where first of all, you have a national health service that can adopt initiatives and pretty much with, with difficulty uh, effectuate them throughout the system. Or even in the UK where a minister of loneliness was created a few years ago out of the clear recognition that loneliness and social isolation is a, a social determinant of health. We don't operate that way here. We would not create in this country a new department of broadband and a cabinet secretary of broadband. We don't have a national health service. We have a federalist system with responsibilities split up between the federal government and the states and a constant tug of war between those two on matters relative to health. Need I point out what has occurred during the pandemic. So if we ask what is our theory of change in the US context, basically we're saying what would happen if HHS did uh, consider this a social determinant of health? When you think about theories of change, you think about inputs, you think about activities, you think about outputs and outcomes. So what would be part and parcel of this theory of change that would flow from declaring broadband access a social internet of health? What additional inputs would we need into that process? Probably more studies like the ones we've heard about today, more understanding of the correlation and, ca uh, and causation between broadband access and health outcomes across multiple priority health conditions. Um, Activities, next step, what would HHS agencies do differently? Would we have more interagency collaboration around this? Would, hearkening back to uh, Dr. Egas' presentation, would declaring digital health a national priority unify those agencies around a common mission? Uh, Karen Rubin talked about the need for more strategic planning across federal agencies around telehealth more partnership with the states, particularly to address some of the licensure and other issues that we know have been overcome in the pandemic, but probably are gonna be uh, reinstituted as problems post pandemic. So what would those particular activities be is really critical. Outputs, what would occur? 
what key results are desirable from both a policy and an operational perspective. That area requires a lot of thinking. And then finally, outcomes. What outcomes would we expect at the end of this process? Would there be greater efforts to target priority broadband internet installations, say, in counties with the highest area deprivation indexes? Would that be an outcome that we would seek to achieve? Would we ask for a health in all policies approach to implementation of the broadband expansion uh, underway that will we, we hope will be underway under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act? Uh, would we uh, basically, harkening back to what we heard of, from Elizabeth Myers of ONC, would we essentially be targeting more cloud-based solutions and data solutions to create this nationwide mesh that she described to move data across the country. And then beyond infrastructure, to pick up on a point that David Ahern made, let's just not think about infrastructure. Let's think about these other outcomes we would want to achieve around access, around adoption, and use, uh, particularly use. Uh, to what end would we want the uh, Food and Drug Administration to be more actively involved in user-centered dev uh, design issues with respect to digital technologies so that we can make sure that they can be used and taken up by very diverse populations? So as I step back from all of this, I think there is a lot of work left to be done to flesh out this theory of change. Uh, but to my mind, it would be a crucial next step. Uh, and I look forward to engaging uh, with our uh, other members of our panel on discussing how we get to uh, devising that theory of change. And of course, in, an, in the end, taking it up, which would be the most important objective of all. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Dedner. Next, we will hear from uh, Dr. Gretchen Purcell Jackson. Dr. Jackson. Thank you so much. Well, um, Susan, uh, you say there's a lot of work left to be done, but those I think were some really fantastic, pragmatic recommendations um, to inform this dialogue that we're having today. So um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this conversation as a surgeon, a scientist, a healthcare technology executive, and a health informatics leader. I'm a scientific medical officer at Intuitive Surgical, which is a surgical robotics company, and I still practice pediatric surgery part-time at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, where I'm a consumer health informatics researcher. I am also the board chair and president of the American Medical Informatics Association, or AMIA, which is the leading scientific health informatics organization in the United States. AMIA is a professional home to over 5,000 informatics professionals, including clinicians, scientists, educators, trainees, public health experts, and industry professionals. And AMIA and its, its, member, and its members have endorsed access to dependable and affordable broadband as a social determinant of health for many years. So I think the things that I will say today um, will echo what you have heard earlier today. Um, our field, like others, recognizes that populations without access may be unable to participate in or benefit from the emerging care models involving telemedicine and health. Um, and as Susan acknowledged, this notion of home monitoring or care at home and this lack of access, of course, may exacerbate the already significant health disparities. Now, AMIA has provided letters of support and offered input to a variety of the FCC strategies and projects, including initiatives to promote telehealth for low-income consumers and to inform the FCC's approach to accelerating adoption and accessibility of broadband-enabled healthcare solutions. And in these communications, as well as in the scientific and advocacy work that our AMIA community has done, Several themes emerge, and again, I think I'm repeating some of the things that have been said before, um, but several themes emerge that I'd like to share that are relevant to this conversation. Uh, first, access to wide bandwidth data transmission alone isn't enough. This access must be affordable, reliable, and safe, and disparities in any aspects of that access should be treated as a public health issue. 
Uh, second, embracing and addressing access to broadband as a social determinant of health will likely require us to capture and leverage accurate information about this characteristic. And like so many of the social determinants of health, um, this uh, information is not consistently captured or shared across our health information systems. So to do so, we will likely need standards for representation as well as just a commitment to gather this information as part of the healthcare experience in the variety of ways in which that experience takes place. Now, third, access to broadband is not just a rural health issue. Many underserved populations in urban settings only have access to broadband through public or shared devices. And this exposes these already vulnerable populations to increased privacy and security risks, um, as well as other opportunities for exploitation. Um, fourth, as technologies mature and evolve, safe and reliable access to broadband enabled healthcare solutions will likely require new skills um, and knowledge for patients, caregivers, and their providers. And this education to address the Creating these new knowledge and skills will be an important part of what we do going forward. And finally, optimal solutions to these barriers to addressing broadband as a social determinant of health will likely require creative and collaborative engagement of all of the stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem, including providers, payers, corporations, federal, state, and local governments, as well as the patients, caregivers, um, themselves and the organizations in the communities in which they live. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to take part in this conversation today um, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Jackson. Um, and finally, but not least at all, we have uh, Lauren Replinger. Lauren? Thank you, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to join this important conversation today. I'm the Vice President of Policy and Government Affairs for the American Health Information Management Association. And just to provide a little bit of information about our members, um, our folks work with health data for over a billion patients a year. And many of our members work at this intersection of healthcare technology and business and can really be found in data integrity and information and privacy job functions around the world. And so I, I love the way that Susan has framed this theory of change conversation today, because the lens that Hema specifically brings to this conversation is really thinking about what are the steps that need to be taken beyond having broadband identified as a social determinants of health domain to really achieve this end goal of improving health outcomes and equity. So really thinking about uh, this last mile. So um, for example, you know, Gretchen mentioned about the need for uh, standards, right? And so what are the technical standards as well as the terminologies and code sets that we really need to make sure that we're accurately capturing this information? And tied to that is, do we have consensus across healthcare organizations as well as social service organizations that might collect this information as to what broadband as a social determinant of health means? Because when we get to, you know, when the rubber meets the road and we're exchanging this data, we want to make sure that we're being consistent about on both sides as to what that exact actually means. But even taking a step deeper, um, we also think about, again, these operational considerations around accessing this information. Um, who's going to be responsible for collecting this information? Is it the provider? Is it the case manager? Is it someone else within the hospital? Uh, what are the barriers that we see today uh, and in the future around the collection of this information? Uh, we know administrative burden is a huge challenge for providers. So how do we encourage them to document this additional information? Uh, we also know even from a coding perspective, our medical coders, there are coding productivity standards in place that oftentimes discourage them um, to make sure that that information is within and contained in the record. Um, some of my colleagues on this panel also mentioned some of the privacy considerations when we're sharing this information across organizations. I think it's critically important we think about what does the data governance framework look like for that? Uh, and 
I know the last panel talked about this as well. What are the feedback loops in place to make sure that, you know, if a provider documents that connectivity is a challenge for a particular patient and shares that with a social service organization, um, that if that is addressed, that provider knows that so they can focus on other things for that patient. But I also think we need to look at it from a patient perspective. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're encouraging patients to share their social challenges and make sure that providers are being transparent and communicating clearly the purposes for which that information is collected and used. We know today that there are challenges and patients often don't feel comfortable about sharing that personal information. So how do we encourage them to do so and make that connection between the documentation of that particular data and the eventual outcomes for that patient? But of course, also tied to that is we want to make sure that we're protecting against the stigmatization, uh, discrimination, and implicit bias in the use of this information. You know, Jill also mentioned a little bit about workforce education needs. I think we have to acknowledge at the end of the day that uh, we may have to undertake some workforce training in order to make sure that folks in the healthcare community are prepared to collect this information and to do so with cultural humility and sensitivity. So I, I think you know, these are some of the issues that, that AHIMA thinks about and are working on, and we can't forget about them because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we are making the right interventions and helping to uh, track outcomes and ultimately making good policy at the end of the day. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all the panelists for your initial comments here. They're all very, very significant. And we'll try to dive in on some of these ideas and then give the panel or give the audience uh, an opportunity to engage. There were some things that were said that may not be understood by everybody. So I wanted to start by just um, getting out some definitions. And maybe we'll start with uh, Susan. Susan, you talked about um, the hospital at home model. And for those who don't know, it actually is a specific thing. It just doesn't mean taking care of somebody or being cared for at home. Could you talk just a little bit more about what that is to help everybody understand? Sure, <clears throat> absolutely. So hospital at home is a model that actually cre was created initially internationally in other countries. The U.S. version of it is pretty much credited to Dr. Bruce Leff at Johns Hopkins in the 1990s, who uh, essentially discerned that there's a large number of patients who are routinely hospitalized for generally mild, relatively mild, less acute, still acute, but less acute medical conditions. Uh, you can think about pneumonias, for example, exacerbations of heart failure, that a lot of those patients ended up in the hospital when with the right services and supports, you could actually take the hospital, the equivalent of the hospital home to them in their homes with uh, the right uh, schedule of visits from providers, with the right uh, additional equipment, et cetera. And when this approach was tested in a number of places, including at Hopkins, it, it pretty consistently showed superior outcomes uh, to hospital stay for most patients, uh, consistently lower costs, about 20% lower costs, off the chart patient satisfaction, et cetera. And despite these very compelling results, there was almost no take up of this model to speak of across the entirety of the US healthcare system, uh, except in, in, in very specific places until the pandemic. And as we know, uh, CMS uh, in the early days of the pandemic first recognized that there would need to be care provided outside of hospitals. So it adopted an initial approach of, of the hospital without walls, allowing hospitals to push patients with COVID and, and without COVID to hotels, to dormitories, to uh, uh, ambulatory surgery centers, et cetera. So that was phase one. And then in November of 2021, CMS came out with the acute hospital at home program. In about a seven day time frame, CMS did you know, look at the evidence that had accumulated over about 20 years and said, we have to do this. And now, as I say, more than 200 health systems across the country are providing hospital at home under this CMS 
model. Of course, what was most significant is that this provided for payment, standard Medicare hospital payment for uh, eligible patients who are able to be hospitalized at home. It, to have this kind of these kinds of systems work very effectively and truly have the hospital level experience at home, you need broadband internet access. You need 24 seven connectivity to a command center, to a hospitalist who might be in the institutional setting connected say to a nurse. Karen Ruban talked about community paramedicine uh, that UVA is using. That's another a skill set that can be taken into the home, but those community paramedics need to be able to instantly access people in the hospital and say, here's what we've got going on in the home. What should we do? Should, should the patient be escalated back to the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. So if you think about this in an era when it costs close to a million dollars a bed to build a new hospital in, uh, in urban settings of this country, are we gonna to try to build more hospital capacity? Or are we gonna to try to free up existing capacity in individuals' homes for those people who could be cared for at home? Of course, that is the way we should go, but we need broadband as a key element of that platform. Thank you, Susan. That was that was amazing. Uh, just to reiterate, to help the audience understand just how profound of a shift this is. I remember when I my home institution is Johns Hopkins. That's where I, I was on the faculty there for many years. And when I first heard about this model years ago, Hopkins was involved in those early studies that worked with Bruce Leff. And they were, you can imagine this, people would come into the emergency room and under normal circumstances, they should be admitted to the hospital. So physicians would say, yo, no, this person needs to be admitted to the hospital, but they would send them home. They were randomizing. Some would go to the hospital, some would go home. These are patients that every doctor was trained to admit to the hospital. We'd send them home, but then we'd do whatever we needed to do to get the whatever care they needed at home. And as you said, it often involved broadband enabled services. It could involve drones. It could involve any number of things. And as you said, the studies showed at multiple institutions, not just ours, that the care was about the same or better. The costs were lower. Patient satisfaction was higher than providing the same care inside a hospital. So this is the first time in the history of our nation that we thought about care. Fundamentally, the hospital was the place that it happened. But now that's fundamentally changing. And now we even have technology companies who are going after this in a very big way. They've introduced primary uh, virtual first models where there is no hospital conceived of as being important to delivering care. So this represents a very fundamental shift in the way of the healthcare system is thinking about delivering care. It extends to robotics as well. Uh, the technology needs to come up a little bit more before we can fully embrace that. But this is this is significant. Thank you very much. Similarly, let me just go to Dr. Egith. Dr. Egith, you talked about um, the ecosystem, and that's not a term that many people really understand. Could you could you just uh, discuss for a moment what you mean by the ecosystem? Is it just another another term for health systems, or is it something really different? Um, yes, I mean it's just think of all the many different components um, that comprise health, and that, that includes health care, it includes health-related data, it includes the public health infrastructure, it includes the humans, you know, the workforce uh, that we mentioned. Um, it's data interoperability, access to data, um, it's health literacy, it's um, digital literacy, it's all of the different elements that when everything is working well, you know, then, then our health system is working well, um, and not just when they're working well, but working together. Um, so, you know, as you think about any kind of ecosystem, you know, if you think about what's outside your window, um, you know, all of the different elements that need to be, uh, you know, working together um, in order to, to reach the kind of outcomes that we're hoping for, that's the kind of ecosystem that we're talking about. And it is huge, right? I mean, it, it, it is enormous. Um, and that's one of the reasons we put together the strategy because there are just so many different elements um, and no one is an expert in all of them. Um, and, uh, you know, which is why I, you know, caveated some of my comments by saying, I'm not the one who wrote the strategy. One person couldn't write the strategy because the ecosystem is so vast. 
that to have expertise in all of these different elements would just not be possible. Yet all of these elements need to be functioning well and working together in order to reach the kinds of health outcomes that we're hoping for in this country. Does that answer Thank your question? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 that's fantastic. I mean, you're yeah. exactly right. I think the key word for me that I hear from you is two things, really. You're not just talking, again, alluding to what we were just talking about. You're not just talking about systems within a hospital working together no. or within a clinic. You're talking about social services. You're talking about clinical services. You're talking about caregiving services. But then you also said they all work together. Right. That's the key that uh, that defines an ecosystem that the, you have multiple disparate parts that are able to work together. But the question has always been, how do you make that happen, especially when they're not all in the same building? And, right. how, and how can they happen all at the same time? And the answer comes down to one thing, broadband. That's the only way you can do it. Right. right. And I think uh, the pandemic really illustrated how. Um, that there that broadband was really important for other aspects That's of right. health beyond that just formal healthcare That's delivery. Right. For yeah. example, people needed broadband to have access to food ordering services right. or grocery delivery services. And in places that were shut down, this might have been the only way that people could get food. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. We're, we, we've we we've sort of known this as a healthcare system, right? And it's certainly as a public health system, public health uh, people have known this, but the, even the medical care system has known health is about more than just medical services. We've said it, we were taught it, but we didn't live it as a system because it was largely about what we do in hospitals. And that's terribly important. So it's not to downplay that in any way, but but you're right, Dr. Jackson, the, the pandemic blew that wide open. It blew it wide open and and yeah. showed the hole and and so that that takes me to the first question I'll, I'll I'll make it for all of you but so you heard from a number of places and even in the very first talk that uh, Dr Mancuso gave broadband is this this unique kind of thing right it it, it really seems to work on multiple levels. Right. One level is connecting people with things. OK, fine. But there's also some other effects that it has. And then finally, this this gatekeeping function, um, and, you know, can't get to transportation, can't get to food, not only health services. As we go forward with this and there's greater recognition of this and more embracing of this. What are your thoughts on how we keep the gatekeeping function that broadband does have? from becoming a problem and, you know, limiting if people can't get those other things or their health care, it actually increased, uh, 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 decreases health. What are you, any thoughts on that? Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Singh. I don't think I have any, I don't think I could address that. Um, I mean, okay. something, I would defer it to my colleagues here on the panel. Yeah, and this is not to put anybody on the spot. These are just sort of questions. Yeah, anybody else? Anybody at all want to want to hazard a, a comment on that? I'll try my hand at that. But what I'm going to actually share is not necessarily a data driven response, as it That's is fine. experience. Yeah. So um, I am the, the the parent of um, a child who was in third grade last year when third grade was my basement, and. Um, all of the kids in my school district were sent home with, uh, with, with laptops for the very first time, right? Mm, and mm. it was because it was an acknowledgement of, you know, not everyone has computer a computer at home. And I'm thinking, well, great, you know, we did have a computer for my son. Now we have this laptop from school. What about all those other people out there who now that they have this laptop, it's shelfware, they can't use it because they don't have broadband access. What about all of the parents who don't know how to use the laptop or to use the online school technology. It was a lot, um, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. at, at one time. And, you know, the reason I'm mentioning this is because that's education, which is another mm -hmm. huge, you know, issue um, that is frequently considered separately. Mm -hmm. But perhaps for the purposes of this kind of conversation, as we're talking about how to advance the nation, um, it's not just health. It's not just education. Um, it's not just how to order food during the pandemic. You know, it's all of those things. I'm going to become known as the ecosystem person, I think. But it's like all of these things together. Um, and maybe one of the ways that we need to start talking about access to, to access to broadband is not just in relationship to health, but think about the entire universe of things that are now tied 
to broadband access and how mm -hmm. it's really, it is the gateway. I think that's the term you use, not just for health. And if we can bring together all of the different communities, the education community, should they be part of this kind of conversation so that we can think together um, about how we can link arms and make progress together. Fantastic, fantastic. Anybody yeah, else? Jill, want, yeah, sure, Jill, go ahead. I probably would join you as one of the ecosystem people um, thinking very broadly. Um, I would also say that we're in, at a time when technology is evolving very rapidly. So when you speak about that gating function, I think we have to worry about the bar continuing to move. Mm -hmm. You know, that computer that gets sent home with, with the kids, um, all the kids now have a computer, but that's out of date in two years. And do, as, as Jill said, do they have the knowledge and the skills and the confidence to be able to keep their operating system up to date or their security programs up to date so that they're not vulnerable to attacks. So mm -hmm. I think that there, you know, one of the things we will have to consider is as this technology evolves, do, do we have to keep up with um, you know, what, what reliable, what dependable, what adequate um, broad, you know, and of course, private and safe broadband looks like. Very good comment. Absolutely agree with you. You know, it makes me think about the FCC's role, a potential role. And, I, and this is, again, for anybody, but I'll start with you, Dr. Jackson, since you just brought it up in this idea of keeping up. You know, even broadband, the definition of minimum broadband changes. You know, now at one point it was 10-1 uh, up and down, 25-3. Some are talking about going to 100, 100 or even gigabit uh, higher than that. Um, how would do you have any thoughts and suggestions? Should should the FCC or whoever uh, uh, say embrace this at, at a constant speed or, or tier and keep it that way, or should should they build in mechanisms to update and and as as things go higher over time? Any any thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, we are looking at the bigger picture, um, as Susan and Warren and others have said, we really want to look at what does the impact of this access mean for disparities in healthcare. So mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. it is, you know, you must offer 25 megabits per second um, download and, you know, three for uploads, terrific. But does that allow you to do what or to get right. what is state of the art healthcare? or state-of-the-art health support, health enablement, um, as we look at engaged patients going forward, patients and their caregivers. So I think it, it, it really means that. And as you pointed out, you know, what you need to do a video chat um, or you know, perhaps look at a short video for an educational purpose might be very different from the types of things that you need to capture video and telepresence for um, robotic surgery. And mm -hmm. so um, mm -hmm. I think what we need to do in looking at what is adequate or what is enough um, will be dependent on what, what um, capacities um, and tools are available. Very good, thank you. Anybody else wanna add to that? It's a, it's a tough question, how much broadband is enough, but just any thoughts that any of the others of you have on that? Well, so just speak, sorry, go ahead, Susan. well, I was just going to say, just speaking to the notion of, of setting a given standard and then keeping it uh, advancing, right, as the technology improves. Right. I'm not a historian of how the country adopted uh, rural electrification or universal telephone service, but there probably are some lessons there, mm -hmm. right? What, what was the baseline people started with initially and how did that get updated over time? Um, and I, so I would say, let's go back and look at history and see how that was dealt with, number one. Number two, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good here, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's, let's focus, let's get as much broadband access at whatever level we decide today is, is, is a universal minimum requirement. Let's get that installed uh, and build from there because, uh, we we technology is always going to be advancing, right? That just goes without saying, but let's at least get a baseline in. I'm told that even Botswana has a plan to get to universal 
broadband access, right? We we don't actually have that still, despite all we we nobody has stood up and said we will have universal broadband access for every American, right? So we, we at least have to start with that baseline uh, and then work from there. But I think even setting that out as a bold vision, you know, uh, back in uh, the early 2000s, uh, George W. Bush said we were going to have nationwide electronic health records by 2014. It didn't happen, but he said it, right? Mm -hmm, we need mm -hmm. the same kind of presidential level statement about universal access to broadband at the level that we consider adequate today. And then we'll build from there. Fantastic. Anybody else want to add to that before we move on? I'll I think you were just, trying, yeah, go ahead. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, I'll add just very briefly, uh, I'm gonna put my data accuracy hat on here. And I think part of this conversation is also important to think about, do we need to think about subdomains within the broadband access it has itself. Um, mm. So that when we're really capturing this information, it's at the level of granularity that we really need to make those policy decisions. So I'll give an example. Uh, we're members or, or participate in what's called the Gravity Project, right? And this is a consensus building community to expand the availability of social determinants of health data for interoperability. One of the conversations they've been having since the beginning of this year is the topic of health literacy. But what they've come to the conclusion is, is that health literacy can also me means personal health literacy. Mm -hmm. It might mean organizational health literacy. Mm -hmm. And even within those contexts, there is even subdomains, right? So thinking mm -hmm. about digital health literacy and digital access. And so mm -hmm. I think part of this conversation is also thinking about what do we really mean when we're talking about access and are there other pieces that we need to break apart from this? Um, so again, that we're capturing that information correctly. Well, uh, these are great comments. I want to, I want to just keep following with some thoughts, but we got to open it up for uh, the audience. Uh, Sam Rudy, are there some questions from the audience that uh, we'd like to field to our panelists right now? Absolutely. Uh Thanks, everybody. And yes, we do have audience engagement, very robust. Uh, so two questions, at least I want to quickly pose. One is from Maria uh, Pez Carlos. Uh, she's asking a question about any thoughts on the implementation of sustainability or quality improvements on broadband access. So that's one question. And I think I'll go ahead and share the other question. Are clinicians embracing the transformation of the healthcare model? that include telehealth, digital health innovation, while understanding the social determinants of health? If not, how do we get them to embrace things change? And that question comes to us from Mr. Adam Gibbs. Thank you. And the first one, one more time, Sarah Ruby, that's uh, sustainability. What, what, could you just repeat that one more time? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, so any thoughts on the implementation of sustainability or quality improvements on broadband access. And I want to invite the panelists, uh, if one of you can uh, address that quickly, and then we can turn to the next question. Thank you. Panelists, anybody want to take a shot at that one? <laughs> well. Uh... I think as Jill has suggested the you know, sustainable solutions will be one that that engage all parts of the ecosystem. And again, that uh oh, have we lost Dr. Jackson? Green, I think she's gone now. Any anybody want to add to that? I, I guess I would just go back to let 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 let's get let's get it in place first. You know, I think we have to rely on um, some of the things that we have going on for us in this country that are still positive forces. We've got competition in the private sector. We've got consumer demand and consumer expectations rising. I think we've got some forces in play that can improve broadband access over time. The ones we have to worry about, obviously, are the places where the private sector has been less inclined to invest. That's why what the FCC has done around launch and other uh, pilots has been so important, which is creating more of the business case now for these kinds of investments. Uh, but so making sure that the whole of the ecosystem is engaged, as Dr. Jackson said, uh, but that we're harnessing these forces of public dollars, public investment and private investment to push this forward. I, I, I think, I, I, maybe I'm naive, but I think good things will happen. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great. Uh, since we're running out of time, what about the second question? I think the second question was, uh, do, do the panelists think that uh, the provider communities are really embracing uh, this? And if not, uh, the, the notion of change with a ser- social determinants of health lens? And if not, what can we do? Any thoughts on that? Anybody? I'm happy to chime in. I, I think they are. Um, I do think that there's a challenge we have to contend with, and that is Right now, there's a lot of social determinants of health that are being talked about out there. And so there's this question coming from the provider community of, I have a finite amount of time with my patient. What are the questions I need to ask about and what do I prioritize and what do I document in the record itself? And so I think if we want to have this data increasingly collected, we need to make sure that we have the incentives in place so that providers are inclined to capture that information. And I think tied to that is also making sure we are continuing to present the evidence that shows that linkage between broadband connectivity and improved outcomes and improved health equity. Yeah, no, that was great. Lauren, you were the one that brought up the, the need for, you know, defining broadband as a social return. I was going to ask you about that, but we ran out of time. So I appreciate that answer. It's, I think it's a great answer. Um, anybody else want to add to that? Any other thoughts? Sam Rudy, do we have time for another question from the audience or no? Thanks, Chris. But uh... I think I'm afraid we don't okay. have time, additional time, and I want okay. to invite Ben to uh, announce the next panel. Ben? Great. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Gibbons, for moderating and for our, our uh, outstanding and impressive panelists for sharing your perspectives and for participating in the great discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, we now turn to our fourth panel segment titled Looking Ahead, Implications of Broadband Connectivity as a Social Determinant of Health Domain on government policies, clinical care, and health equity. This panel discussion will be moderated by the president of the Commonwealth Fund and former national coordinator for health information technology, Dr. David Blumenthal. Dr. Blumenthal, uh, please proceed. Dr. Blumenthal, if you can unmute, please. Hey, a Zoom hazard. <laughs> um, so, uh, these are uh, our panelists. We have a really packed agenda. Uh, I'm not going to talk about myself. What I'm going to do is uh, introduce our uh, first speaker. Uh, and after that, uh, the speakers know the order in which they are to enter the conversation. And I will leave to them to introduce themselves. I gather from uh, listening into the previous conversation that the concept of broadband as a social determinant has surfaced and been discussed at some length. And the focus of this panel is more on uh, what the implications of that determination are and what we can do to expand the availability of broadband. We're gonna start with uh, John Horrigan. Uh, John. Thank you very much, uh, David. And I was gonna show a couple of data point slides and if we can get those up and go right to the next one, we can get started. Um, I wanna make a couple basic points about broadband and healthcare disparities. Disparities. We know that healthcare outcomes are often a function of where people live and how much money they make. The same is true for having a home wireline broadband subscription. Why do I focus on wireline? Because it's a far better means of connecting for applications such as telehealth than data cap limited uh, cellular data plans, which is something that many low income households rely upon only for their internet service. And you can see from this slide that uh, just under half of those in poverty have wireline broadband subscriptions, um, much lower than middle and upper income households in the United States. And it's also the case that uh, the pandemic was very impactful on low income households. They struggled to maintain connectivity with close to 20% having lost service during the pandemic. Now the emergency broadband benefit helped. Um, the data show that um, about one in 10 uh, low income households are connected due to a discount program. But data also shows that notwithstanding 
uh, those figures, that lots more has to be done to get the word out about um, EBB's successor program, the American Connectivity Plan. Next slide, please. The other part of the story um, in the next slide is the place and race element. Um, these are just some data points collected on cities in the United States, and it shows that cities with high poverty rates have lower broadband adoption rates than cities with less severe poverty problems. And residential segregation also matters. Places with this historical legacy, like Baltimore, where I live, have lower broadband rates than cities with less pronounced histories of residential segregation. In some very poor neighborhoods, which have historically been redlined in Baltimore, I estimate that only one in four households have service at home. So to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about what we know about solutions. Um, first, it's the case that healthcare can be a motivator um, for getting online, um, but it's important to invest in messaging from trusted local institutions in order to get the ball rolling to get um, people without broadband with broadband at home. It's also the case that digital skills training can be a force multiplier in that um, those who have had digital skills training, training are more likely to use the internet for healthcare information. Um, the big elephants in the room that work against uh, some of these uh, adoption patterns is trust. Trust is a big hurdle for low income populations when it comes to uh, getting broadband at home. Sometimes low income households think discount offers are too good to be true. Others think that if you get internet at home, then business and government is gonna be tracking their personal information. Um, at the same time, an important model to think about in giving people the help they need to get online is the digital navigators model. You talk to practitioners in this space and they always say that getting people online is a boots on the ground challenge. You need to hire people from the community to communicate with those in communities with low broadband adoption rates. And that's a very good technique going forward to consider on how to close the broadband adoption again gap, particularly in light of significant amount of funds having been appropriated for digital skills. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over, I think, to Joshua Edmonds, who's next. So I will conclude. Thank you. Uh, uh, Joshua, please remember to introduce yourself. Yep. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm Joshua Edmonds. I'm the Director of Digital Inclusion for the City of Detroit. And I also have the pleasure of serving on the uh, federal or FCC's Intergovernmental Advisory Committee. Specifically, uh, my job is to um, uh, lead the telehealth uh, work group. Uh, but one of the things I want to highlight today, um, you know, I have three points, but one of them is really on the role of municipalities. You know, as I mentioned, the Director of Digital Inclusion, I started that role in January of 2019. Uh, so for those folks who are keeping score, you realize that that is before the pandemic. And uh, I, I think at that time, you know, a lot of the word was just, uh, a lot of the work was just getting the word out about, hey, there's a digital divide. Uh, you know, municipalities, specifically urban municipalities like, like Detroit, um, you know, we didn't really receive robust federal funding. There wasn't ARPA funding. There wasn't infrastructure bill funding. And um, quite frankly, when the pandemic did hit, you know, a lot of the, the, the groundwork that, you know, John had mentioned in his uh, presentation about building trust, we were able to do that. You know, but as we looked at some of the effects that COVID-19 had on uh, Detroit specifically, uh, you know, it, it ransacked our community. Um, and so much so that the state had created a racial disparities task force on COVID-19. And off of that, we were able to do a uh, telehealth activation called Connecting Seniors. That program allowed us to, um, essentially connect 8,000 seniors and their caregivers in the Detroit region um, with uh, devices, uh, technical support, as well as a telehealth application that was developed uh, in partnership with Wayne State University, Accenture, and Microsoft. And the reason why I'm highlighting this effort is specifically for those municipalities that do not have the telehealth capacity. As you're looking at the infrastructure bill funding, as you're looking at some of the ARPA funding, uh, you might say, well, that, that could be some funding to help us stand up something. And for us, you know, 
whether we stand up a you know municipal telehealth effort, I think that there is a specific call to municipalities um, and being able to facilitate telehealth outside of our walls. Um, you know, these are still our residents, and quite frankly, our role in that endeavor was um, you know being a supporter, a, facilit- a facilitator, and an amplifier. You know, we are able to say to the state that telehealth at the intersection of the digital divide is a priority for us, and I would you know. Uh, implore other other communities to do the same, uh, especially with some of this funding that's going to states. But at the same time, you know, some of those core partners in that uh, arrangement, one was Focus Hope. Focus Hope is a nonprofit here. Uh, you know, they've been around for um, uh, close to 50 years now. And their role there, they already were running a food delivery program throughout the city of Detroit that seniors were already relying on. And so for us, we didn't want to start at zero, we wanted to look at existing momentum and then be able to support people accordingly. In addition to that, we worked with a technology refurbisher by the name of Human IT. These people are used to getting devices out to people who need them. They're also used to providing technical support. Again, we're not starting at zero here. And so for us, we looked at the pieces and parts in the room and we said, all right, well, who else is missing? Well, the university. We know that universities will play a critical role not only advancing dialogue here, but in some cases, even providing that telehealth support to residents. And so that's something where we were able to highlight that. So my very first point is really looking at the municipalities, specifically those who might not have telehealth operational functions. We can still be effective in this arena. We absolutely do need to be present in these conversations. In addition to that, my my role in the um, Intergovernmental Advisory Committee, uh, we are going to be releasing the uh, 2022 telehealth report. We're very excited about that. It's a very nuanced report. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna highlight that now. Um, the way that we're doing this is in more of a, a matrix style. And what I mean by that, as we have about 19 different government offices represented, some tribal, some county, some municipal, some state, our whole role is to make recommendations, obviously to, to the, um, the commission, specifically on expanding telehealth access. We're doing everything from looking at software and interoperability and language access, all the way down to just basic digital literacy recommendations to the to the commission. And so I, I think that in, in that role, we'd like to be able to highlight and say that report is coming. We do want to have that released this year. And the level of nuance um, that we're using there, we do want to actually spur a, a larger and broader discussion around telehealth. I was looking at some of the other panels today where they said, we don't have a plan specific to getting broadband to every single American. And I think that that is something where um, telehealth absolutely needs to be a part of that discussion. And I believe that the uh, report that we're going to be releasing this year will absolutely allow us to accomplish that objective. Um, I, I, you know, I don't have much more else to say beyond that and look forward to what other speakers have to say. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Joshua. Perfect timing. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mikkel Moore from the Intermountain Healthcare System uh, in Utah. Thank you, David. <clears throat> so Inter- I'm Mikkel Moore, Chief Community Health Officer for Intermountain Healthcare. Intermountain is an integrated system serving an eight-state region from Canada to Mexico borders, essentially, in the Intermountain West. And about 50% of the care we deliver is provided in value-based arrangements, meaning we're prepaid for those, allows us to think about whole person health. And that really has driven the way we think about broadband access um, in the context of telehealth capability, but also uh, the way it enables access to addressing people's social needs and the determinants of their needs overall, education, job access, et cetera. We're also in a fairly, uh, in a part of the country that has a lot of rural communities. And as I reflect on um, some of the data points that were outlined in the beginning, I just wanna call out that in rural communities, access to broadband, whether people can afford to pay for a subscription or not, um, having access to broadband is a really significant issue. About one fourth of rural residents in our country don't even have the option to purchase broadband. And so when we think about this in the context of care delivery in the work we're doing, as well as addressing social determinants, it's a very real issue. 
We've done lots of similar things to those I heard discussed in the previous panel in terms of facilitating access to care close to home using telehealth. The pandemic has helped us to do that. Um, and we've built out a lot of capability in rural hospitals, uh, rural community clinics, and in schools across our service area to improve connectivity for healthcare <laughs> services specifically. But even as we've been doing this, we've been screening our patients and members and community members for social needs. Um, we fund community health workers through community-based organizations that uh, during the pandemic were able to reach out to people who were high risk and assess their needs. And interestingly, about 30% of people uh, are indicating that they have utility and broadband needs. Um, even while community health workers are, were initially focused on um, things that were more seemingly higher in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And that's, of course, because broadband is so critical to connecting with others, um, getting access to food, applying for a job, going to school and doing a job often. And so, um, you know, when I think about this as, you know, what can we do? What's the go forward on this, David? I see a call to action first for policymakers. We know policy level interventions have the greatest ability to help the most people. We should think of broadband as a utility just like power. We need to have universal access and availability and the assistance programs that are available to those who um, are unable to afford to have assistance in getting access to broadband universally and, and facilitated in that access. For health systems, we need to do our part in shifting to value so that we are always incentivized to think about whole person health and helping connect people to the resources that are needed to get uh, access to work, education, et cetera. And, um, and we need to screen for connectivity as a part of our social needs screening. To civic leaders um, like, like Josh Edmonds here, I think we really need to be thinking about ways to enhance broadband access outside of traditional spaces. Parks, libraries, um, schools, churches have become good extension points for us in setting up hotspots where broadband access wasn't available. And then uh, finally, I'll, I'll close with that same reiteration. Let's make sure we keep an eye on our rural communities. They're often left behind as we make these kinds of improvements across our country. And the needs are significant and specific. Thank you, David. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you guys have been terrific in keeping on time. And we're going to have lots of time for interaction if, if we can keep this going. So our next speaker is Jorge Rodriguez uh, from the... Uh, uh, Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston. Oh, hey, uh, oh, my, can you guys hear me? Okay, I think my okay, great. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much for having me. I said I'm, I'm from Brigham Women's Hospital, and Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts, and I I'd like to actually share a story a little bit. Um, one of our digital health navigators working with a couple of patients, and so one patient came in. The digital health navigator showed them how to use a patient portal and telehealth, and the patient was really like wow, this is like the best thing that's ever happened to me. I didn't know this was such a, such a great tool. That's one person. The other person, one of the initial questions we asked them, like, how do you do with email? Do you have email? That person said, I don't have email. I'm perfectly living my life without email. So that sort of brought up a couple of points for me. For, for the first patient, I was like, how can we get more of that reaction? How can we get more of that sort of excitement for using digital tools for health? And I think it really brought up the question of like sustainability. And I know we've really highlighted a key component of that being funding, but how do we then serve as, you know, just like others have said, as a healthcare system, as one touch point to kind of create a larger spectrum across the uh, social determinants of health. The other component that came to mind is that I had just captured important information about this patient and about this community. And as a healthcare system, and I think in all of our different kind of silos, whether it's in the community or in education, we all capture some, to some extent, the same data. Do you have access to the internet? Do you have access to the computer? And I think there has to be more of an important role to share, share that data across the community to be able to then go to the FCC or to internet service providers and say, here's the data that our community is facing here, the challenges they're facing from all the different perspectives. And we may run across things that have already been mentioned, like red digital redlining, that as a united force across the community, we can then go to the healthcare, to the uh, internet service providers and say, like, here's something that we need to address. The other thing it made me think about was all around sort of the role of insurers, or a lot of this we're sort of taking on, a lot of healthcare systems are 
finding funds from here and there and trying and they're like secret, you know, funding areas that they're getting out of those kind of systems are not sustainable. And do, do insurers have to, should there be a role? Should they be on this panel with us to have that discussion around the role of broadband um, going forward? Um, and then the, the last two points here around uh, were around one sort of the role of um, uh, EH car vendors. One of the things I noticed with this patient is they really struggled to use this, you know, to use this tool do they do we need to have EHR vendors as sort of also active participants and active discussions as part of this to say, are you know, as we talk about, you know, broadband on on the patient side, what about the kind of the needs that they have on the technical side? Um, the other the when you think about the other patient that I had, which didn't 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 like the the uh, technology as much, it really highlighted for me the importance of like multimodal care and realizing that for some patients, broadband and technology and everything may not be the right investment to make. Right. And in the long run, a lot of our goal here is not so much digital inclusion, which I think it's important, but for us, it's like health equity. That's ultimately as a clinician, what I care about. So for some reason, all of my patients have access to all the technology in the world and their diabetes outcomes are not great. Maybe that was the wrong investment to make. So just make taking account into, and taking that into account. Um, and the last the last point I'll, uh, I'll make um, is all around um the role of, of bias. Uh, there's been a, a couple a couple of studies that I've seen that shown that some patients aren't even offered the patient portal or the telehealth just based on certain demographics. And so just checking our own biases at the door and realizing that you, you can't really tell a patient's likelihood of using broadband or using telehealth or patient portal just by, by looking at them and having a, an important conversation with patients. Like this is a tool that we may use. Does this fit for you? I think is another key component to making sure that we can make this sort of a, a sustainable solution. So uh, thank you so much. That's terrific. So um, moving right along, our next speaker is Bill England, who's from our federal government, uh, the Health and Hum the Health Resources uh, Administration. Uh, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, what his office does. Uh, thank you very much. And um, um, by way of background, I started in telehealth 25 years ago at, uh, at CMS, uh, launching the Medicare telemedicine demonstration, then moved to the FCC's Universal Service Rural Health Program uh, before coming to HRSA. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so just uh, in an earlier panel, um, ASPE gave an excellent presentation of HRSA's mission to ensure equitable health uh, service delivery to a broad segment of America with a focus on underserved and vulnerable populations. Um, this slide shows some of those populations. Uh, because that is our mission, HRSA long ago recognized that telehealth was a critical tool in, uh, in our service delivery. In quick overview, the vulnerable populations we serve, health centers care for one in 11 Americans, almost 30 million people, uh, we operate the primary federal program dealing with uh, people with HIV AIDS, the Ryan White program. We're involved in serving and improving outcomes for nearly, nearly 60 million uh, pregnant um, women and children through the uh, 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 Child Services Bureau, Women and Child Services Bureau. And we operate a loan forgiveness program for 23,000 clinicians that have agreed to serve underserved populations. And that program has been long in encouraging the use of telehealth. Our awards um, um, universally allow and encourage uh, grantees to use telehealth. And most of our programs are run through grant programs. Um, last week, or actually two weeks ago, we awarded 29 innovative uh, virtual health grants to foster creative use of telehealth, connected devices, artificial intelligence, and other digital tools for health centers to experiment and transform service delivery models. So next, next slide. Uh, just very quickly, the history of our office. Again, we've been doing telehealth for a long time. Our first telehealth grants were in 1988. We established uh, the office I'm uh, now in, the Office of Advancement of Telehealth in 2002. And in 2017, we recognized that telehealth was all over the place in HRSA and we conducted our first inventory finding over a thousand of our grants mentioned telehealth. That's now expanded to um, nearly 4,000. Um, next slide. And this just shows uh, where those uh, grants are located. Uh, Bureau of Primary Healthcare, which again is health centers, have the majority. 
And uh, the, the little yellow slice is actually the office that I'm in, along with the Office of Rural Health, uh, where telehealth started, but we are not by far the lion's share of the telehealth going on in HRSA. It's everywhere. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a quick break in, again, looking at our grants, where telehealth is occurring, uh, workforce training being the, the most prominent in clinical services, uh, distance learning, uh, we, we have both distance learning formal, formally, formerly uh, echo services, as well as non-echo-like uh, activities and clinician support. In terms of clinical areas, behavioral health, uh, substance abuse, opioid abuse are the, by far, primary uses, primary care, COVID-19, although I will say these are, we don't have our results yet from the 2021 year, so I expect COVID-19 may emerge as the most prominent use. Um, next slide. Um, and lastly, I'd, I'd like to focus on our office, the Office of Advancement of Telehealth. We serve across uh, HHS to promote telehealth as in our title, we really have two roles. One is to fund grants with our grant making authority to pr promote, deliver and research telehealth. And the other is to serve as an information and assistance clearinghouse. Um, we fund um, dozens of telehealth networks, two telehealth research centers, two centers of excellence. And perhaps the best known program is the Telehealth Resource Center. Uh, Dr. Ruban, who spoke earlier, um, oversees one of those at the University of Virginia. These centers are essentially telehealth consultants available at no cost to providers or anyone uh, wanting to uh, start or run a telehealth program. So I invite everyone to take advantage of those experts that we are funding. Um, as a result of the pandemic, uh, we suddenly became interested in the direct to consumer telehealth, which was new to us largely because of pandemic waivers that first allowed for reimbursement of direct to consumer telehealth. And that then brought us into how well are consumers connected. And, and just as a, a tip of the hat to the FCC, the Universal Service Rural Health Program had done a pretty good job of connecting bricks and mortar facilities in rural areas. And we, we frankly weren't looking carefully at how well consumers were connecting because that wasn't reimbursable. So we weren't trying to reach them directly. Now we are. So we did launch a new telehealth broadband pilot project, which is allowing us to first begin to look at consumer and provider direct connections in communities to see how well things are working. Um, lastly, um, in our role connecting dots for people on telehealth, we opened a new website, telehealthhhs.gov, shortly after the start of the pandemic, realizing there was no single federal spot for information on telehealth. This is for providers, patients, uh, researchers, anyone to learn about telehealth. Our website is growing fast. And again, I say our, it's a federal website uh, housed in HHS. I would invite anyone to use the site and especially for our federal partners as you have programs, please reach out to us. We'd love to link to your telehealth programs or um, do whatever we can to, to link people to uh, the assets that you offer. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this. I'm learning a lot about what some of our other federal and private partners are doing. Thank you very much. Uh, our, our speakers have been so uh, precise and uh, focused that we are gonna have time for questions from the audience at the end. So I hope you'll be thinking about those questions as you hear our last speaker who is Adi Tomer from who's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, Addy. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Adi Tomer. I work at the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Policy Program, where we've been studying broadband for quite some years. Um, and um, I want to kind of focus on on two elements. I think hopefully we'll add to the conversation that again the FCC has been so gracious to bring us all together about today. Um, the first one is how can we make sure that we, our healthcare industry broadly, is focusing on some of the upstream benefits, you could argue, that broadband offers. Um, we're hearing a lot already today, including on this panel, some amazing work happening in telehealth and other community benefits. Um, but we also know that broadband provides immense um, benefits to other elements around, in particular, two categories of social determinants of health that lead to stronger outcomes in our community broadly, not just in our kind of health related fields explicitly. So um, the first one of those is economic stability. 
we know that labor markets work better with a broadband connection, leading to higher incomes and employment levels. We know that industries grow faster, attracting greater wealth building to regions. Now, if we switch to the social and community context, we know that broadband offers leisure opportunities, while social relationships are often strengthened through digital services. Finally, governments are able to operate more efficiently, saving money for their constituents and leaving more resources for other essential services. Now, obviously on this panel, we didn't talk about education today, um, but I think it's pretty obvious during the pandemic how much we've learned both good and bad about how broadband and education intersect and what that can mean again for social determinants of health. Uh, when I'm done talking, because I cannot do two things at once, I will post a link uh, to an academic resource we did with our colleagues at the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, uh, which was actually made possible by the generous support of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, that includes a ream of academic research focused on social determinants of health that I think could be a great reference for all of you. So again, moving forward, I think focusing on how can you work in communities for those upstream related benefits that we know can deliver stronger health outcomes. The second quick point I wanna make is that based on how can we think about place-based community health policies? And I wanna give you a specific example here. Um, our team at Brookings is actually getting set to release some new research where we've been able to map at the neighborhood scale where digital food delivery services are effectively delivering food or where their service um, uh, maps are. The data is overwhelming on this, but there's a key stat for this audience today. 90% of residents of quote unquote food deserts in the United States receive at least or have available to them at least one digital food delivery service, right? So you can think of these by names. This is, this is Amazon Fresh, this is Walmart, Uber Eats, et cetera, right? Think about that. 90% of people who we traditionally think in analog terms have an inability to access food and how that can of course impact food security. We actually have a lifeline now through digital food services. But of course, this raises different issues. And we know that some of the same barriers to physical food access, brick and mortar, these quote unquote food deserts, are the same features or conditions that tend to lead to the digital divide, whether that's in network maps or actual inability to afford services. So this is a remaking concept for folks who work in this area. If you're at the nexus of food security, public health, and broadband, how can we make sure that we can tap these transformative and innovative technologies uh, to deliver better results? Again, the theme here, how can we deliver place-based policies that improve our neighborhood level conditions, that improve public health outcomes, and again, ideally lead to a more prosperous future for all? So again, thank you for the opportunity and looking forward to questions. That's terrific. So um, do any of the panelists have questions for one another? based on what they've heard. If not, I will jump in uh, with a couple of questions. I have one, David. Sure. Okay. And, and I, I guess this is probably for Josh and for uh, Eddie. Um, when you think about place-based investments in broadband, how much can be facilitated at the municipal city level? And what gets, you know, or, or do things get in the way from a federal level? Is this a local issue or is this a national federal issue? Well, I, you know, I, I'm going to be definitely biased here and say it's a local issue. I think that it actually is our job um, in the local ecosystem, at least now, to actually have a much more facilitative conversation around broadband, what that means for us. I know that we, the city of Detroit, are going to be releasing a uh, broadband master plan in very short order within the next few weeks or so, because again, I think that's just our responsibility. I think that out of all of these challenges we're seeing on the broadband front, as we're looking at telehealth, workforce, education, whatever other you know sector we want to throw out there, at some point we have to stop saying like, oh, you know, what was us and really say, no, this is our responsibility. And, you know, as there's funding that's being allocated, we have now set up, you know, the strategy moving forward that when those dollars, you know, reach the municipality, people are now informed of exactly what we're buying and exactly why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, I would just quickly add, and John probably has thoughts here too, with, with this incredible research over the years. Um, the, for those of us working in Washington or focused on the federal government, it always feels like, oh, well, they, they can invest more. They can solve all these problems at once. But I always default to infrastructure is solved at a local level. I mean, and it is you want to plan for it at a local level because conditions are always different. 
you've got to think about capital flows to invest in it. And of course, broadband gets really complicated because it's privately owned, but we want public kind of outcomes, if you will. Um, and then, and then how, what are the relationships with the states, which tend to actually be the big players here? So um, we've got an exciting moment ahead of us as everyone who's probably attending today is well aware. We're investing right north of $60 billion in broadband, everything from boosting the affordability program, 42.5 billion that's gonna drop on states to build out networks. But we're gonna, the value of those decisions is gonna be decided locally on what our ROI is um, and how it kind of changes what the future looks like to, I think you said it really well, Mikhail, like this is, uh, <laughs> calling a utility is actually a, a loaded term as folks at the FCC know, but um, no, I'm glad you did for what it's worth. Uh, but what I think we can all safely say, this is essential infrastructure. This is no different than our great, great grandparents being like, you can imagine them proverbially sitting around like a fire of like, is electricity gonna, is that like a future thing? And it's, you know, obviously yes, right? That's where broadband is right now, but we've got well north of 10, if not 15% of households are, are disconnected for ACS data. And I mean, that's if that was our electricity or, or safe drinking water rates, we would, it would become immediately our number one priority as a country, honestly, for domestic policy. And we need to treat broadband as similar. But John, you might have stuff to add too, and I wanna put you on the spot. Just one obser observation I'll make is the role of planning. The infrastructure bill sets aside $65 billion for broadband, 42 billion is infrastructure, 14 billion for connectivity for those who can't afford broadband. It also requires states to do broadband plans and to do digital equity planning. And my suggestion for people attending today is get healthcare systems involved in this process. Um, that will contribute to closing these gaps and close, closing it in a coordinated way. So um, you're making not just a dent on broadband uh, subscriptions, which is a means to an end, but having your voice heard and the, the objective of broadband, which is in this context, uh, better healthcare outcomes. So um, the conversation about uh, money and uh, infrastructure leads me to ask a question implied by John's presentation about trust. And the question I have is whether trust is, or lack of trust, distrust is uh, equitably distributed or whether it's concentrated. Because if, if we provide access, but, no, but people don't want it, that's not gonna be sufficient to overcome the digital divide. Any thoughts from our panelists about that? <clears throat> I mean, I will quickly say that it is definitely very prevalent in low income populations and among those le least likely to have any digital resources. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm kind of wondering whether Joshua has a perspective given his um, experience in the city of Detroit on this. Yeah, you know, right, I, no, no, you're, you're you're spot on, and and yeah, like there's there's definitely like so, and I, I think that's like um, deconstruct trust as much as we can, um, given the time. So when we're saying trust, uh, it's not necessarily like walking across a bridge and trusting if that plank is going to break. It's not that. It's more so trust from the standpoint of there's been so many promises that have been made by so many other people that by the time you make this promise to do whatever to me, what's the point if everyone else has let me down? And I think that when you couple that with people having to enroll in programs that constantly have to, you know, make someone prove how poor they are and constantly have to showcase why, for example, um, I need to enroll in this service and this provider, for example, ruined my credit. There are things like that, that, like when we are now trying to build these relationships with people or advocate on behalf of people, that that's where like this trust barrier starts to really manifest. And so I think that, you know, to the extent of when people are throwing out the terms um, equity, it's like, okay, you know, to be very clear, when we're doing that type of work or we want to look at health equity at the intersection of digital equity, there really needs to be that historic lens at which we view things and say, does your offer counterbalance people's historic experience? And if it doesn't, then that's not really necessarily trust in the way that you know people are perceiving it to be, but in reality, it's going to be more so a historic perpetual state of people being let down. And quite frankly, the wrong that we're getting or giving them 
with respect to maybe an internet subsidy isn't really enough to justify someone wanting to climb out of wherever they are. And so I think that that's where really what we're seeing as a reality where we are in Detroit. I know that a lot of other, you know, uh, cities that and, and you know, locations that John is referring to with the data that justifies that, that, that experience as well. So obviously you overcame that to some degree in your uh, program in Detroit, maybe, maybe not. I think we're committed to overcoming it in perpetuity. And as you know, it rears its head once more, um, you know, we have a response to it. And I think that that's really what we want to have in Detroit. And you know, I would say that should be the North Star for a lot of people is building, you know, responsive ecosystems that, um, you know, are, are really rooted in justice involved work. And so like, if we're being responsive to the needs that we're seeing, that's not to say that we're going to get to, you know, now we're at zero needs. No. But as there's needs, we have solutions that are really rooted in rectifying scenarios. And um, Mikkel, just uh, to contrast Detroit with rural, the rural West, is this an issue for the members and patients of Intermountain Healthcare? It, it certainly is. You know, we talk about trust actually as. Um, something, is it transactional or is it something that builds over time? Do I have a relationship with you for a moment to accomplish something specific or do you care about my well-being over the course of time? And this is a, a an example of that. I think we've got to figure out how to build, um, you know, we learned that community health workers who are from community are the most trusted resource for getting people online, whether it's getting them online or helping them with other assistance or assistance through a church or something known as opposed to someone who's got a transactional something to accomplish like a telehealth visit. Um, that's not going to be a longstanding relationship. So these have to be, um, this work has to be accomplished through those trusting built relationships. And here, here we thought the problem was technology and it turns out to be humans. Yep. Amazing how that happens. Um, I have a question about the two folks who represent Mikkel and Jorge, who work or in and around uh, healthcare systems. And that has to do with the role of our mostly private providers of healthcare services in this broadband connectivity uh, domain. And I guess uh, one might argue that the to the extent that this is a matter of infrastructure, that is just laying the cable right up to the, through the last mile, through the last 10 yards, that's not something that we expect health systems to do. Uh, but maybe we're, there's something else that health systems can do and take the initiative to do. So I'd be interested in your, your thoughts about those things. I'm happy to, happy to start. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that always goes back to my thought around like sustainability. I think, you know, in, in intra, intra pandemic as, as we are, you know, there's been a lot of big push for like healthcare system providing internet and devices and all these things. But in reality, that that's not a sustainable model. And I think in building off of that trust piece, it's tough to say, I'm going to provide you for a device, but it's only going to be for X amount of time, because it's related to like, some healthcare outcome that I care about. And that, again, sort of doesn't build a great trust with with a with a patient. And so I think when it comes to sort of building this out, the healthcare system really becomes a, a point where we can engage with folks like Josh and others on the call to say, you know, can we connect you to the affordable connectivity program? Is that sort of the uh, initial touch point and then connect you there and then create a more longitudinal approach. And I think as we've seen with some of John's data, that hasn't necessarily been the case because the, the uptake hasn't been as robust. And so I think as a healthcare system, we can really serve as a point where you know, to, to leverage and use that relationships that we build up with patients, they they we they put in their hands like their lives to some extent, and so we can really use that to say like this technology will help us to achieve that goal of health. And so, how can we connect you with community organizations and community tools to be able to get you there and create more of a sustainable model? So that's often what I think about, sort of like creating something that's sustainable that moves into the community rather than just like here's a device I'm giving you for six months and then please give me the device back because your hypertension is better. So in, in that sense, it becomes part of the general conversation about social determinants of health and how we supply those or, or overcome obstacles to healthcare that are written into our social services and our 
the res general resources available to people, housing, food, transportation, income, education, all those things that so impact the daily work of healthcare providers. Um, you know, I would add, David, in a little different dimension, I think health systems also have a role, providers, whether it's a, a rural hospital or, um, or independent provider or a health system, have a, a role in their community to speak up on the importance of connectivity um, in advocating for the growth of their own services, but also advocating for the importance of it in helping address these determinants of health to begin with. So, you know, we might need broadband connectivity um, that last mile to provide services ourselves, whether it's offering telehealth support to a, an, a physician in an outlying community for ECHO or other access. Um, and we can advocate then for that community to get that access that's available then for schools um, and, and communities and so on. So I think our voice as um, anchor community members is really important. Great. Um, Dr. England, uh, you are representing uh, a very important agency in the federal government from this standpoint. You have, you can point to a ton of programs that you and your colleagues have initiated and are running. Uh, since I've been a federal official, I know that uh, whenever I was asked about something, I could always point to 10 things we were already doing, uh, but the problems never seem to go away. So as you sit where you sit and say, if only, if only I had, or we had these additional ideas, and I, know, I don't wanna get you fired, so I know you're gonna, you're gonna to have to be circumspect with this, but what is it that occurs to you that you don't have already? Because you clearly have a lot of stuff going on. Well, um, as has been mentioned on a number of, by a number of previous speakers, one of the biggest concerns right now is that a number of things that we are doing with telehealth are dependent on waivers and essentially it's reimbursement. Prior to the pandemic, reimbursement was the main impediment to advancing telehealth. The reimbursement uh, took the gloves off, but frankly, some of the things are still tied to emergency waivers. And as soon as those waivers end, uh, especially the direct to consumer home uh, house calls, if you will, will largely come to an end, but uh, many states have adopted in their Medicaid program specific provisions that will allow that uh, to continue. So it's gonna be very varied by whether the state has provision in their Medicaid program, uh, certainly, as has been mentioned, the 1134 section for Medicare is going to stop Medicare reimbursement for that. So it, it's a for rural health clinics and, and FQHCs and much of the service that serves rural areas. That's probably the number one thing on our minds. The, the second one has been ad addressed to a number of speakers is we turned on telehealth simply turn on a camera and a microphone and said, now we've got a video visit. And that's really not the way to bring, I mean, that's that's what we absolutely had to do. But now how do we integrate this into the fabric? How do we make uh, digital health part of the tools that all providers are using? And that's, that's, a, that's cultural, that's social, there's a lot to it. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on the next uh, next few years, provided we get the reimbursement not to, to end. So we have 12 more minutes and uh, I know the MITRE folks were going to uh, curate a few questions from the audience. Uh, if they've done so, I'd welcome that right now. Sure. Thanks, Dr. Brumenthal, and thanks everybody on the panel. Uh, there are several questions that have come in and this is Samruti Thakur from MITRE Corporation. Uh, so I'm going to pose, uh, assume that this question is appropriate for you. Mr. Horrigan, and see if I can pose it to you. But of course, we welcome a uh, response from others as well. So an anonymous attendee is asking a question. If we are to look at broadband planning as a local issue, and if existing broadband data has known limitations, what tools or data sets do you recommend to identify local access issues and quantify inequity of broadband distribution. What data sets or applications do you leverage to this kind of planning work? And I know I said um, the question can go to um, John, but also I think Joshua 
uh, I am certain you will have uh, inputs as well and any others. Thank you. Well, on the adoption side, the American Community Survey data is um, granular, although not terribly up to date due to the 2020 data not being collected due to the pandemic. Um, they do have good information on broadband adoption patterns um, at the neighborhood level in cities. Um, in lieu of that, um, if you just use census data that has granular information on income levels, you're gonna go a long way toward identifying where you have low rates of, of broadband adoption. Um, on the network deployment side, that's um, a little bit of a rabbit hole on how well the federal government collects data on where networks are and how fast they are. Um, there's FCC data that um, is in the process of being improved upon. Um, Microsoft has collected data doing um, speed test analysis uh, that can be fairly granular. Um, it might be worth reaching out to folks at Comcast. They collect this down to the county level. I don't know <clears throat> if it goes um, any more fine grained than that. Uh, so I'll leave it at that and let um, Joshua or maybe a D weigh in. Yeah, I'll say, you know, for <clears throat> what we're doing in Detroit, um, and I, again, I just think that a lot of local communities on the data front end, we've been, um, I wouldn't say we've been absent in the conversation, but I think we've been relying on this data that doesn't really get us the full picture. Uh, with that being said, I think that moving forward, is, as we're even looking in the city, and we're looking at leveraging our ARPA resources to building out, you know, a more robust and more accurate data set. But this is what I would say that we did at the onset that I would you know, say that most communities should do. So the aforementioned data sets that John mentioned, those are absolutely the ones that we should be using. The problem is um, what I see is people will use them singularly. They won't actually integrate them into one. So what we did is we actually took one and made a, a base file. We said that, hey, let's actually get every single address in the city of Detroit. <laughs> and then off of that, let's take these existing data sets that are very valuable by themselves and combine them into its own. And then we create our own specific index. So then off of that, if we were to do any type of surveying or any type of modeling, now we have a more granular set and the most granular data set by just making an incremental incision by doing our own survey over all the existing ones. And so that's what I would say to be like the probably the lowest hanging fruit, but that will get you very, very far down the path so that as you know, more data sets or any, anyone else is doing anything else in, in this vein, you're now able to work off of something that can inform your entire ecosystem. I'll just quickly add by putting in a plug, I already I did it effectively, but uh, for the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, um, folks at FCC know them well, Josh, you might too. I mean, they're just, they're awesome. And they've got, per the like reading the question in the Q and A, They've got the library for you, right? Of think of these inter different interventions, everything from you know specific data exercises at a regional level to you know how they're thinking about building up kind of different indices, like Josh just mentioned, or or, or actual actual programming, right? That's trying to address the divide. So go to the experts that are out there, and I think what's great about last kind of quick soapbox point is what this what's so important about what EJ or, or the infrastructure law just did is it starts to build out even more capacity inside the Beltway in Washington to be an even better partner to regions and states across the country to build up more capacity here. There's some sweet iron, horribly sweet irony around the most data-driven of our infrastructure having these data gaps. So it, there's no reason for it. We just need to invest the time and effort to make it better. Thanks everybody. Uh, I'll go ahead and pose a question that had come in on an earlier panel but I do believe um, it's relevant to bring up here. So Adam Gibbs had uh, asked a question earlier, are clinicians embracing the transformation of the healthcare model that include telehealth, digital health innovation, while understanding the social determinants of health? If not, how do we get them to embrace things, changes? And I'm going to request probably uh, Dr. Rodriguez for you to take this one, and I will also uh, request Mikkel to address it as well. Thank you. Yep, I can. I'll go first. 
Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I think as the pandemic has gone on, people have gotten more comfortable. There's been a general sense of like, there's a role for this. Uh, but I think it sort of, it depends on sort of like the, the clinician, what kind of care you're providing. And as we saw in some of uh, Bill's data, right, that the use of telehealth sort of varied by different kind of specialty and what you were doing. So I think some specialties have taken this and like run with it a bit more. Others have tr- sort of started to find what the best application of these tools are um, and then, you know, and seeing how, how patients do with them. But I think they, they've all kind of come to, you know, come to understand whenever you talk about these things, it's like the digital divide sort of always comes up. That's like the thing like, yeah, I was wanting to use it, but the digital divide and like, I would, this would be great, but the digital divide. And so I think there's a general sense that we, there's, there's value here and there, there's a potential to here, but it has to be sort of within, and, and not to say this is all just you know, if we had like the greatest infrastructure and broadband was super affordable, like it would be solved. There's also a lot of things on the healthcare system side in terms of workflows. One of the classic examples is sort of like integrating interpreter services into a telehealth visit and what that does in terms of facilitating and making it useful for for patients and for clinicians. Um, and that goes into a whole other conversation around sort of like interpreter resources, but that's, that's a story for another panel. But I, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, with sort of addressing digital divide, but also establishing healthcare system side workflows that sort of support the use of these tools in like, just like you would seeing a person, you know, inpatient or what I'm doing right now, seeing patients in the hospital. So I think that's what I'd say. You know, I would add that early on, a lot of the resistance we encountered um, for using telehealth and digital tools was this idea that it would create a greater fracture in an already pretty fragmented health system. And how could you really use this technology to create more of a continuum of care? And so um, as we've gotten better and better at this, we're more so using telehealth to connect um, parts of the health system to one another and create a cohesive and comprehensive experience for the patient that keeps the patient closer to home, keeps even care delivery closer to home, um, but doesn't create isolated visits that don't add up to something um, of, of improved overall care delivery for patients. So for example, um, by offering in our collaborations with schools to set up telehealth capability in the school and offering to parents to consent for their uh, children to be treated by their own primary care physician using that telehealth technology, then going to the provider community and offering every physician in that school district the opportunity who's in primary care, the opportunity to join the telehealth capability network, uh, almost all say yes, because they want nothing more than to care for their kids wherever it's most easy to do so. And parents want the same thing. And the, at the same time, we offer a backup. Uh, that you can connect to a a telehealth urgent care if that primary care physician isn't available. But by building networks that really foster the uh, continuum of care and that connection to a medical home, I think we are seeing a lot greater adoption and um, appreciation of this additional resource. Um, Just adding briefly to that, uh, we ran a telehealth network focused on clinics and schools uh, a few years ago. Uh, focusing again on many of our clients, that may be the best place to encounter healthcare is in the school, but we focused on things that the school said were the most important, asthma and, and um, you know, weight and, and uh, drugs and other things that the school said the clinic needed to do. What we found by studying it was primary care was the main thing that the kids needed at the school. We weren't really expecting that because that wasn't even one of the criteria that we listed in the application. but Yes, I mean, school's a great example of this is a place we can deliver healthcare and improve outcomes simply because of the availability of, of, of kids that may not get into the clinic. So um, as someone who practiced primary care for off and on for 35 years in rural downtown Boston, um, in one of the most wired uh, health systems uh, in the United States at that time, uh, when they created three of its own electronic health records. I can say that physicians are comfortable, get comfortable using electronic technologies, but they don't view them as social determinants or their responsibility to make sure that their patients have that resource. 
And since our conversation has been about this as a social determinant, that is not something that medical professionals, healthcare professionals view as in traditionally as their responsibility any more than they view transportation, education, income, food, um, or uh, ling uh, health literacy as their responsibility. So we still have some work to do to draw broadband access into that, into the psychology and understanding of America's medical providers, healthcare providers. Um, I think we're at time now, and I don't want to take someone else's time. So uh, I will thank our panelists. It's been a great panel, great diversity of perspectives, um, and uh, pleasure to meet you all. Um, and thank you for the work you're doing. Terrific. Uh, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you again, Dr. Blumenthal and, and panelists for that outstanding discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a brief pause before we start the fifth and final segment of our symposium. We will resume promptly at 3.35 p.m. Eastern time. Please watch the time counter on your screen to remind you when our, our symposium will resume. Uh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we now resume our symposium with our fifth and final discussion segment titled Next Steps, a focus on broadband and health data and social determinants of health. This segment will be moderated by Dr. David Ahern with the FCC's Connect Health Task Force. Dr. Ahern, please proceed. Thank you, Ben, and uh, welcome uh, panelists. Uh, this is the final panel of our symposium. Uh, uh, last but certainly not least, indeed, we, we see this panel as a uh, natural bookend to the symposium, uh, a series of mini presentations by our panelists who have been involved in uh, research of one uh, form or another um, addressing broadband connectivity and, as it pertains to health. Uh, and so we're, I'm going to proceed. So this is the roster of speakers that we have for our uh, panel. Uh, so uh, Jill, uh, Robin, I if you could uh, uh, go ahead. Thank you, David, and good afternoon. It's such a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. Um, as noted, my name is Robin Gilbert, and I am the president of Fair Health. And to help frame this panel's discussion, I wanted to share a few slides that will offer some insights into this current status of telehealth utilization across the country, but also serve as a backdrop to the overarching discussion we've been having about broadband access. Next slide, please. For those less familiar with Fair Health, we are a national independent nonprofit organization established to bring fairness and transparency to health insurance information. We now have over 36 billion private insurance claims from 2002 to the present. It's the largest private claims collection in the country. And we receive over 2 billion new claims each year. Next slide, please. Fair Health um, has over 165 million telehealth claims from just the past two years alone. And these services are specified on the claims data in various ways. There would be 02 in the place of service field on a claim, which would indicate a telehealth visit. There are also procedure code modifiers that can also be used to indicate that a telehealth service has been performed and can be billed with any relevant procedure code. And finally, there are also specific procedure codes that would flag whether a telehealth service has been rendered, such as a five to 10 minute telephone consultation visit. Next slide, please. These two charts show how telehealth usage as a percentage of all medical claim lines has evolved over 2020 and 2021. As you can see, telehealth claim lines were relatively low in early 2020, prior to the onset of the pandemic. In March, as the pandemic began to take hold, telehealth claim lines increased to 8.1% of all medical claim lines and continued to increase in April. However, as the COVID-19 restrictions expired later in the year, telehealth utilization declined and by September 2020, telehealth only accounted for 4.3% of all medical claim lines. We see telehealth utilization rise again in October 2020 through January 2021, which was likely a result of the growing number of COVID-19 cases in the US during this time. And in the spring and summer of 2021, telehealth claim lines dropped again as the country began to get vaccinated. 
in the fall and winter of 2021. However, telehealth utilization began to rise once again, likely a result of individuals taking precautions and avoiding indoor spaces to protect against the Delta and Omicron variants. Next slide, please. Here we're reviewing the top five telehealth diagnoses in 2021. As you can see, mental health conditions are at the top of the list, constituting 57.2% of all telehealth claim lines. Mental health conditions also dominated the list in 2020. Next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, there are specific codes billed on claims by providers to identify telehealth services. These codes can also identify if the telehealth service is conducted via audio only or over video. On January 21st, 2022, three modifiers were introduced to help us discern between audio only and video communication with a patient. Modifiers 93 and FQ both indicate that the service was provided to the patient via audio only communications. And modifier FR specifies that the service was conducted via a two-way audio video communication technology. Next slide, please. If we look a bit deeper at the types of telehealth services, we can see here that in 2019, prior to the pandemic, telehealth services were more specifically characterized as either audio or video when billed. In 2019, 40.3% of all services were defined as audio only and 21.8% were billed as video procedures. Only 37.9% of the services were not specified. During the pandemic, though, as more and more providers began conducting telehealth services, we saw the specificity of the billing decrease. By 2021, less than 10% of all telehealth claims were designated as either audio only or video. As telehealth utilization increased during the pandemic, providers who did not previously conduct telehealth services continued to bill their normal service codes, such as psychotherapy or evaluation and management services. While they indicated they were telehealth visits, they did not include a video or an audio specification. Next slide, please. Here we see that video telehealth services were more frequently used in urban locations than in rural locations throughout the year. In January 2021, video telehealth services accounted for 14.4% of urban areas, while they were only 2.7% in rural areas. However, by June and July, telehealth jumped uh, by video to 13.9% and 14.7% in rural areas, respectively. With the new modifiers that became effective in January, we will now be in a much better position to evaluate both broadband access as well as demographic factors or other differences between rural and urban video telehealth use. Next slide, please. As you can see here, audio only telehealth utilization was higher in rural areas than in urban areas. This chart also reveals that audio only telehealth was more commonly used than video telehealth, no matter the location. Next slide, please. And finally, turning our attention to age and gender distributions of video and audio only telehealth utilization. In 2020 and 21, we found that telehealth usage was generally more prevalent among females than males. Females of all ages sought both video and audio only telehealth services much more frequently than males, with the exception of zero to 18 year olds who showed a very small delta between male and female distribution. The disparity between female and male telehealth utilization is greater when looking at video telehealth services. Although the difference in utilization is less acute for those age 65 and older, females still accounted for a greater percentage of video telehealth services. Audio only telehealth services among this age group, they're more evenly distributed with females and males making up 53.1% and 46.9% of audio only telehealth services respectively. Among the 51 to 64 year old age group, the difference between female and male utilization of video telehealth services was 41.6 percentage points, while the difference in utilization for audio only telehealth services was only 12.6 percentage points. With that, I'm happy to pass the baton to the next panelist and look forward to the discussion later on. Thank you.
Thank you, Robin. That, uh, that's an impressive uh, data set to be sure and uh, uh, really uh, helpful to have that information shared uh, with us today. Uh, we're now going to turn to Kirsten Frobaum, if you could introduce yourself and, uh, and then your, your uh, presentation. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Kirsten Frobaum. I'm a senior evidence analyst with County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. So for those of you not familiar, County Health Rankings is a resource uh, which uses data and other, and other tools to illustrate how counties are faring across the U.S. with the understanding that our health is shaped by the conditions in our communities across a range of factors, from our opportunities for education to our ability to access jobs that pay a living wage and so on. Broadband access is one of our newest data measures, and for that we use data from the American Community Survey to report the percentage of households in a county that have access to broadband. Um, and then you'll see from this slide that access is not the complete picture. Policies and programs that affect access, affordability, and adoption of broadband, with the end goal being that individuals can meaningfully use it, also are really important. And so in addition to data, County Health Rankings has a database called What Works for Health, in which we review the evidence, including for broadband expansion, to suggest what's working well to communities. Uh, next slide, please. So broadband research, to give you some background, is often looked at from two different angles. So we know that when communities have access to reliable and affordable broadband, there are significant benefits. And we know that when communities lack this access, there are significant harms and barriers to opportunities. So with regard to benefits, what the data and the evidence illustrate is that access to broadband, especially at higher speeds, such as 100 megabytes per second, and in rural places that have traditionally lacked broadband can really increase communities' employment rates. We also know that broadband is associated with greater access to healthcare via telemedicine and that it improves economic stability because people can do things like telework, search for jobs, and file for unemployment. Further, food security is improved. Um, people can get groceries online. I'm sure some of us experienced that recently. Um, check food pantry hours and importantly, enroll in state and federal programs like SNAP. And then people can continue their educations as well as accessing the social support that's been so important for our health, especially for older adults and for all of us during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So conversely, and this is why broadband is considered not just a social determinant of health, but a super determinant of health. There's evidence to show that when communities lack broadband, individuals fare worse economically, educationally, in terms of the social isolation and their access to clinical health care. Um, and all of these shape our overall health outcomes and how long and how well we live. So it's also important to point out here that access, affordability, and adoption of broadband are all challenged by systemic and historic barriers to broadband expansion in both rural and urban communities with lower incomes. So government authorized redlining practices from 100 years ago are still informing our health today. Neighborhoods that were once created by the homeowners loan corporation as undesirable for reasons to do with race and income continue to experience disinvestment. And as you can see in the graphic, historically redlined neighborhoods have fewer individuals that own homes, more families who live in poverty and have lower education attainment, and more than one in four homes in these neighborhoods also lack broadband. So the data increasingly show that income as much as infrastructure for broadband is an important barrier to access. So this is illustrated by the fact that in both urban and rural areas, households with the lowest incomes are the most likely to be without broadband. For example, in the most urban areas of the US, 44% of households that earn lower than $20,000 a year have no internet. And in the most rural areas, 56% of these low income households have no internet. This is significantly below the national averages. What this data shows is that there's a cycle of disinvestment created by policies rooted in racism and inequality. And this is why the initiatives today, which focus on expansion from this equity perspective, considering not only expanding infrastructure, but also ensuring that broadband is affordable and that digital inclusion is happening. So things like tech and learning support in communities and getting people affordable devices is what's needed to ensure that everyone can access the benefits that I mentioned. And if you wanna to go to my last slide. Perfect. So this leads me to where you can find our work and more on this. So on countyhealthrankings.org, you can find the data measure I mentioned on broadband access for your county and state, as well as our write-ups on the efforts to expand broadband generally, as well as through education, medical, and other initiatives. 
um, in particular, the strategy on broadband initiatives for unserved and underserved areas for service also details the costs and benefits of different models of broadband service, um, including municipally owned and operated networks. And then we also have a webinar that goes into more detail on digital redlining and how to expand broadband equitably. And these are all on our homepage at countyhealthrankings.org. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Kirsten. That was great. Um, now we'll have Adam Krasinski uh, present. Great. I'm pleased to to join everyone else here. I feel like I'm, a, I'm amongst the, the luminaries of, of health and broadband. Uh, so really humbled to join you. I thought I would just share a few examples of uh, some work that, that our team has been doing here in Cleveland. Um, some of you may be familiar with the broadband situation in, in in Cleveland, we have you know roughly 50,000 or more households that have no internet of any kind uh, in the city, right? So uh, standing in contrast to a lot of other urban areas in the neighborhood, but maybe some similarities to other, um, you know, uh, other places in the upper Midwest, uh, uh, sort of Rust Belt cities. The um, Metro Health, uh, where I work, we see about a million visits a year amongst over 100,000 patients a year. Um, and just in 2021, we had a commitment to screen two thirds or more of those patients for social determinants of health, at least once at an outpatient visit. With that screening, we're relatively unique in in addition to asking people about transportation, food, housing, intimate partner violence, social stress, social connectedness, and other things that all, lots of places are asking about in the way of social needs. We're also asking people about their internet connectivity and their level of internet connectivity and their ability to use internet connectivity. And so among the 60,000 or so outpatients that we screened in 2021, one of the things that we found was that more than 35% of our older adults uh, reported having no access to the internet. Uh, but one of the more surprising things that we found was that 22% of our patients between the ages of 40 and 64 had no internet access. That doesn't come to, to us as much of a surprise. We're the largest Medicaid provider in the state of Ohio. Um, but that's the context for the next two slides where I'm gonna show you just a little bit of summary data. So could we advance one slide, please? Great. So this is some work that we initiated uh, more than five years ago now, uh, where we looked at about a quarter of a million of our patients. And we examined, you can see in the figure there, on the y-axis, we, we looked at um, whether our patients use the patient portal, and we geocoded all of our patients by their address. Uh, this, this figure shows them by the zip code. We've done it more fine-grained down to the census block group. But what you see here is a really powerful association between the level of broadband coverage at a zip code and the percentage of our patients who use the patient portal. We're an Epic institution, we use my chart. Uh, so we found this like incredibly powerful association. This is one of the things that motivated us to feel that we need to be the type of place that screens our patients for uh, broadband as a social need and uh, refers them to local resources to get them the, whether they need training, whether they need access, whether they need devices. Uh, next slide, please. We also recognize, though, that use of the portal alone, like some folks would be curious about whether uh, it's, it's just sort of use of portal or how, how closely connected is, is broadband inequality to some specific high value preventive services and health outcomes. And there are a couple of interesting things from this figure. Um, note that the x-axis is reversed from the prior figure. So this is the percent in a neighborhood without any type of broadband. Uh, this is 
against the percent in a neighborhood with high blood pressure. This is data just from the state of Ohio, from 2,938 census tracts in the state of Ohio. And the color shading there is a quintile of the area deprivation index, uh, a measure of neighborhood disadvantage, where the light blue dots are the folks, the highest income, most advantaged areas, and the yellow dots are those that are the most disadvantaged. And one of the most interesting things you can see here among this linear relationship is that even within the most disadvantaged neighborhoods in Ohio, there appears to be an association between having broadband and blood pressure control. Oftentimes, I think other data tends to show that relationship across such neighborhoods, and many folks make assumptions that these things track linearly just with income or with neighborhood socioeconomic circumstances. But I think one of the important things that this figure shows is that that trend happens within neighborhoods I think lending a lot of support to Kirsten's claim about broadband being a super social determinant of health. Next slide, please. Now this, this line points the opposite direction, but that's because the thing that we want people to do here is good as opposed to the thing in the last slide, which is bad. Um, and the thing that we want people to do here is get screened for colon cancer. And here what we see is a very, very similar relationship to the prior slide, which is a powerful association between whether people are screened for colon cancer and the percentage of individuals in a neighborhood uh, that, that do not have any type of broadband. And so you, you see, you know, just drastically lower rates here. So sort of at the bottom, less than half of folks in the neighborhood up to date on colon, colon cancer screening versus you know 75% according to broadband penetration. And once again, we see this difference as occurring within the quantiles of neighborhood socioeconomic position, not just across them. So I think th those are the, the fun eye candy results that I think really show in my view that the broadband um, is deeply connected both to health outcomes and use of high value preventive health services. And I'd love to hand it on to the next presenter. Thank you, Adam. That was, uh, that was also impressive uh, as a researcher myself and for our audience participants that are researchers, it's, it, it's the kind of, of data that uh, really is uh, appealing and, and makes one wonder about the nature of these relationships and their complexity, and we want to perhaps talk a bit more about that. But now I'm going to turn to Patricia Keenan. Patricia? Thanks, David, and thank you also. There we go. Uh, thank you also to the FCC and Connect to Health Task Force for the opportunity to present um, and really learn from this terrific panel in today's prior sessions. I'm Patricia Keenan. I'm from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. ARC's mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible, equitable, and affordable. Today, we have a remarkable window of opportunity as well as substantial needs to address social determinants of health. And ARC is working to respond through a range of SDOH and equity work underway. I'm gonna to speak today from the context of one ARC initiative, the Social Determinants of Health Database, and not necessarily on behalf of ARC or HHS overall. The Social Determinants of Health Database Initiative is working to create a robust one-stop community level data resource drawing from multiple public sources, including in fact, the county health rankings data. So it's nice to connect via this panel. The goal for the database is to make it easier to use social determinants data and analyses that can inform interventions to reach people in need and ultimately contribute to improved health equity. We're developing the database in stages so we can iteratively incorporate feedback and improve over time. The initial database is available on our website now. It inc includes county as well as zip code level data on topics ranging from income to air pollution, healthcare access. We're also working currently um, to update the database and add newer data. And this is anticipated to be available later this spring. So we're very interested to collaborate with folks using the database 
both to receive feedback um, to help us improve it, as well as also to really put the data to work in analyses to inform actions to address social determinants. So the map on the right, which is maybe a little small, um, it's a screenshot of a data visualization on poverty and internet access that we created from the database. And this was developed in recognition of the factors spoken about previously um, related to the key role of broadband, as well as computer devices, such as you know, having a laptop or a smartphone for multiple aspects of people's well-being. So the map's showing variation across counties in the percent of households with any kind of broadband access, including cell phone uh, data plans, ranging from the lowest percent with the lightest color to the highest in the darkest color. And one takeaway I'll highlight that other folks have mentioned is that lack of broadband and this related issue of not having a, some kind of computing device is a, for sure a challenge in rural areas, but also urban areas, and particularly among communities with higher poverty rates. And to me, this points to multiple factors that can impact people's ability to benefit from broadband. Um, there's clearly the infrastructure aspect. Um, in addition, it needs to you know, be affordable and there are digital literacy aspects as well. And so thinking about you know, how we understand these factors in more, um, ro more robust way, we of course need data. So you know, going from my starting point, working on the SDOH database, um, this map is using data um, mentioned previously from the Census Bureau American Community Survey, which is a tremendous resource for being able to calculate community level data on a range of social determinants, including household broadband and device adoption. Um, one factor here is that it does require using the five-year files to be able to support community level estimates. And one possibility that we're hoping to pursue in future work is small area modeling, um, working with the Census Bureau to be able to generate single year estimates of the broadband and computer variables at a small geographic area level. Thinking about the health data landscape more broadly, um, just a few comments from a quick and a, you know, with caveats, not systematic look um, for data related to broadband and computer adoption and use um, so one standout among federal health surveys is the Health Information Trends Survey uh, with rich questions. And I think actually our next panelist um, will discuss this. Um, it's used in several of the healthy people objectives. In two other respects, um, you know, again, from my uh, not comprehensive, but effort at a search, um, it seems like broadband com and computer use kind of data is fairly limited uh, looking across Four federal surveys that are commonly analyzed for topics like access to care um, and health status. Um, there's limited information. And Adam just spoke to this, but in clinical settings, um, my sense is that it's, this is not routinely um, asked and recorded just based on looking at um, some of the patient social risk screeners that are commonly used in healthcare to identify and refer people to social services. Um, you know, with the exception of Metro Health, as, as Adam was just speaking about. So thinking about research, um, one overarching question, and this has certainly been noted in prior sessions, is whether the trend toward digital health care is creating new kinds of inequities, and perhaps particularly among populations already at risk for greater health needs, seniors, lower income folks, et cetera. So two broad kinds of studies where there's already, um, as we're hearing, great work um, that's been done, but where it seems like there's also a lot more still to learn that I'll just note are um, first intervention studies. You know, for example, what kinds of modalities of telehealth are effective? And particularly thinking about populations with differing levels of digital access and literacy. And, you know, related to that, you know, what kinds of interventions are best done in a clinical setting versus a community setting? And then second, um, for health services research type studies, you know, a whole range of questions related to how broadband um, is associated with the use of specific types of digital health care, which Adam was, again, just speaking to, um, as well as related to other aspects of well-being, such as schooling, employment, and then ultimately, you know, from a health policy perspective, what are the impacts on healthcare use and health outcomes? 
And so last, I'll just note um, for the research community, it seems like there's a lot of methods opportunities here. And just to note a couple, thinking about observational studies using large data sets, um, you know, thinking carefully about approaches for causal inference, as well as for how to do multi-level modeling in data where, you know, ideally we might have um, individual or patient data group within healthcare delivery institutions and then across communities. And at the same time, though, considering the need for qualitative research and, you know, to co-design studies so that the work can be informed by people that, you know, these technologies are aiming to reach. And, you know, so that ultimately research questions and interventions fit with people's preferences and circumstances. So I'll stop here and look forward to um, follow up discussion. Thanks. I just wanted to just mention to Patricia, a number of her comments, I think, were spot on to the Q&A and to our questions around multi-level modeling. What are some of the methodological challenges? We'll get a little bit wonky as researchers, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, but, but Robin, uh, please uh, go ahead. Great. Thank you all so much. Again, I want to, I also want to add my thanks to the FCC and the meeting organizers for the invitation to be a part of this important meeting in this esteemed panel. Um, we are the, the, the last session before the end of the day um, as the meeting wraps up, so I'll try to keep my remarks brief. Um, as this discussion today has been so comprehensive and thought-provoking and inspiring, uh, and first, I want to step back and just frame out why a federal cancer research agency like the National Cancer Institute would be focused on broadband connectivity as a social determinant of health. And it's obvious, again, based on today's symposium and the data and the comments and the experience um, and lessons learned that have been shared today, again, it is clear that broadband connectivity is linked to health disparities within and between different population groups. And NCI is firmly committed to supporting research that identifies and addresses health disparities and advances health equity among all communities. And in particular, the branch where I sit at the National Cancer Institute, which is the Cancer Communication and Informatics Research Branch in the Behavioral Research Program is committed to an area um, and, and maybe a different, a different um, or another frame or a different uh, conceptualization of what we've been talking about today. And, and our branch is focused on communication inequalities. And you know, thinking about that, what do I mean by communication inequality? And we often draw from Vish Vishwana's work at Harvard in that communication inequalities are defined as the differences in the generation, manipulation, and distribution of information among social groups, and the differences, differences in access and use, attention, retention, and capacity to act on relevant information among individuals. And again, I think it's very clear today that underlying these differences and underlying these communication inequalities in the generation and use of information is availability, access, and use of internet and technology and its related counterpart of health and digital literacy. And so obviously NCI wants to be part of this coordinated and synergistic effort that we've been hearing about all day today to understand and surveil communication inequalities and to support research from our extramural community that addresses and mitigates these communication inequalities. As related to our cancer research portfolio and our priorities at NCI, broadband connectivity actually affects many aspects of our work as well as the work of our grantees. But for the sake of time this afternoon, I'm gonna briefly describe two of those initiatives. The first is how we at NCI and in collaboration with our other federal agencies such as Healthy People 20. 30, uh, as well as our uh, partners at ONC and other agencies, how we monitor the changing communication ecosystem, which we've been hearing that word over and over again today. And that is through our seminal health communication surveillance tool. Uh, Patricia just mentioned it for us. It's the Health Information National Trend Survey, or HENCE. 
And for almost 20 years, and in fact, in 2023, we will celebrate the 20th anniversary of Hens. We have been measuring such important uh, metrics uh, and variables, such as do individuals have use, uh, uh, access to and use the internet? Uh, how is it accessed? Is it over cellular service, broadband? Um, and, and that obviously has changed over the last 20 years, even the different response options that we've had for those metrics. How do you use the information for your healthcare needs? And what is your experience of seeking health and cancer information in particular when using the internet? We've also had met, uh, measures that focus on how individuals use health and wellness apps, wearable devices, patient portals, and access their medical records online. And then whether folks are willing to share their patient-generated data with healthcare providers. And if you think about it, all of this, again, is dependent often on internet and cellular and broadband you know, access to do all of these things that we've been talking about all day today and what we're measuring on HINTS. We're really thrilled that HINTS 6 is actually going to launch this month. And we have a new question that we're adding related to satisfaction with the internet connection at home, which I know has been uh, discussed earlier today. And we are going to have a new section on the health, uh, on the HINTS survey dedicated explicitly to telehealth. Again, as a result of the pandemic, we are shifting our priorities and, and, and metrics that we're looking at across HINTS to incorporate telehealth. So again, I would encourage any of our public, private, and federal partners to use this HINTS data to further understand and monitor broadband connectivity um, as a social determinant of health. And we're even in our um, infant stages of working with the FCC to see if we can link FCC broadband data and our, and our HINTS data as well. So it's very exciting work. The second area that I'm gonna briefly highlight as well is focused on um, our new growing area of science that is dedicated to telehealth related cancer care. And I think, um, again, it's been covered explicitly today that the healthcare system turned on a dime to start offering virtual care. And that has happened in primary care, specialty settings, and in oncology care. But it's a little bit uh, been where research is playing catch up um, to this overnight um, change in healthcare delivery. And we're, we're uh, in an essence, building the plane uh, while we're flying it. And you know, we have put out a research agenda where we want to establish how telehealth can be integrated and sustained into existing and new cancer care delivery models. We need to establish the evidence base around, again, how telehealth can complement in-person care, and particularly in a unique situation like cancer care, where you still need to have many of the appointments in person, including testing, treatment, screening exams, but there are also um, opportunities for remote symptom monitoring, uh, the hospital at home model that's been talked about earlier today, and also thinking about how we can use telehealth to support recruitment and retention in cancer clinical trials. And I would encourage us to think about this, about delivering the right care on the right platform at the right time and equitably to all patients. Um, and you can, you know, we hear a lot about precision medicine and oncology care, and we can think about this as precision delivery of oncology care. And of course it never fails when we're presenting this research agenda that um, we get asked the question is how, is, how is broadband connectivity for both patients and providers going to be addressed? How are we gonna manage the un unintended consequences and prevent this exacerbation of existing cancer disparities? Again, everything we've discussed already today. And these are real and valid questions for our research and clinical community and our funding agencies. And so again, with one of our recent funding opportunities um, that's focused on centers of excellence in telehealth and cancer care, the, the, one of the research requirements that we wrote into the funding opportunity was that the work needed to be, the study, the research study itself needed to be a pragmatic randomized controlled trial, meaning that the research study had to be done in a real world clinical practice environment, not artificially derived, 
no controls um, on the, the environment and what was happening. But again, taking place in the real patient provider health system community ecosystem uh, that the patients live and, and uh, revolve in. And so that was, again, an area of research that I think we can promote is doing this in pragmatic, uh, with pragmatic trials and in real world clinical settings so that we can see exactly when um, the red flags start to pop up and how we can help our patients. The other part of this uh, funding opportunity was that applicants had to describe and propose plans to monitor and address, again, in real time with triggers and flags when, for telehealth related disparities. And similar to what we talked about throughout the day, it's not just a yes or no, <laughs> it's the availability, the access, the affordability, the quality, the stability, the satisfaction, and the reliability, and there had to be both qualitative and quantitative assessments in real time of the patients and providers' experiences with telehealth. And then last but not least, we also focused on both synchronous, so the you know, real-time patient-provider interactions, which is what we're doing today, but also the complementary asynchronous interactions, which again, we've heard about today with patient portals and sensors and wearables and other patient generated data that can support this tailoring of telehealth and other healthcare services to our cancer patient populations. Our centers will launch later this spring and will be five year initiatives and we look forward to that announcement. So with that, I'll stop and I also look forward to the questions that you have this afternoon. Thanks, David. Right. Thank you, Robin, and uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Um, you did a fabulous job of staying to the time that we had suggested, and it, got, it does, in fact, leave us some time to uh, uh, to have a Q&A among us, and then also perhaps to take some questions from the audience as well. Um, so I'm going to actually uh, adopt the approach used by my co-moderator from the last panel, Dr. Wubenthal, and ask uh, each of you whether you have a question for each other. Uh, does anyone want to ask one of your fellow panelists a question first? I, I do. I have. I have. Well, I have probably questions I could ask everybody. Um, <laughs> dangerous question, David. Uh, but actually, I was curious if if Robin Gelberg could share. Um, like I, that data was awesome to see, and I, I was wondering though if you would dare any. Uh, 12 or 24 a month projections on uh, trends in especially use of uh, video visits for telehealth. Thank you for that question, Adam. There's been so many interesting topics raised today, and I feel like our ocean of claims, I would love to just bring you all out on our glass bottom boat and let you see what we're seeing and, and to share with you because we have so many data gaps that we can fill. And we're particularly excited, as I mentioned, starting January, we now have that modifier that we can look at audio only versus telephonic. Um, but it also harkens back to a panelist earlier who said, um, I think it was the gentleman from Brigham um, from Massachusetts who said that there are some patients who really don't want to access certain types of, types of technologies. It's not because they don't have access to it. So it'll be fascinating to juxtapose our data and how people are accessing care with whether there is broadband access or with more qualitative um, analyses, as Patricia mentioned, in terms of what are people interested in doing and how do they want to access it? I think there's also, we're seeing a lot of asynchronous uh, types of technologies that are helping people to manage their chronic conditions. And so we're really interested in looking at, we have de-identified patient cohorts. We can see their migration through the healthcare system, tagged with their diagnoses to see how they're accessing care. Are there differences, whether you are using only audio versus uh, video as well? Are there different diagnoses that lend themselves more to one modality versus another? Is asynchronous really helping with uh, discharge from acute facilities and having people maintain and adhere to certain treatment protocols? I think in terms of trends going forward, there's clearly staying power with respect to mental health conditions, but we're seeing a lot of other diverse conditions emerge in the telehealth space, like developmental disorders, which we had never seen before. Um, we're also seeing um, 
things depart from you know, joint and soft tissue diseases. PT is becoming more and more common using a telehealth modality. So we're tracking what's different. I would make reference to our free telehealth tracker that is tracking it month to month. We release it every month on our corporate website. And so I invite you to track it along with us. We look at the specialists who are really providing that type of care, how it's breaking out um, in terms of regions. And we are obviously going to be monitoring this. And we were monitoring this even before the pandemic started. So we've been part of these like class five rapids as the pandemic started in trying to really track these trends. So offline, Adam, if you know, I'm happy to share more with our data um, and also to help any of you with any of your studies that we can uh, help you peer more closely into specific corners and to see how broadband access impacts outcomes. Well, I'll say thank, thank, thank you, you too. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Robin as well, because uh, we have used your tracker um, and many of our early presentations and, and work in telehealth, because uh, we could, you all were tracking, you were literally tracking <laughs> it and put it on your on your public website, as you noted, with the bar graphs um, and incorporated that into some of our early um, presentations because it was the data we could get our hands on and find publicly. So thank you for that. And and I too would be interested as you look at the different diagnoses. Um, among the patients and their, uh, pre, you know, their comorbidities uh, potentially as well, uh, if they're you know, multiple diagnoses, but um, and see where oncology sits. But thank you for your for your all's reporting. Thank you to both Robin. Uh, so with our remaining time, I wanted to just ask the one question: If each of you could respond, what should future research address to examine the relationship between broadband connectivity and health? Where are the gaps? What do you think the, where should the research go? Uh, and so, Kirsten? Sure, thank you so much. Um, I think for the work that I have particularly been involved in would point to more research needed around what service models are most effective at expanding affordable broadband access. So we know from different data, including FCC, that areas with only one provider might be limited in how they can ensure affordability, especially in states that prohibit local broadband subsidies, public-private partnerships, or municipally owned and operated broadband. Um, so getting more granular data about what models are actually working best and, and where um, to expand that affordable, uh, affordable broadband. Um, and then the last thing I would mention is that what existing infrastructure is already in place in communities that are lacking broadband, because um, often like communities that are looking to expand it aren't aware of um, folks that have comparable infrastructure who have built on what already exists. So just getting um, folks connected to each other would be great. Wonderful, thank you. Patricia. The one area that I'm particularly interested in is, you know, a whole range of questions that could be answered linking uh, individual or patient data with community level data. With broadband access, a number of people have pointed out the importance of both, you know, is broadband offered in the community, but then also the adoption of broadband and com computing devices in the household and um, finding ways to link data sources so that um, studies can account for both that sort of individual piece as well as the community piece to think about, you know, how ultimately people are using um, modalities such as telehealth and the impact on um, healthcare use and outcomes. I think, you know, there's a bunch of questions there that I didn't, you know, that could be asked more specifically, but all in that space of thinking about uh, individual and community level data kind of combined in analyses. Thank you, Robin B. Yes. Um, so I would argue, you know, I think that looking at um, the return on investment, the value based argument, the cost effectiveness of providing Internet access and or devices and or related training um, and technical support to patients. Um, how that, again, plays out in the the impact on health outcomes. So I think we need more economic analysis of this work to make, to help us make the argument in the case. Thank you, uh, Adam. This is a tough one there. Everything everybody else said, plus um, <laughs> the a, a, a couple of them. One, I'm really curious whether the surge in access under emergency broadband benefit and affordable connectivity programs 
um, translated into increased uptake of preventive health services, increased usage of patient portals, um, and increased access to primary care providers, especially. Um, that, that one for sure. And then sort of like the on the other side of it, I'm also just continuing to be deeply concerned that ongoing digital divides are creating fast lane and slow lane for access to high value subspecialty care, such that you know some of the precision medicine things that Robin was talking about, that folks who do have access to the portal, who do have access to sign up for clinical trials or you know sort of enriched access via the internet, um, have a fast lane to receiving, you know, life-saving subspecialty care that might not be available to folks who, who don't have that sort of access. So I think that that's another really important direction to be looking at and monitoring. Thank you, Adam. Very important point. And Robin G., last uh, comment uh, in just a moment or two, if you would. Sure. Just um, really to help everyone that has spoken today, maybe help them do what they do even better and to allow us to help everyone would be the addition of a Z code that reflects in the claim itself uh, the lack of broadband access. We are doing a lot of rich research with respect to social determinants of health involving divorce, death in the family, food scarcity, uh, low literacy. It's allowing us to shed light on the association of those social determinants with health outcomes. Having a broadband access specific determinant of health that's coded as a Z code uh, would greatly propel us forward and allow us to make public, publicly available information on this topic. So that would be my wish list. Thank you, Robin. And I realize we're at the end of our time. Uh, and I know there may have been questions. I know uh, we've had staff trying to answer questions uh, in the Q&A section. We now need to conclude uh, our panel. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for a very stimulating discussion. And uh, this will continue. The discussion will continue. I now want to um, turn, uh, the, oh, turn it over to our Chair Michelle Ellison for final comments uh, to conclude our symposium today. Thanks so much, Dr. Ahern. What an incredible day. It far exceeded even our very high expectations. And that is because of all of you, our audience of nearly 300 actively engaged participants. We salute our terrific moderators, panelists, and speakers for their thoughtful input and creative solutions going forward. I do want to say a very few, and I mean very few words to wrap up the day. First, I want to thank Chairwoman Rosen Worsell for her leadership and passion for closing connectivity gaps. I want to thank Commissioner Starks and Commissioner Carr for their inspiring remarks today. And I want to thank all of the commissioners for their unwavering support for the work of the Connect to Health Task Force for promoting broadband and health, and for leading the way on creating opportunity for all Americans. In so many ways, that is the moral imperative of our time, and they are rising to the challenge. I can't help but think about former acting chairwoman Mignon Clyburn today, who was the engine behind the creation of the task force. I hope that we continue to do her proud. Second, to the amazing staff of the FCC who planned this event. We are all in your debt. A special thank you to Karen Onije, Ben Bogtolome, Dr. David Ahern, Dr. Michael Gibbons, Dr. Ariel Mancuso, Angela O, oh, Shannon Hyatt, and Dr. Taylor Martin. And another shout out to our colleagues and strategic partners at MITRE Corporation, especially Dr. Samruvi Tacker the project lead. Finally, I think the phrase of the day was from Dr. Berwick, who encouraged us to act with courage, and as we all know, to act with dispatch. If the pandemic has taught us anything, there's no time to waste. It's clear from today's dialogue that broadband connectivity as a so social determinant of health is a critical framework and one with transformative potential. So we would encourage you to stay engaged, to visit our website, to send us comments and suggestions by email. We hope that as a result of today's dialogue, 
you're thinking differently about the role of broadband in health. We hope this will infect your vision, research strategies, policies, budgets, funding, business plans, consumer education initiatives, and yes, cross-sector partnerships. We at the FCC stand ready to collaborate with all of you, with telecom providers, health systems, public health agencies, researchers, scientists, philanthropists, and to continue to do our part. So a great big thank you from all of us at the FCC. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks again.